Section twenty nine of Curiosities of Literature, Volume three. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Curiosities of Literature, Volume three by Isaac Disraeli. Quadrio's Account of English Poetry it is perhaps somewhat mortifying in our literary researches to discover that our own literature has been only known to other nations of europe comparatively within recent times we have at length triumphed over our continental rivals in the noble struggles of genius and our authors now see their works printed even at foreign presses while we are furnishing with our gratuitous labours nearly the whole literature of a new empire yet so late as in the reign of anne our poets were only known by the latin versifiers of the muse anglicane and when boileau was told of the public funeral of dryden he was pleased with the national honours bestowed on genius but he declared that he never heard of his name before this great legislator of parnassus has never alluded to one of our own poets so insular then was our literary glory the most remarkable fact or perhaps assertion i have met with of the little knowledge which the continent had of our writers is a french translation of bishop hall's characters of virtues and vices it is a duodecimo printed at paris of one hundred and nine pages sixteen ten with this title caractere de vertu et de vice tire de l'anglois de m joseph hall in a dedication to the earl of salisbury the translator informs his lordship that ce livre est la première traduction de l'anglois jamais imprimé en aucun vulgaire the first translation from the english ever printed in any modern language whether the translator is a bold liar or an ignorant blunderer remains to be ascertained at all events it is a humiliating demonstration of the small progress which our home literature had made abroad in sixteen ten i come now to notice a contemporary writer professedly writing the history of our poetry of which his knowledge will open to us as we proceed with our enlightened and amateur historian father quadrios della storia el del ratione d'ogni poesia is a gigantic work which could only have been projected and persevered in by some hypochondriac monk who to get rid of the ennui of life could discover no pleasanter way than to bury himself alive in seven monstrous closely printed quartos and every day be compiling something on a subject which he did not understand fortunately for father quadrio without taste to feel and discernment to decide nothing occurred in this progress of literary history and criticism to abridge his volumes and his amusements and with diligence and erudition unparalleled he has here built up a receptacle for his immense curious and trifling knowledge on the poetry of every nation quadrio is among that class of authors whom we receive with more gratitude than pleasure fly to sometimes to quote but never linger to read and fix on our shelves but seldom have in our hands i have been much mortified in looking over this voluminous compiler to discover although he wrote so late as about seventeen fifty how little the history of english poetry was known to foreigners it is assuredly our own fault we have too long neglected the bibliography and the literary history of our own country italy spain and france have enjoyed eminent bibliographers we have none to rival them italy may justly glory in her tiraboschi and her mazzuchelli 
spain in the bibliothecas of nicholas antonio and france so rich in bibliographical treasures affords models to every literary nation of every species of literary history with us the partial labour of the hermit antony for the oxford writers compiled before philosophical criticism existed in the nation and wharton's history of poetry which was left unfinished at its most critical period when that delightful antiquary of taste had just touched the threshold of his paradise these are the sole great labours to which foreigners might resort but these will not be found of much use to them the neglect of our own literary history has therefore occasioned the errors sometimes very ridiculous ones of foreign writers respecting our authors even the lively chardon in his dictionnaire historique gives the most extraordinary accounts of most of the english writers without an english guide to attend such weary travellers they have too often been deceived by the mirages of our literature they have given blundering accounts of works which do exist and chronicled others which never did exist and have often made up the personal history of our authors by confounding two or three into one chardon mentioning dryden's tragedies observes that adderbury translated two into latin verse entitled achitophel and absalom footnote even recently il cavaliere onofrio boni in his eloge of lanzi in naming the three augustan periods of modern literature fixes them for the italians under leo the tenth for the french under louis the fourteenth or the great and for the english under charles the second end of footnote of all these foreign authors none has more egregiously failed than this good father quadrio in this universal history of poetry i was curious to observe what sort of figure we made and whether the fertile genius of our original poets had struck the foreign critic with admiration or with critical censure but little was our english poetry known to its universal historian in the chapter on those who have cultivated la melica poesia in propria lingua tra tedeschi fiamingi e inglesi we find the following list of english poets of john gower whose rhymes and verses are preserved in manuscript in the college of the most holy trinity in cambridge arthur kelton flourished in fifteen forty eight a skilful english poet he composed various poems in english also he lauds the cambrians and their genealogy the works of william wycherley in english prose and verse these were the only english poets whom quadrio at first could muster together in his subsequent editions he caught the name of sir philip sidney with an adventurous criticism le sou poesie assez buone he then was lucky enough to pick up the title not the volume surely which was one of the rarest fiori por etici de e cauli which he calls poesie amorose this must mean that early volume of cauli's published in his thirteenth year under the title of poetical blossoms further he laid hold of john donne by the skirt and thomas creech at whom he made a full pause informing his italians that his poems are reputed by his nation as assai buone he has also le opere di guglielmo but to this christian name as it would appear he had not ventured to add the surname at length in his progress of inquiry in his fourth volume for they were published at different periods he suddenly discovers a host of english poets in waller duke of buckingham lord roscommon and others among whom is dr swift but he acknowledges their works have not reached him shakespeare at length appears on the scene but quadrio's notions are derived from voltaire whom perhaps he boldly translates instead of improving our drama he conducted it a totale rovina nella sue forse monstruose che si chiaman tragedie alcune scene vi abbia 
luminose el bella e al suni trati si trovono terribili e grandi otway is said to have composed a tragic drama on the subject of venezia salvata he adds with surprise ma affata regolare regularity is the essence of genius with such critics as quadrio dryden is also mentioned but the only drama specified is king arthur addison is the first englishman who produced a classical tragedy but though quadrio writes much about the life of addison he never alludes to the spectator we come now to a more curious point whether quadrio had read our comedies may be doubtful but he distinguishes them by very high commendation our comedy he says represents human life the manners of citizens and the people much better than the french and spanish comedies in which all the business of life is mixed up with love affairs the spaniards had their gallantry from the moors and their manners from chivalry to which they added their tumid african taste differing from that of other nations i shall translate what he now adds of english comedy the english more skilfully even than the french have approximated to the true idea of comic subjects choosing for the argument of their invention the customary and natural objects of the citizens and the populace and when religion and decorum were more respected in their theatres they were more advanced in this species of poetry and merited not a little praise above their neighbouring nations but more than the english and the french to speak according to pure and bare truth have the italians signalized themselves a sly insinuating criticism but as on the whole for reasons which i cannot account for father quadrio seems to have relished our english comedy we must value his candour he praises our comedy per il bello ed il buono but as he is a methodical aristotelian he will not allow us that liberty in the theatre which we are supposed to possess in parliament by delivering whatever we conceive to the purpose his criticism is a specimen of the irrefragable we must not abandon legitimate rules to give mere pleasure thereby because pleasure is produced by and flows from the beautiful and the beautiful is chiefly drawn from the good order and unity in which it consists quadrio succeeded in discovering the name of one of our greatest comic geniuses for alluding to our diversity of action in comedy he mentions in his fifth column page one hundred and forty eight il celebre ben jansen nella sua commedia in itolato bartolomeo for i cherry e in quella altro commedia in titolato ipsum vitz the reader may decipher the poet's name with his fare but it required the critical sagacity of mr deuce to discover that by ipsum beats we are to understand shadwell's comedy of epson wells the italian critic had transcribed what he and his italian printer could not spell we have further discovered the source of his intelligence in saint avramont who had classed shadwell's comedy with ben jonson's to such shifts is the writer of an universal history d'ogni poesia miserably reduced towards the close of the fifth volume we at last find the sacred muse of milton but unluckily he was a man di pochissima religione and spoke of christ like an arian quadria quotes ramsay for milton's vomiting forth abuse on the roman church his figures are said to be often mean unworthy of the majesty of his subject but in a later place excepting his religion our poet it is decided on is worthy di molti laudi thus much for the information the curious may obtain on english poetry from its universal history quadrio unquestionably writes with more ignorance than prejudice against us he has not only highly distinguished the comic genius of our writers and raised it above that of our neighbours but he has also advanced another discovery which ranks us still higher for original invention and which i am confident will be as new as it is extraordinary to the english reader 
quadrio who among other erudite accessories to his work has exhausted the most copious researches on the origin of punch and harlequin has also written with equal curiosity and value the history of puppet shows but whom has he lauded whom has he placed paramount above all other people for their genius of invention in improving this art the english and the glory which has hitherto been universally conceded to the italian nation themselves appears to belong to us for we it appears while others were dandling and pulling their little representatives of human nature into such awkward and unnatural motions first invented pulleys or wires and gave a fine and natural action to the artificial life of these gesticulating machines we seem to know little of ourselves as connected with the history of puppet shows but in an article in the curious dictionary of trevoux i find that jean briochet to whom had been attributed the invention of marionettes is only to be considered as an improver in his time but the learned writers supply no date an englishman discovered the secret of moving them by springs and without strings but the marionettes of briochet were preferred for the pleasantries which he made them deliver the erudite quadrio appears to have more successfully substantiated our claims to the pulleys or wires or springs of the puppets than any of our own antiquaries and perhaps the uncommemorated name of this englishman was that powell who solomon and sheba were celebrated in the days of addison and steele the former of whom has composed a classical and sportive latin poem on this very subject but quadrio might well rest satisfied that the nation which could boast of its fantacini surpassed and must ever surpass the puny efforts of a dull loving people End of section twenty nine section thirty of curiosities of literature volume three this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by greg giordano curiosities of literature Volume Three, by Isaac Desraeli. Political Religionism. In Professor Dugald Stewart's first dissertation on the progress of philosophy, I find this singular and significant term. It has occasioned me to reflect on those contests for religion, in which a particular faith has been made the ostensible pretext, while the secret motive was usually political the historians who view in religious wars only religion itself have written large volumes in which we may never discover that they have either been a struggle to obtain predominance or an expedient to secure it the hatreds of ambitious men have disguised their own purposes while christianity has borne the odium of loosening a destroying spirit among mankind which, had Christianity never existed, would have equally prevailed in human affairs. Of a moral malady, it is not only necessary to know the nature, but to designate it by a right name, that we may not err in our mode of treatment. If we call that religious, which we shall find for the greater part is political, we are likely to be mistaken in the regimen and the cure. Fox in his Acts and Monuments, writes the martyrology of the Protestants in three mighty folios, where, in the third, the tender mercies of the Catholics are cut in wood for those who might not otherwise be enabled to read or spell them. Such pictures are abridgments of long narratives, but they leave in the mind a fullness of horror. Fox made more than one generation shudder, and his volume, particularly this third, chained to a reading-desk in the halls of the great and in the aisles of churches, 
often detained the loiterer, as it furnished some new scene of papistical horrors to paint forth on returning to his fireside. The Protestants were then the martyrs, because, under Mary, the Protestants had been thrown out of power. God has opposed to Fox three curious folios, which he calls the Church History of England, exhibiting a most abundant martyrology of the Catholics, inflicted by the hands of the Protestants, who, in the succeeding reign of Elizabeth, after long trepidations and balancings, were confirmed into power. He grieves over the delusion and seduction of the black-letter romance of honest John Fox, which he says, quote, has obtained a place in Protestant churches next to the Bible, while John Fox himself is esteemed little less than an evangelist. End quote. Footnote. Fox's Martyrs, as this book was properly called, was often chained to a reading desk in churches. One is still thus affixed at Sir Ancestor. It thus received equal honor with the Bible. End of footnote. Dodd's narratives are not less pathetic, for the situation of the Catholic, who had to secrete himself, as well as to suffer, was more adapted for romantic adventures than even the melancholy but monotonous story of the Protestants tortured in the cell or bound to the stake. These Catholics, however, were attempting all sorts of intrigues, and the saints and martyrs of Dodd to the Parliament of England were only traitors and conspirators. Highland, in his history of the Puritans and the Presbyterians, blackens them for political devils. He is a spagnolette of history, blinding himself with horrors at which the painter himself must have started. He tells of their oppositions to monarchical and episcopal government, their motivations in the church, and their embroilments of the kingdoms. The sword rages in their hands, treason, sacrilege, plunder, while, quote, more of the blood of Englishmen had poured like water within the space of four years than had been shed in the civil wars of York and Lancaster in four centuries. End quote. Neal opposes a more elaborate history, where these great and good men, the Puritans and the Presbyterians, quote, are placed among the reformers, end quote, while their fame is blanched into angelic purity. Neal and his party opined that the Protestant had not sufficiently protested, and that the Reformation itself needed to be reformed. They wearied the impatient Elizabeth and her ardent churchmen, and disputed with the learned James and his courtly bishops about such ceremonial trifles, that the historian may blush or smile who has to record them. When the Puritan was thrown out of preferment and seated into separation, he turned into a presbyter. Nonconformity was their darling sin and their sullen triumph. Calamy, in four painful volumes, chronicles the bloodless martyrology of the two thousand silenced and ejected ministers. Their history is not glorious, and their heroes are obscure, but it is a domestic tale. When the second Charles was restored, the Presbyterians, like every other faction, were to be amused, if not courted. Some of the king's chaplains were selected from among them, and preached once. Their hopes were raised that they should, by some agreement, be enabled to share in that ecclesiastical establishment which they had so often opposed, and the bishops met the presbyters in a convocation at the Savoy. A conference was held between the high church, resuming the seat of power, and the low church, now prostrate, that is, between the old clergy, who had recently been mercilessly ejected by the new who in their turn were awaiting their fate. The conference was closed with arguments by the weaker, and votes by the stronger. Many curious anecdotes of this conference have come down to us. The Presbyterians, in their last struggle, petitioned for indulgence, but oppressors who had become petitioners, only showed that they possessed no longer the means of resistance. This conference was followed up by the Act of Uniformity, which took place on Bartholomew Day, 
August 24, 1652, an act which ejected Columet's two thousand ministers from the bosom of the established church. Bartholomew Day with this party was long paralleled, and perhaps is still, with the dreadful French massacre of that fatal saint's day. The calamity was rather, however, of a private than of a public nature. The two thousand ejected ministers were indeed deprived of their livings. But this was, however, a happier fate than what has often occurred in these contests for the security of political power. This ejection was not like the expulsion of the Norscos, the best and most useful subjects of Spain, which was a human sacrifice of half a million of men, and the proscription of many Jews from that land of Catholicism, or the massacre of thousands of Huguenots, and the expulsion of more than a hundred thousand by Louis the Fourteenth from France. The Presbyterian divines were not driven from their fatherland, and compelled to learn another language than their mother tongue. Destitute as divines, they were suffered to remain as citizens, and the result was remarkable. These divines could not disrobe themselves of their learning and their piety, while several of them were compelled to become tradesmen, among these the learned Samuel Chandler, whose literary productions are numerous, kept a bookseller's shop in the poultry. Hard as this event proved in its result, it was, however, pleaded that, quote, it was but like for like, end quote, and that the history of the like might not be curtailed in the telling. Opposed to Calamy's chronicle of the two thousand ejected ministers stands another, in folio magnitude, of the same sort of chronicle of the clergy of the Church of England, with a title by no means less pathetic. This is Walker's, quote, attempt towards recovering an account of the clergy of the Church of England, who were sequestered, harassed, etc., in the late times, end quote. Walker is himself astonished at the size of his volume, the number of his sufferers, and the variety of the sufferings. Quote, Shall the church, says he, not have the liberty to preserve the history of her sufferings, as well as the separation to set forth an account of theirs? Can Dr. Calamy be acquitted for publishing the history of the Bartholomew sufferers? If I am condemned for writing that of the sequestered loyalists, end quote. He allows that, quote, the number of the ejected amounts to two thousand. End quote. And there were no less than quote, seven or eight thousand of the Episcopal clergy imprisoned, banished, and sent a starving, etc., etc. Et Whether the Reformed were martyred by the Catholics, or the Catholics executed by the Reformed, whether the Puritans expelled those of the established church, or the established church ejected the Puritans, all seems reducible to two classes conformists and nonconformists, or, in the political style, the administration and the opposition, when we discover that the heads of all parties are of the same hot temperament, and observe the same evil conduct in similar situations, when we view honest old Latimer with his own hands hanging a mendicant friar on a tree, and the government changing the friar's binding Latimer to the stake, when we see the French Catholics cutting out the tongues of the Protestants, that they might no longer protest, the haughty Luther writing submissive apologies to Leo X and Henry VIII for the scurrility with which he had treated them in his writings, and finding that his apologies were received with contempt, then retracing his retractions, when we find that haughtiest of the haughty, John Knox, when Elizabeth first ascended the throne, crouching and repenting of having written his famous excommunication against all female sovereignty, or pulling down the monasteries, from the axiom that when the rookery was destroyed, the rooks would never return, will we find his recent apologist admiring, while he apologizes for, some extraordinary proofs of Machiavellian politics. An impenetrable mystery seems to hang over the conduct of men, who profess to be guided by the bloodless code of Jesus, but try them by a human standard, and treat them as politicians, and the motives once discovered, the actions are understood. 
two edicts of Charles V in 1555 condemned to death the reformed of the Low Countries, even should they return to the Catholic faith, with its exception, however, in favor of the latter, that they shall not be burnt alive, but that the men shall be beheaded, and the women buried alive. Religion could not then be the real motive of the Spanish cabinet, for in returning to the ancient faith that point was obtained. But the truth is, the Spanish government considered the reformed as rebels, whom it was not safe to readmit to the rights of citizenship. The undisguised fact appears in the codicil to the will of the emperor, when he solemnly declares that he had written to the Inquisition, quote, to burn and extirpate the heretics, end quote, after trying to make Christians of them, because he is convinced that they never can become sincere Catholics. And he acknowledges that he had committed a great fault in permitting Luther to return free on the faith of his safe conduct, as the emperor was not bound to keep a promise with a heretic. Quote, it is because that I destroyed him not that heresy has now become strong, which I am convinced might have been stifled with him in its birth. End quote. Footnote. Laurentes Critical History of the Inquisition End of footnote The whole conduct of Charles V in this mighty revolution was, from its beginning, censured by contemporaries as purely political. Francis I observed that the emperor, under the color of religion, was placing himself at the head of a league to make his way to a predominant monarchy. Quote, the pretext of religion is no new thing, writes the Duke of Nevers. Charles V had never undertaken a war against the Protestant princes, but with the design of rendering the imperial crown hereditary to the House of Austria, and he has only attacked the electoral princes to ruin them, and to abolish their right of election. Had it been zeal for the Catholic religion, would he have delayed from 1519 1549 to arm, that he might have extinguished the Lutheran heresy, which he could easily have done in 1526, but he considered that this novelty would serve to divide the German princes, and he patiently waited till the effect was realized. Footnote. Node. Considerations Politique. Page 115. See a curious note in Hart's Life of Gustavus Adolphus, 129. End of footnote. Good men of both parties, mistaking the nature of these religious wars, have drawn horrid inferences. The dragonades of Louis the Fourteenth excited the admiration of Broyer and Anquetil in his Esprit de la Ligue, compares the revocation of the Edict of Nantes to a solitary amputation. The massacre of St. Bartholomew in its own day, and even recently has found advocates. A Greek professor at the time asserted that there were two classes of Protestants in France, political and religious, and that, quote, the late ebullition of public vengeance was solely directed against the former, end quote. Dr. McCree, cursing the Catholic with a Catholic's curse, execrates, quote, the stale sophistry of this calumniator. End quote. But should we allow that the Greek professor who advocated their national crime was the wretch the Calvinistic doctor describes, yet the nature of things cannot be altered to the equal violence of Peter Charpentier and Dr. McCrae. This subject of political religionism is indeed as nice as it is curious. Politics have been so cunningly worked into the cause of religion that the parties themselves will never be able to separate them, and to this moment the most opposite opinions are formed concerning the same events and the same persons. When public disturbances broke out at Nismi on the first restoration of the Bourbons, the Protestants, who there are numerous, declared that they were persecuted for religion, and their cry, echoed by their brethren the dissenters, resounded in this country. We have not forgotten the ferment it raised here. 
Much was said, and something was done. Our minister, however, persisted in declaring that it was a mere political affair. It is clear that our government was right on the cause, and those zealous complainants wrong, who only observed the effect, for as soon as the Bourbonists had triumphed over the Bonapartists, we heard no more of those sanguinary persecutions of the Protestant of Nismi, of which a dissenter has just published a large history. It is a curious fact that when two writers at the same time were occupied in a life of Cardinal Zeminis, Fleischer converted the Cardinal into a saint, and every incident in his administration was made to connect itself with his religious character. Marcellier, a writer very inferior to Fleischer, shows the Cardinal merely as a politician. The elegances of Fleischer were soon neglected by the public, and the deep interest of truth soon acquired, and still retain, for the less elegant writer of the attention of the statesman. A modern historian has observed that, quote, the affairs of religion were the grand fomenters and promoters of the Thirty Years' War, which first brought down the powers of the North to mix in the politics of the Southern States. End quote. The fact is indisputable, but the cause is not so apparent. Gustavus Adolphus, the vast military genius of his age, had designed and was successfully attempting to oppose the overgrown power of the Imperial House of Austria, which had long aimed at a universal monarchy in Europe, a circumstance which Philip the Fourth weakly hinted at to the world when he placed this motto under his arms quote, Sine ipso factum est nihil. End quote. An expression applied to Jesus Christ by St. John. End of section 30. Recording by Greg Giordano. Newport Ritchie, Florida. Section 31. Curiosities of Literature. Volume 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Annie Hill. Curiosities of Literature, Volume 3, by Isaac Disraeli. Toleration. An enlightened toleration is a blessing of the last age. It would seem to have been practiced by the Romans, when they did not mistake the primitive Christians for seditious members of society, and was inculcated even by Mahomet in a passage in the Koran, but scarcely practiced by his followers. In modern history, it was condemned when religion was turned into a political contest under the aspiring house of Austria, and in Spain, and in France. It required a long time before its nature was comprehended, and to this moment it is far from being clear either to the tolerators or the tolerated. It does not appear that the precepts or the practice of Jesus and the apostles inculcate the compelling of any to be Christians. Footnote 161 Bishop Barlow's Several Miscellaneous and Weighty Cases of Conscience Resolved, 1692 his case of a toleration in matters of religion addressed to robert boyle page thirty nine this volume was not intended to have been given to the world a circumstance which does not make it the less curious End of footnote. yet an expression employed in the nuptial parable of the great supper when the hospitable lord commanded the servant finding that he had still room to accommodate more guests to go out into the highways and hedges and compel them to come in, that my house may be filled, was alleged as an authority by those Catholics who called themselves the converters for using religious force, which, still alluding to the hospitable Lord, they called a charitable and salutary violence. It was this circumstance which produced Bale's Commentaire philosophique sur ces paroles de Jesus Christ published under the supposititious name of an Englishman, as printed at Canterbury in 1686, but really at Amsterdam. It is curious that Locke published his first letter on toleration in Latin at Gouda in 1689, the second in 1690, and the third in 1692. 
Bale opened the mind of Loch, and some time after quotes Loch's Latin letter with high commendation. The caution of both writers in publishing in foreign places, however, indicates the prudence which it was deemed necessary to observe in writing in favor of toleration. These were the first philosophical attempts, but the earliest advocates for toleration may be found among the religious controversialists of a preceding period. It was probably started among the fugitive sects who had found an asylum in Holland. It was a blessing which they had gone far to find, and the miserable, reduced to humane feelings, are compassionate to one another. With us, the sect called the Independents had, early in our revolution under Charles I, pleaded for the doctrine of religious liberty, and long maintained it against the Presbyterians. Both proved persecutors when they possessed power. The first of our respectable divines who advocated this cause were Jeremy Taylor in his Discourse on the Liberty of Prophesying, 1647, and Bishop Hall, who had pleaded the cause of moderation in a discourse about the same period. Footnote 163 Recent writers among our sectarists assert that Dr. Owen was the first who wrote in favor of toleration in 1648. Another claims the honor for John Goodwin, the chaplain of Oliver Cromwell, who published one of his obscure polemical tracts in 1644, among a number of other persons who, at that crisis, who did not venture to prefix their names to please in favor of toleration, so delicate and so obscure did this subject then appear. In 1651 they translated the liberal treatise of Grotius de Imperio Sumerum Potestantum Circa Sacra, under the title of The Authority of the Highest Powers About Sacred Things, London, 8th volume, 1651. To the honor of Grotius, the first philosophical reformers, be it recorded, that he displeased both parties. End of footnote. Locke had no doubt examined all these writers. The history of opinions is among the most curious of history, and I suspect that Bale was well acquainted with the pamphlets of our sectarists, who, in their flight to Holland, conveyed those curiosities of theology which had cost them their happiness and their estates. I think he indicates this hidden source of his ideas by the extraordinary ascription of his book to an Englishman, and fixing the place of its publication at Canterbury. Toleration has been a vast engine in the hands of modern politicians. It was established in the United Provinces of Holland, and our numerous nonconformists took refuge in that asylum for disturbed consciences. It attracted a valuable community of French refugees. It conducted a colony of Hebrew fugitives from Portugal, conventicles of Brownists, Quakers' meetings, French churches and Jewish synagogues, and, had it been required, Mahometan mosques in Amsterdam were the precursors of its march and its exchange. The moment they could preserve their consciences sacred to themselves, they lived without mutual persecution, and mixed together as good Dutchmen. The excommunicated part of Europe seemed to be the most enlightened and it was then considered as a proof of the admirable progress of the human mind that Locke and Clark and Newton corresponded with Leibniz and others of the learned in France and Italy. Some were astonished that philosophers who differed in their religious opinions should communicate among themselves with so much toleration. It is not, however, clear that had any one of these sects at Amsterdam obtained predominance, which was sometimes attempted, they would have granted to others the toleration they participated in common. The infancy of a party is accompanied by a political weakness, which disables it from weakening others. The Catholic in this country pleads for toleration. In his own, he refuses to grant it. Here, the Presbyterian, who had complained of persecution, once fixed in the seat of power, abrogated every kind of independence among others. When the flames consumed Servetus at Geneva, the controversy began. Whether the civil magistrate might punish heretics, which Beza, the associate of Calvin, maintained, 
he triumphed in the small predestinating city of geneva but the book he wrote was fatal to the protestants a few leagues distant among a majority of catholics whenever the protestants complained of the persecutions they suffered the catholics for authority and sanction never failed to appeal to the volume of their own beza m necker de Cessure has recently observed on what trivial circumstances the change or the preservation of the established religion in different districts of europe has depended when the reformation penetrated into switzerland the government of the principality of newfcattle wishing to allow liberty of conscience to all their subjects invited each parish to vote for or against the adoption of the new worship and in all the parishes except two the majority of suffrages declared in favour of the protestant communion the inhabitants of the small village of cressier had also assembled and forming an even number there happened to be an equality of votes for and against the change of religion a shepherd being absent tending the flocks on the hills they summoned him to appear and decide this important question when having no liking to innovation he gave his voice in favour of the existing form of worship and this parish remained catholic and is so at this day in the heart of protestant cantons i proceed to some facts which i have arranged for the history of toleration in the memoirs of james the second when that monarch published the declaration for liberty of conscience the catholic reasons and liberalizes like a modern philosopher he accuses the jealousy of our clergy who had degraded themselves to intriguers and like mechanics in a trade who are afraid of nothing so much as interlopers they had therefore induced indifferent persons to imagine that their earnest contest was not about their faith but about their temporal possessions it was incongruous that a church which does not pretend to be infallible should constrain persons under heavy penalties and punishments to believe as she does they delighted he asserted to hold an iron rod over dissenters and catholics so sweet was dominion that the very thought of others participating in their freedom made them deny the very doctrine they preached the chief argument the catholic urged on this occasion was the reasonableness of repealing laws which made men liable to the greatest punishment for that it was not in their power to remedy for that no man could force himself to believe what he really did not believe such was the rational language of the most bigoted of zealots the fox can bleat like a lamb at the very moment james the second was uttering this mild expostulation in his own heart he had anathematized the nation for i have seen some of the king's private papers which still exist they consist of communications chiefly by the most bigoted priests with the wildest projects and the most infatuated prophecies and dreams of restoring the true catholic faith in england had the jesuit-led monarch retained the english throne the language he now addressed to the nation would have been no longer used and in that case it would have served his protestant subjects he asked for toleration to become intolerant he devoted himself not to the hundredth part of the english nation and yet he was surprised that he was left one morning without an army when the catholic monarch issued this declaration for liberty of conscience the jekyll of his day observed that it was but scaffolding they intend to build another house and when that house popery is built they will take down the scaffold when presbytery was our lord they who had endured the tortures of persecution and raised such sharp outcries for freedom of all men were the most intolerant hardly had they tasted of the circean cup of dominion ere they were transformed into the most hideous or the most grotesque monsters of political power to their eyes toleration was an hydra and the dethroned bishops had never so vehemently declaimed against what in ludicrous rage one of the high-flying presbyterians called a cursed intolerable toleration 
they advocated the rights of persecution and shallow edwards as milton calls the author of the gangrenia published a treatise against toleration they who had so long complained of the licensers now sent all the books they condemned to penal fires prine now vindicated the very doctrines under which he himself has so severely suffered assuming the highest possible power of civil government even to the infliction of death on its opponents prine lost all feeling for the ears of others the idea of toleration was not intelligible for too long a period in the annals of europe no parties probably could conceive the idea of toleration in the struggle for predominance treaties are not preferred when conquest is the concealed object men were immolated a massacre was a sacrifice medals were struck to commemorate these holy persecutions footnote one six seven it is curious to observe that the catholics were afterward ashamed of these indiscretions they were unwilling to own that there were any medals which commemorate massacres thaunus in his fifty-third book has minutely described them the medals however have become excessively scarce but copies inferior to the originals have been sold they had also pictures on similar subjects accompanied by insulting inscriptions which latter they have effaced sometimes very imperfectly see hollis's memoirs page three twelve to fourteen this enthusiast advertised in the papers to request travellers to procure them End a footnote the destroying angel holding in one hand a cross and in the other a sword with these words vognatorum stratage 1572 the massacre of the huguenots proves that toleration will not agree with that date footnote 168 the salal regia of the vatican has still upon its walls a painting by vasari of this massacre among the other important events in the history of the popes similarly commemorated end of footnote castelnau a statesman and a humane man was at a loss how to decide on a point of the utmost importance to france in fifteen thirty two they first began to burn the lutherans or calvinists and to cut out the tongues of all protestants that they might no longer protest according to father paul fifty thousand persons had perished in the netherlands by different tortures for religion but a change in the religion of the state castelnau considered would occasion one in the government he wondered how it happened that the more they punished with death it only increased the number of the victims martyrs produced proselytes as a statesman he looked round the great field of human actions in the history of the past there he discovered that the romans were more enlightened in their actions than ourselves that trajan commanded pliny the younger not to molest the christians for their religion but should their conduct endanger the state to put down illegal assemblies that julian the apostate expressly forbade the execution of the christians who then imagined that they were securing their salvation by martyrdom but he ordered all their goods to be confiscated a severe punishment by which julian prevented more than he could have done by persecutions all this he adds we read in ecclesiastical history such were the sentiments of castelnau in 1560 amidst perplexities of state necessity and of our common humanity the notion of toleration had not entered into the views of the statesman it was also at this time that de Sanctis, a great controversial writer declared that had the fires lighted for the destruction of calvinism not been extinguished the sect had not spread about half a century subsequent to this period thaunus was perhaps the first great mind who appears to have insinuated to the french monarch and his nation that they might live at peace with heretics by which avowal he called down on himself the haughty indignation of rome and a declaration that the man who spoke in favour of heretics must necessarily be one of the first class here the afflicted historian have men no compassion 
after forty years passed full of continual miseries have they no fear after the loss of the netherlands occasioned by the frantic obstinacy which marked the times i grieve that such sentiment should have occasioned my book to have been examined with a rigueur that amounts to calumny such was the language of thaunus in a letter written in sixteen o six which indicates an approximation to toleration but which term was not probably yet found in any dictionary we may consider as so many attempts at toleration the great national synod of dort whose history is amply written by brandt and the mitigating protestantism of laud to approximate to the ceremonies of the roman church but the synod after holding about two hundred sessions closed dividing men into universalists and semi-universalists supralapsarians and sublapsarians the reform themselves produced the remonstrance and loud ceremonies ended in placing the altar eastward and in raising the scaffold for the monarchy and the hierarchy error is securitous when it will do what it has not yet learnt they were pressing for conformity to do that which a century afterward they found could only be done by toleration the secret history of toleration among certain parties has been disclosed to us by a curious document from that religious machiavelli the fierce ascetic republican john knox a calvinist pope while the posterity of abraham says that mighty and artful reformer were few in number and while they sojourned in different countries they were merely required to avoid all participation in the idolatrous rites of the heathen but as soon as they prospered into a kingdom and had obtained possession of canaan they were strictly charged to suppress idolatry and to destroy all monuments and incentives the same duty was now incumbent on the professors of the true religion in scotland formerly when not more than ten persons in a county were enlightened it would have been foolishness to have demanded of the nobility the suppression of idolatry but now when knowledge had been increased and see such are the men who cry out for toleration during their state of political weakness but who cancel the bond by which they hold their tenure whenever they obtain possession of canaan the only commentary on this piece of the secret history of toleration is the acute remark of swift we are fully convinced that we shall always tolerate them but not that they will tolerate us the truth is that toleration was allowed by none of the parties and i will now show the dilemmas into which each party thrust itself when the kings of england would forcibly have established episcopacy in scotland the presbyters passed an act against the toleration of dissenters from presbyterian doctrines and discipline and thus as guthrie observes they were committing the same violence on the consciences of their brethren which they opposed in the king the presbyterians contrived their famous covenant to dispossess the royalists of their livings and the independents who assumed the principle of toleration in their very name shortly after enforced what they called the engagement to eject the presbyterians in england where the dissenters were ejected their great advocate calamy complains that the dissenters were only making use of the same arguments which most eminent reformers had done in their noble defence of the reformation against the papists while the arguments of the established church against the dissenters were the same which were urged by the papists against the protestant reformation footnote one seven two i quote from an unpublished letter written so late as in seventeen forty nine addressed to the author of the free and candid disquisition by the rev thomas allen rector of kettering northamptonshire however extravagant his doctrine appears to us i suspect that it exhibits the concealed sentiments of even some protestant churchmen this rector of kettering attributes the growth of schism to the negligence of the clergy and seems to have persecuted both the archbishops to his detriment 
as he tells us with singular plans of reform borrowed from monastic institutions he wished to revive the practice inculcated by a canon of the council of Lodicea, of having prayers ad horum nonum et ad vesperum prayers twice a day in the churches but his grand project take in his own words i let the archbishop know that i had composed an irenicon wherein I prove the necessity of an ecclesiastical power over consciences in matters of religion, which utterly silences their arguments who plead so hard for toleration. I took my scheme from a discourse of ecclesiastical polity, wherein the authority of the civil magistrate over the consciences of subjects in matters of external religion is asserted. The mischiefs and inconveniences of toleration are represented and all pretenses pleaded in behalf of liberty of conscience are fully answered if this book were reprinted and considered the king would know his power and the people their duty the rector of kettering seems not to have known that the author of this discourse on ecclesiastical polity was the notorious parker immortalized by the satire of marvel this political apostate from a republican and presbyterian became a furious advocate for arbitrary government in church and state he easily won the favour of james the second who made him bishop of oxford his principles were so violent that father petrie the confessor of james made sure of him this letter of the rector of kettering in adopting the system of such a catholic bishop confirms my suspicion that toleration is condemned as an evil among some protestants End of footnote. When the Presbyterians were our masters and preached up the doctrine of passive obedience in spiritual matters to the civil power, it was unquestionably passing a self-condemnation on their own recent opposition and detraction of the former episcopacy. Whenever men act from a secret motive entirely contrary to their ostensible one, such monstrous results will happen and as extremes will join however opposite they appear in their beginnings john knox and father petrie in office would have equally served james the second as confessor and prime minister a fact relating to the famous justice lipsius proves the difficulty of forming a clear notion of toleration this learned man after having been ruined by the religious wars of the netherlands found an honourable retreat in a professor's chair at leyden and without difficulty abjured papacy he published some political works and adopted as his great principle that only one religion should be allowed to a people that no clemency should be granted to nonconformists who he declares should be pursued by sword and fire in this manner a single member would be cut off to preserve the body sound ur secca are his words strange notions these in a protestant republic and in fact in holland it was approving of all the horrors of their oppressors the duke d'alva and philip the second from which they had hardly recovered footnote one seven three the cruelties practised by the protestant against the catholic party are pictured and described in arnaud van gelov's book over de Antlenge van drei verscheden nieuw geformide martelaars buiken published at antwerp in sixteen fifty six end of footnote it was a principle by which we must inevitably infer says bale that in holland no other mode of religious belief but one sect should be permitted and that those pagans who had hanged the missionaries of the gospel had done what they ought Lipsius found himself sadly embarrassed when refuted by Theodore Cornhurt. Footnote 174. Cornhurt was one of the fathers of Dutch literature, and even of their arts. He was the composer of the great national air of William of Orange. He was, too, a famous engraver, the master of Goltzius. On his deathbed, he was still writing against the persecution of heretics. End of footnote. The firm advocate of political and religious freedom, and at length, Lipsius, that Protestant with a Catholic heart, was forced to eat his words. 
like pistol his onion declaring that the two objectional words ur seca were borrowed from medicine meaning not literally fire and sword but a strong efficacious remedy one of those powerful medicines to expel poison jean de serres a warm huguenot carried the principle of toleration so far in his inventaire general de l'histoire de france as to blame charles martel for compelling the friesens whom he had conquered to adopt christianity a pardonable zeal he observes in a warrior but in fact the minds of men cannot be gained over by arms nor that religion forced upon them which must be introduced into the hearts of men by reason it is curious to see a protestant in his zeal for toleration blaming a king for forcing idolaters to become christians and to have found an opportunity to express his opinions in the dark history of the eighth century is an instance how historians incorporate their passions in their work and view ancient facts with modern eyes the protestant cannot grant toleration to the catholic unless the catholic ceases to be a papist and the arminian church which opened its wide bosom to receive every denomination of christians nevertheless were forced to exclude the papists for their passive obedience to the supremacy of the roman pontiff the catholic has curiously told us on this word toleration that si mon deviant fort en usage et mesure que le l'ombre de tolérant argument it was a word which seemed of recent introduction though the book is modern the protestants have disputed much how far they might tolerate or whether they should tolerate at all a difficulty triumphantly exclaims the catholic which they are not likely ever to settle while they maintain their principles of pretended reformation the consequences which naturally follow excite horror to the christian it is the weak who raise such outcries for toleration the strong find authority legitimate a religion which admits not of toleration cannot be safely tolerated if there is any chance of its obtaining a political ascendancy when priscillian and six of his followers were condemned to torture and execution for asserting that the three persons of the trinity were to be considered as three different exceptions of the same being saint ambrose and saint martin asserted the cause of offended humanity and refused to communicate with the bishops who had called out for the blood of the priscillianists but cardinal baronius the analyst of the church was greatly embarrassed to explain how men of real purity could abstain from applauding the ardent zeal of the persecution he preferred to give up the saints rather than to allow of toleration for he acknowledges that the toleration which the saints would have allowed was not exempt from sin footnote one seven six sismondi history de francais i forty one the character of the first person who introduced civil persecution into the christian church has been described by sulpicius severus see dr maclean's note in his translation of moshim's ecclesiastical history volume i four twenty eight end a footnote in the preceding article political religionism we have shown how to provide against the possible evil of the tolerated becoming the tolerators toleration has been suspected of indifference to religion itself but with sound minds it is only an indifference to the logamakis of theology things not of god but of man that have perished and that are perishing around us end of section thirty one section thirty two of curiosities of literature volume three this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org curiosities of literature volume three by isaac disraeli apology for the parisian massacre 
an original document now lying before me the autograph letter of charles the ninth will prove that the unparalleled massacre called by the world religious was in the french cabinet considered merely as political one of those revolting state expedients which a pretended instant necessity has too often inflicted on that part of a nation which like the undercurrent subterraneously works its way and runs counter to the great stream till the critical moment arrives when one or the other must cease the massacre began on st bartholomew day in august fifteen seventy two lasted in france during seven days that awful event interrupted the correspondence of our court with that of france a long silence ensued the one did not dare to tell the tale which the other could not listen to but sovereigns know how to convert a mere domestic event into a political expedient charles the ninth on the birth of a daughter sent over an ambassador extraordinary to request elizabeth to stand as sponsor by this the french monarch obtained a double purpose it served to renew his interrupted intercourse with the silent queen and alarm the french protestants by abating their hopes which long rested on the aid of the english queen the following letter dated eighth february fifteen seventy three is addressed by the king to la motte fenelon his resident ambassador at london the king in this letter minutely details a confidential intercourse with his mother catherine of medicis who perhaps may have dictated this letter to the secretary although signed by the king with his own hand footnote all the numerous letters which i have seen of charles the ninth now in the possession of mr murray are carefully signed by himself and i have also observed postscripts written with his own hand they are always countersigned by his secretary i mention this circumstance because in the dictionnaire historique it is said that charles who died young was so given up to the amusements of his age that he would not even sign his dispatches and introduced the custom of secretaries subscribing for the king this voluminous correspondence shows the falsity of this statement history is too often composed of popular tales of this stamp End of footnote such minute particulars could only have been known to herself the earl of wolchester worcester was now taking his departure having come to paris on the baptism of the princess and accompanied by walsingham our resident ambassador after taking leave of charles had the following interview with catherine de medicis an interview with the young monarch was usually concluded by a separate audience with his mother who probably was still the directress of his councils the french court now renewed their favourite project of marrying the duc d'alencon with elizabeth they had long wished to settle this turbulent spirit and the negotiation with elizabeth had been broken off in consequence of the massacre at paris they were somewhat uneasy lest he should share the fate of his brother the duke of anjou who had not long before been expedited on the same fruitless errand and elizabeth had already objected to the disparity of their ages the duke of la alencon being only seventeen and the maiden queen six and thirty but catherine observed that alencon was only one year younger than his brother against whom this objection had not occurred to elizabeth for he had been sent back upon another pretext some difficulty which the queen had contrived about his performing mass in his own house after catherine de medicis had assured the earl of worcester of her great affection for the queen of england and her and the king's strict intention to preserve it and that they were therefore desirous of this proposed marriage taking place she took this opportunity of inquiring of the earl of worcester the cause of the queen his mistress's marked coolness toward them the narrative becomes now dramatic 
on this walsingham who kept always close by the side of the count here took on himself to answer acknowledging that the said count had indeed been charged to speak on this head and he then addressed some words in english to worcester and afterwards the count gave to my lady and mother to understand that the queen his mistress had been waiting for an answer on two articles the one concerning religion and the other for an interview my lady and mother instantly replied that she had never heard any articles mentioned on which she would not have immediately satisfied the sieur walsingham who then took up the word first observing that the count was not accustomed to business of this nature but that he himself knew for certain that the cause of this negotiation for marriage not being more advanced was really these two unsettled points that his mistress still wished that the point of religion should be cleared up for that they concluded in england that this business was designed only to amuse and never to be completed as happened in that of my brother the duke of anjou and the other point concerned the interview between my brother the duke of alencon because some letters which may have been written between the parties footnote these love letters of alencon to our elizabeth are noticed by camden who observes that the queen became wearied by receiving so many and to put an end to this trouble she consented that the young duke should come over conditionally that he should not be offended if her suitor should return home suitless End of footnote in such sort of matters could not have the same force which the sight and presence of both the persons would undoubtedly have but he added another thing which had also greatly retarded this business was what had happened lately in this kingdom and during such troubles proceeding from religion it could not have been well time to have spoken with them concerning the said marriage and that himself and those of his nation have been in great fear in this kingdom thinking that we intended to extirpate all those of the said religion on this my lady and mother answered him instantly and in order that she was certain that the queen his mistress could never like nor value a prince who had not his religion at heart and whoever would desire to have this otherwise would be depriving him of what we hold dearest in this world that he might recollect that my brother had always insisted on the freedom of religion and that it was from the difficulty of its public exercise which he always insisted on which had broken off this negotiation the duke d'alencon will be satisfied with this point is agreed on and will hasten over to the queen persuaded that she will not occasion him the pain and the shame of passing over the seas without happily terminating this affair in regard to what has occurred these latter days that he must have seen how it happened by the fault of the chiefs of those who remained here for when the late admiral was treacherously wounded at notre dame he knew the affliction it threw us into fearful that it might have occasioned great troubles in the kingdom and the diligence we used to verify judicially whence it proceeded and the verification was nearly finished when they were so forgetful as to raise a conspiracy to attempt the lives of myself my lady and mother and my brothers and endanger the whole state which was the cause that to avoid this i was compelled to my very great regret to permit what had happened in this city but as he had witnessed i gave orders to stop as soon as possible this fury of the people and place every one in repose on this the sieur walsingham replied to my lady and mother that the exercise of the said religion had been interdicted in this kingdom to which she also answered that this had not been done but for a good and holy purpose namely that the fury of the catholic people might the sooner be allayed who else had been reminded of the past calamities and would again have been let loose against those of the said religion had they continued to preach in this kingdom also should these once more fix on 
any chiefs which i will prevent as much as possible giving them clearly and pointedly to understand that what is done here is much the same as what has been done and is now practised by the queen his mistress in her kingdom for she permits the exercise but of one religion although there are many of her people who are of another and having also during her reign punished those of her subjects whom she found seditious and rebellious it is true this has been done by the laws but i indeed could not act in the same manner for finding myself in such imminent peril and the conspiracy raised against me and mine and my kingdom ready to be executed i had no time to arraign and try in open justice as much as i wished but was constrained to my very great regret to strike the blow lachez le main in what has been done in this city this letter of charles the ninth however does not here conclude my lady and mother plainly acquaints the earl of worcester and sir francis walsingham that her son had never interfered between their mistress and her subjects and in return expects the same favour although by accounts they had received from england many ships were arming to assist their rebels at rochelle my lady and mother advances another step and declares that elizabeth by treaty is bound to assist her son against his rebellious subjects and they expect at least that elizabeth will not only stop these armaments in all her ports but exemplarily punish the offenders i resume the letter and on hearing this the said walsingham changed colour and appeared somewhat astonished as my lady and mother well perceived by his face and on this he requested the count of worcester to mention the order which he knew the queen his mistress had issued to prevent these people from assisting those of la rochelle but that in england so numerous were the seamen and others who gained their livelihood by maritime affairs and who would starve without the entire freedom of the seas that it was impossible to interdict them charles the ninth encloses the copy of a letter he had received from london in part agreeing with an account the ambassador had sent to the king of an english expedition nearly ready to sail for la rochelle to assist his rebellious subjects he is still further alarmed that elizabeth foments the and assists underhand the discontented he urges the ambassador to hasten to the queen to impart these complaints in the most friendly way as he knows the ambassador can well do and as no doubt walsingham will have already prepared for her to receive charles entreats elizabeth to prove her good faith by deeds and not by words to act openly on a point which admits of no dissimulation the best proof of her friendship will be the marriage and the ambassador after opening this business to her chief ministers who the king thinks are desirous of this projected marriage is then to acquaint the queen with what has passed between her ambassadors and myself such is the first letter on english affairs which charles the ninth dispatched to his ambassador after an awful silence of six months during which time la motte fenelon was not admitted into the presence of elizabeth the apology for the massacre of st bartholomew comes from the king himself and contains several remarkable expressions which are at least divested of that style of bigotry and exultation we might have expected on the contrary this sanguinary and inconsiderate young monarch as he is represented writes in a subdued and sorrowing tone lamenting his hard necessity regretting he could not have recourse to the laws and appealing to others for his efforts to check the fury of the people which he himself had let loose catherine de medicis who had governed him from the tender age of eleven years when he ascended the throne might unquestionably have persuaded him that a conspiracy was on the point of explosion charles the ninth died young and his character is unfavourably viewed by the historians in the voluminous correspondence which i have examined could we judge by state letters of the character of him 
who subscribes them we must form a very different notion they are so prolix and so earnest that one might conceive that they were dictated by the young monarch himself End of section thirty two section thirty three of curiosities of literature volume three this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org curiosities of literature volume three by isaac disraeli prediction part one in a curious treatise on divination or the knowledge of future events cicero has preserved a complete account of the state contrivances which were practised by the roman government to instil among the people those hopes and fears by which they regulated public opinion the pagan creed now become obsolete and ridiculous has occasioned this treatise to be rarely consulted it remains however as a chapter in the history of man to these two books of cicero on divination perhaps a third might be added on political and moral prediction the principles which may even raise it into a science are self-evident they are drawn from the heart of man and they depend on the nature and connection of human events we presume we shall demonstrate the positive existence of such a faculty a faculty which lord bacon describes of making things future and and remote as present the aruspects the augur and the astrologer have vanished with their own superstitions but the moral and the political predictor proceeding on principles authorized by nature and experience has become more skilful in his observations on the phenomena of human history and it has often happened that a tolerable philosopher has not made an indifferent prophet no great political or moral revolution has occurred which has not been accompanied by its prognostic and men of a philosophic cast of mind in their retirement freed from the delusions of parties and of sects at once intelligent in the quick quid agent homines while they are withdrawn from their conflicting interests have rarely been confounded by the astonishment which overwhelms those who absorbed in active life are the mere creatures of sensation agitated by the shadows of truth the unsubstantial appearances of things intellectual nations are advancing in an eternal circle of events and passions which succeed each other and the last is necessarily connected with its antecedent the solitary force of some fortuitous incident only can interrupt this concatenated progress of human affairs that every great event has been accompanied by a presage or prognostic has been observed by lord bacon the shepherds of the people should understand the prognostics of state tempests hollow blasts of wind seemingly at a distance and secret swellings of the sea often precede a storm such were the prognostics discerned by the politic bishop williams in charles the first time who clearly foresaw and predicted the final success of the puritanic party in our country attentive to his own security he abandoned the government and sided with the rising opposition at the moment when such a change in public affairs was by no means apparent in this spirit of foresight our contemplative antiquary dugdale must have anticipated the scene which was approaching in sixteen forty one in the destruction of our ancient monuments in cathedral churches he hurried on his itinerant labours of taking draughts and transcribing inscriptions as he says to preserve them for future and better times posterity owes to the prescient spirit of dugdale the ancient monuments of england which bear the marks of the haste as well as the zeal which have perpetuated them 
continental writers formerly employed a fortunate expression which they wish to have an historia reformationis anti reformationem this history of the reformation would have commenced at least a century before the reformation itself a letter from cardinal julian to pope eugenius the fourth written a century before luther appeared clearly predicts the reformation and its consequences he observed that the minds of men were ripe for something tragical he felt the axe striking at the root and the tree beginning to bend and that his party instead of propping it were hastening its fall in england sir thomas more was not less prescient in his views for when his son roper was observing to him that the catholic religion under the defender of the faith was in a most flourishing state the answer of more was an evidence of political foresight truth it is son roper and yet i pray god that we may not live to see the day that we would gladly be at league and composition with heretics to let them have their churches quietly to themselves so that they would be contented to let us have ours quietly to ourselves whether our great chancellor predicted from a more intimate knowledge of the king's character or from some private circumstances which may not have been recorded for our information of which i have an obscure suspicion remains to be ascertained the minds of men of great political sagacity were unquestionably at that moment full of obscure indications of the approaching change erasmus went at canterbury before the tomb of becket observing it loaded with a vast profusion of jewels wished that those had been distributed among the poor and that the shrine had been only adorned with boughs and flowers for said he those who have heaped up all this mass of treasure will one day be plundered and fall a prey to those who are in power a prediction literally fulfilled about twenty years after it was made the unknown author of the visions of piers ploughman who wrote in the reign of edward the third footnote though it cannot be positively asserted it is generally believed that the author was robert longland a monk of malvern see introduction to wright's edition of the vision the latter part of the year thirteen sixty two is believed to be the time of its composition in the footnote surprise the world by a famous prediction of the fall of the religious houses from the hand of a king footnote the passage is so remarkable as to be worth giving here for the immediate reference of such readers as may not have ready access to the original we modernize the spelling from mr wright's edition but there shall come a king and confess you religious and award you as the bible telleth for breaking of your rule and then shall the abbot of abington and all his issue for ever have a knock of a king and incurable the wound End of footnote. the event was realized two hundred years afterwards by our henry the eighth the protestant writers have not scrupled to declare that in this instance he was de vino numine afflatus but moral and political prediction is not inspiration the one may be wrought out by man the other descends from god the same principle which led erasmus to predict that those who were in power would destroy the rich shrines because no other class of men in society could mate with so mighty a body as the monks conducted the author of piers ploughman to the same conclusion and since power only could accomplish that great purpose he fixed on the highest as the most likely and thus the wise prediction was so long after literally accomplished sir walter raleigh foresaw the future consequences of the separatists and the sectaries in the national church and the very scene his imagination raised in fifteen thirty has been exhibited to the letter of his description two centuries after the prediction 
his memorable words are time will even bring it to pass if it were not resisted that god would be turned out of churches into barns and from thence again into the fields and mountains and under hedges all order of discipline and church government left to newness of opinion and men's fancies and as many kinds of religion spring up as there are parish churches within england we are struck by the profound genius of tacitus who clearly foresaw the calamities which so long ravaged europe on the fall of the roman empire in a work written five hundred years before the event in that sublime anticipation of the future he observed when the romans shall be hunted out from those countries which they have conquered what will then happen the revolted people freed from their master oppressor will not be able to subsist without destroying their neighbours and the most cruel wars will exist among all these nations we are told that solon at athens contemplating on the port and citadel of Manichia, suddenly exclaimed how blind is man to futurity could the athenians foresee what mischief this will do their city they would even eat it with their own teeth to get rid of it a prediction verified more than two hundred years afterwards thales desired to be buried in an obscure quarter of milesia observing that that very spot would in time be the forum charlemagne in his old age observing from the window of a castle a norman descent on his coast tears started in the eyes of the aged monarch he predicted that since they dared to threaten his dominions while he was yet living what would they do when he should be no more a melancholy prediction says de foix of their subsequent incursions and of the protracted calamities of the french nation during a whole century there seems to be something in minds which take in extensive views of human nature which serves them as a kind of divination and the consciousness of this faculty has even been asserted by some cicero appeals to atticus how he had always judged of the affairs of the republic as a good diviner and that its overthrow had happened as he had foreseen fourteen years before cicero had not only predicted what happened in his own times but also what occurred long after according to the testimony of cornelius nepos the philosopher indeed affects no secret revelation nor visionary second sight he honestly tells us that this art had been acquired merely by study and the administration of public affairs while he reminds his friend of several remarkable instances of his successful predictions i do not divine human events by the arts practised by the augurs but i use other signs cicero then expresses himself with the guarded obscurity of a philosopher who could not openly ridicule the prevailing superstitions but we perfectly comprehend the nature of his signs when in the great pending event of the rival conflicts of pompey and of caesar he shows the means he used for his purpose on one side i consider the humour and genius of caesar and on the other the condition and the manner of civil wars in a word the political diviner foretold events by their dependence on general causes while the moral diviner by his experience of the personal character anticipated the actions of the individual others too have asserted the possession of this faculty duver a famous chancellor of france imagined the faculty was intuitive with him by his own experience he had observed the results of this curious and obscure faculty and at a time when the history of the human mind was so imperfectly comprehended it is easy to account for the apparent egotism of this grave and dignified character
born says he with constitutional infirmity a mind and body but ill adapted to be laborious with a most treacherous memory enjoying no gift of nature yet able at all times to exercise a sagacity so great that i do not know since i have reached manhood that anything of importance has happened to the state to the public or to myself in particular which i had not foreseen this faculty seems to be described by a remarkable expression employed by thucydides in his character of themistocles of which the following is given as a close translation by a species of sagacity peculiarly his own for which he was in no degree indebted either to early education or after study he was super eminently happy in forming a prompt judgment in matters that admitted but little time for deliberation at the same time that he far surpassed all in his deductions of the future from the past or was the best guesser of the future from the past footnote o kaya gar zunisai kai ute pomathan s alten uden out epemathon tan te paracrema di elacistes butes cratistas nomen kai ton melton ton epipiston tu genesomenu arrestas icastis thucydides book one end of footnote should this faculty of moral and political prediction be ever considered as a science we can even furnish it with a denomination for the writer of the life of sir thomas brown prefixed to his works in claiming the honour of it for that philosopher calls it the stochastic a term derived from the greek and from archery meaning to shoot at a mark this eminent genius it seems often hit the white our biographer declares that though he were no prophet yet in that faculty which comes nearest to it he excelled that is the stochastic wherein he was seldom mistaken as to future events as well public as private we are not indeed inculcating the fanciful elements of an occult art we know whence its principles may be drawn and we may observe how it was practised by the wisest among the ancients aristotle who collected all the curious knowledge of his times has preserved some remarkable opinions on the art of divination in detailing the various subterfuges practised by the pretended diviners of his day he reveals the secret principle by which one of them regulated his predictions he frankly declared that the future being always very obscure while the past was easy to know his predictions had never the future in view for he decided from the past as it appeared in human affairs which however lie concealed from the multitude such is the true principle by which a philosophical historian may become a skilful diviner human affairs make themselves they grow out of one another with slight variations and thus it is that they usually happen as they have happened the necessary dependence of effects on causes and the similarity of human interests and human passions are confirmed by comparative parallels with the past the philosophic sage of holy writ truly deduced the important principle that the thing that hath been is that which shall be the vital facts of history deadened by the touch of chronological antiquarianism are restored to animation when we comprehend the principles which necessarily terminate in certain results and discover the characters among mankind who are the usual actors in these scenes the heart of man beats on the same eternal springs and whether he advances or retrogrades he cannot escape out of the 
march of human thought hence in the most extraordinary revolutions we discover that the time and the place only have changed for even when events are not strictly parallel we detect the same conducting principles scipio amorato one of the great italian historians in his curious discourses on tacitus intermingles ancient examples with the modern that he says all may see how the truth of things is not altered by the changes and diversities of time machiavel drew his illustrations of modern history from the ancient when the french revolution recalled our attention to a similar eventful period in our own history the neglected volumes which preserved the public and private history of our charles i and cromwell were collected with eager curiosity often the scene existing before us even the very personages themselves opened on us in these forgotten pages but as the annals of human nature did not commence with those of charles the first we took a still more retrograde step and it was discovered in this wider range that in the various governments of greece and rome the events of those times had been only reproduced among them the same principles had terminated in the same results and the same personages had figured in the same drama this strikingly appeared in a little curious volume entitled essai sur l'histoire de la révolution françoise par une société d'auteur latin published at paris in eighteen hundred and one this society of latin authors who have written so inimitably the history of the french revolution consist of the roman historians themselves by extracts ingeniously applied the events of that melancholy period are so appositely described indeed so minutely narrated that they will not fail to surprise those who are not accustomed to detect the perpetual parallels which we meet with in philosophical history many of these crises in history are close resemblances of each other compare the history of the league in france with that of our own civil wars we are struck by the similar occurrences performed by the same political characters who played their part on both those great theatres of human action a satirical royalist of those times has commemorated the motives the incidents and the personages in the satyr manipe de la vertu de catholicon d'espagne and this famous satyr manipe is a perfect hudibra in prose the writer discovers all the bitter ridicule of butler in his ludicrous and severe exhibition of the etat de paris while the artist who designed the satirical prince becomes no contemptible hogarth so much are these public events alike in their general spirit and termination that they have afforded the subject of a printed but unpublished volume entitled essai sur les revolutions footnote this work was printed in london as a first volume but remained unpublished this singularly curious production was suppressed but reprinted at paris it has suffered the most cruel mutilations i read with surprise and instruction the single copy which i was assured was the only one saved from the havoc of the entire edition the writer was the celebrated chateaubriand End of footnote. the whole work was modelled on this principle it would be possible says the eloquent writer to frame a table or chart in which all the given imaginable events of the history of a people would be reduced to a mathematical exactness the conception is fanciful but its foundation lies deep in truth a remarkable illustration of the secret principle divulged by aristotle and described by thucydides appears in the recent confession of a man of genius among ourselves when mr coleridge was a political writer in the morning post 
and courier at a period of darkness and utter confusion that rider was then conducted by a tract of light not revealed to ordinary journalists on the napoleonic empire of that despotism in masquerade he decided by the state of rome under the first caesars and of the spanish-american revolution by taking the war of the united provinces with philip the second as the groundwork of the comparison on every great occurrence he says i endeavoured to discover in past history the event that most nearly resembled it i procured the contemporary historians memorialists and path Flatiers, then fairly subtracting the points of difference from those of likeness as the balance favoured the former or the latter i conjectured that the result would be the same or different in the essays on the probable final restoration of the bourbons i feel myself authorised to affirm by the effect produced on many intelligent men that were the dates wanting it might have been suspected that the essays had been written within the last twelve months End of section thirty three Section thirty four of Curiosities of Literature, Volume three. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Curiosities of Literature, Volume three by Isaac Disraeli. Prediction Part two. In moral predictions on individuals, many have discovered the future character, the revolutionary character of Cardinal de Retz, even in his youth, was detected by the sagacity of Mazarin. He then wrote the history of the conspiracy of Fiesco with such vehement admiration of his hero that the Italian politician, after its perusal, predicted that the young author would be one of the most turbulent spirits of the age the father of marshal Beron, even amid the glory of his son discovered the cloud which invisible to others was to obscure it the father indeed well knew the fiery passions of his son Beron said the domestic seer i advise thee when peace takes place to go and plant cabbages in thy garden otherwise i warn thee thou wilt lose thy head on the scaffold lorenzo de medici had studied the temper of his son piero for guicciardini informs us that he had often complained to his most intimate friends that he foresaw the imprudence and arrogance of his son would occasion the ruin of his family there is a remarkable prediction of james i of the evils likely to ensue from laud's violence in a conversation given by hackett which the king held with archbishop williams when the king was hard pressed to promote laud he gave his reasons why he intended to keep laud back from all place of rule and authority because i find he hath a restless spirit and cannot see when matters are well but loves to toss and change and to bring things to a pitch of reformation floating in his own brain which endangers the steadfastness of that which is in a good pass i speak not at random he hath made himself known to me to be such an one james then gives the circumstances to which he alludes and at length when still pursued by the archbishop then the organ of buckingham as usual this king's good nature too easily yielded he did not however without closing with this prediction then take him to you but on my soul you will repent it the future character of cromwell was apparent to two of our great politicians this coarse unpromising man said lord falkland pointing to cromwell will be the first person in the kingdom if the nation comes to blows and archbishop williams told charles i confidentially there was that in cromwell which foreboded something dangerous and wished his majesty would either win him over to him or get him taken off 
the marquis of wellesley's incomparable character of bonaparte predicted his fall when highest in his glory that great statesman then poured forth the sublime language of philosophical prophecy his eagerness of power is so inordinate his jealousy of independence so fierce his keenness of appetite so feverish in all that touches his ambition even in the most trifling things that he must plunge into dreadful difficulties he is one of an order of minds that by nature make for themselves great reverses lord mansfield was once asked after the commencement of the french revolution when it would end his lordship replied it is an event without precedent and therefore without prognostic the truth however is that it had both our own history had furnished a precedent in the times of charles i and the prognostics were so redundant that a volume might be collected of passages from various writers who had predicted it however ingenious might be a history of the reformation before it occurred the evidence could not be more authentic and positive than that of the great moral and political revolution which we have witnessed in our own days a prediction which bishop butler threw out in a sermon before the house of lords in seventeen forty one does honour to his political sagacity as well as to his knowledge of human nature he calculated that the irreligious spirit would produce some time or other political disorders similar to those which in the seventeenth century had arisen from religious fanaticism is there no danger he observed that all this may raise somewhat like that levelling spirit upon atheistical principles which in the last age prevailed upon enthusiastic ones not to speak of the possibility that different sorts of people may unite in it upon these contrary principles all this literally has been accomplished leibnitz indeed foresaw the results of those selfish and at length demoralizing opinions which began to prevail through europe in his day these disorganizing principles conducted by a political sect who tried to be worse than they could be as old montaigne expresses it a sort of men who have been audaciously congratulated as having a taste for evil exhibited to the astonished world the dismal catastrophe the philosopher predicted i shall give this remarkable passage i find that certain opinions approaching those of epicurus and spinoza are little by little insinuating themselves into the minds of the great rulers of public affairs who serve as the guides of others and on whom all matters depend besides these opinions are also sliding into fashionable books and thus they are preparing all things to that general revolution which menaces europe destroying those generous sentiments of the ancients greek and roman which preferred the love of country and public good and the cares of posterity to fortune and even to life our public spirits footnote public spirit and public spirits were about the year seventeen hundred household words with us leibnitz was struck by their significance but it might now puzzle us to find synonyms or even to explain the very terms themselves End of footnote. as the english call them excessively diminish and are no more in fashion and will be still less while the least vicious of these men preserve only one principle which they call honour a principle which only keeps them from not doing what they deem a low action while they openly laugh at the love of country ridicule those who are zealous for public ends and when a well-intentioned man asks what will become of their posterity they reply then as now but it may happen to these persons themselves to have to endure those evils which they believed are reserved for others if this epidemical and intellectual disorder could be corrected whose bad effects are already visible those evils might still be prevented but if it proceeds in its growth providence will correct man by the very revolution which must spring from it 
whatever may happen indeed all must turn out as usual for the best in general at the end of the account although this cannot happen without the punishment of those who contribute even to general good by their evil actions the most superficial reader will hardly require a commentary on this very remarkable passage he must instantly perceive how leibnitz in the seventeenth century foresaw what has occurred in the eighteenth and the prediction has been verified in the history of the actors in the late revolution while the result which we have not perhaps yet had according to leibnitz's own exhilarating system of optimism is an eduction of good from evil a great genius who was oppressed by malignant rivals in his own times has been noticed by madame de stal as having left behind him an actual prophecy of the french revolution this was gibert who in his commentary on folard's polybius published in seventeen twenty seven declared that a conspiracy is actually forming in europe by means at once so subtle and efficacious that i am sorry not to have come into the world thirty years later to witness its result it must be confessed that the sovereigns of europe wear very bad spectacles the proofs of it are mathematical if such proofs ever were of a conspiracy gibert unquestionably foresaw the anti-monarchical spirit gathering up its mighty wings and rising over the universe but could not judge of the nature of the impulse which he predicted prophesying from the ideas in his luminous intellect he seems to have been far more curious about than certain of the consequences rousseau even circumstantially predicted the convulsions of modern europe he stood on the crisis of the french revolution which he vividly foresaw for he seriously advised the higher classes of society to have their children taught some useful trade a notion highly ridiculed on the first appearance of the emile but at its hour the awful truth struck he too foresaw the horrors of that revolution for he announced that emile designed to emigrate because from the moral state of the people a virtuous revolution had become impossible footnote this extraordinary passage is at the close of the third book of emile to which i must refer the reader it is curious however to observe that in seventeen sixty rousseau poured forth the following awful predictions which were considered quite absurd vous vous fiez à l'ordre actuel de la société sans songer que cet ordre est sujet à des révolutions inévitables le grand divion petit le riche devient pauvre le monarque devient sujet nous approchons l'état de crise et du siècle des révolutions que faire donc dans la bassesse sa trappe que vous n'aurez élevé que pour la grandeur que fera donc la pauvreté ce publicain qui ne sait vivre que d'or que fera de pour vous de tout ce fastueux imbécile qui ne sait point où c'est de lui-même etc etc end of footnote afterwards the eloquence of burke was often oracular and a speech of pitt in eighteen hundred painted the state of europe as it was only realized fifteen years afterwards but many remarkable predictions have turned out to be false whenever the facts on which the prediction is raised are altered in their situation what was relatively true ceases to operate as a general principle for instance to that striking anticipation which rousseau formed of the french revolution he added by way of note as remarkable a prediction on monarchy je tiens pour impossible que les grandes monarchies de l'europe aient encore longtemps à durer tout en bouillet et tout état qui bouille et sur son déclin the predominant anti-monarchical spirit among our rising generation seems to hasten on the accomplishment of the prophecy but if an important alteration has occurred in the nature of things we may question the result 
if by looking into the past rousseau found facts which sufficiently proved that nations in the height of their splendour and corruption had closed their career by falling an easy conquest to barbarous invaders who annihilated the most polished people at a single blow we now find that no such power any longer exists in the great family of europe the state of the question is therefore changed it is now how corrupt nations will act against corrupt nations equally enlightened but if the citizen of geneva drew his prediction of the extinction of monarchy in europe from that predilection for democracy which assumes that a republic must necessarily produce more happiness to the people than a monarchy then we say that the fatal experiment was again repeated since the prediction and the fact proved not true the excess of democracy inevitably terminates in a monarchical state and were all the monarchies in europe at present republics a philosopher might safely predict the restoration of monarchy if a prediction be raised on facts which our own prejudices induce us to infer will exist it must be chimerical we have an universal chronicle of the monk carrion printed in fifteen thirty two in which he announces that the world was about ending footnote this prediction of the end of the world is one of the most popular hallucinations warmly received by many whenever it is promulgated it had the most marked effect when the cycle of a thousand years after the birth of christ was approaching completion and the world was assured that was the limit of its present state numerous acts of piety were performed churches were built religious houses founded and asceticism became the order of the day until the dreaded year was completed without the accompaniment of the supernatural horrors so generally feared the world soon relapsed into forgetfulness and went on as before very many prophecies have since been promulgated and in defiance of such repeated failures are still occasionally indulged in by persons from whom better things might be expected richard brothers in the last century and more than one reverend gentleman in the present one have been bold enough to fix an exact time for the event but it has passed as quietly as the thousandth anniversary noted above End of footnote. as well as his chronicle of it that the turkish empire would not last many years that after the death of charles v the empire of germany would be torn to pieces by the germans themselves this monk will no longer pass for a prophet he belongs to that class of historians who write to humour their own prejudices like a certain lady prophetess who in eighteen eleven predicted that grass was to grow in cheapside about this time footnote one of the most effective prophecies against london and which frightened for the time a very large number of its inhabitants was that given out in the spring of seventeen fifty after a slight shock of an earthquake was felt in london and it was prophesied that another should occur which would destroy the town and all its inhabitants all the roads were thronged with persons flying to the country a day or two before the threatened event and they were all unmercifully ridiculed when the day passed over quietly walpole in one of his amusing letters speaks of a party who went to an inn ten miles out of town where they are to play at brag till five in the morning and then come back i suppose to look for the bones of their husbands and families under the rubbish jokers who were out late amused themselves by bawling in the watchman's voice past four o'clock and a dreadful earthquake a pamphlet purporting to be a full and true account of this earthquake which never happened was printed for tim tremor in fleet street seventeen fifty and made the vehicle for much personal satire thus it is stated that the commissioners of westminster bridge have ordered this calamity to be entered in their books as a glorious excuse for the next sinking pier and that the town received some comfort upon hearing that the inns of court were all sunk and several orders were given that no one should assist in bringing any one lawyer above ground End of footnote. the monk 
carrion like others of greater name had miscalculated the weeks of daniel and wished more ill to the mahometans than suit the christian cabinets of europe to inflict on them and lastly the monastic historian had no notion that it would please providence to prosper the heresy of luther sir james mackintosh once observed i am sensible that in the field of political prediction veteran sagacity has often been deceived sir james alluded to the memorable example of harrington who published a demonstration of the impossibility of re-establishing monarchy in england six months before the restoration of charles the second but the author of the oceana was a political fanatic who ventured to predict an event not by other similar events but by a theoretical principle which he had formed that the balance of power depends on that of property harrington in his contracted view of human nature had dropped out of his calculation all the stirring passions of ambition and party and the vacillations of the multitude a similar error of a great genius occurs in defoe child says mr george chalmers foreseeing from experience that men's conduct must finally be decided by their principles foretold the colonial revolt defoe allowing his prejudices to obscure his sagacity reprobated that suggestion because he deemed interest a more strenuous prompter than enthusiasm the predictions of harrington and defoe are precisely such as we might expect from a petty calculator a political economist who can see nothing farther than immediate results but the true philosophical predictor was child who had read the past it is probable that the american emancipation from the mother country of england was foreseen twenty or thirty years before it occurred though not perhaps by the administration lord orford writing in seventeen fifty four under the ministry of the duke of newcastle blames the instructions to the governor of new york which seemed better calculated for the latitude of mexico and for a spanish tribunal than for a free british settlement and in such opulence and such haughtiness that suspicions had long been conceived of their meditating to throw off the dependence on their mother country if this was written at the time as the author asserts it is a very remarkable passage observes the noble editor of his memoirs the prognostics or presages of this revolution it may now be difficult to recover but it is evident that child before the time when lord orford wrote this passage predicted the separation on true and philosophical principles even when the event does not always justify the prediction the predictor may not have been the less correct in his principles of divination the catastrophe of human life and the turn of great events often prove accidental marshal biron whom we have noticed might have ascended the throne instead of the scaffold cromwell and de retz might have become only the favourite general or the minister of their sovereigns for to its this events are not comprehended in the reach of human prescience such must be consigned to those vulgar superstitions which presume to discover the issue of human events without pretending to any human knowledge there is nothing supernatural in the prescience of the philosopher sometimes predictions have been condemned as false ones which when scrutinized we can scarcely deem to have failed they may have been accomplished and they may again revolve on us in seventeen forty nine dr hartley published his observations on man and predicted the fall of the existing governments and hierarchies in two simple propositions among others proposition eighty one it is probable that all the civil governments will be overturned proposition eighty two it is probable that the present forms of church government will be dissolved many were alarmed at these predicted falls of church and state lady charlotte wentworth asked hartley when these terrible things would happen the answer of the predictor was not less awful i am an old man and shall not live to see them but you are a young woman and probably will see them in the subsequent revolutions of america and of france and perhaps now of spain we can hardly deny that these predictions had failed a fortuitous event has once more thrown back europe into its old corners but we still revolve in a circle and what is now dark and remote may again come round when time has performed its great cycle 
there was a prophetical passage in hooker's ecclesiastical polity regarding the church which long occupied the speculations of its expounders hooker indeed seemed to have done what no predictor of events should do he fixed on the period of its accomplishment in fifteen ninety seven he declared that it would peradventure fall out to be threescore and ten years or if strength do awe into fourscore those who had outlived the revolution in sixteen forty one when the long parliament pulled down the ecclesiastical establishment and sold the church lands a circumstance which hooker had contemplated and were afterwards returned to their places on the restoration imagined that the prediction had not yet been completed and were looking with great anxiety towards the year sixteen seventy seven for the close of this extraordinary prediction when bishop barlow in sixteen seventy five was consulted on it he endeavoured to dissipate the panic by referring to an old historian who had reproached our nation for their proneness to prophecies Footnote an eye-witness of the great fire of london has noted the difficulty of obtaining effective assistance in endeavouring to stay its progress owing to the superstition which seized many persons because a prophecy of mother shipton's was quoted to show that london was doomed to hopeless and entire destruction End of footnote the prediction of the venerable hooker in truth had been fully accomplished and the event had occurred without bishop barlow having recurred to it so easy it seems to forget what we dislike to remember the period of time was too literally taken and seems to have been only the figurative expression of man's age in scriptural language which hooker had employed but no one will now deny that this prescient sage had profoundly foreseen the results of that rising party whose designs on church and state were clearly depicted in his own luminous view the philosophical predictor in foretelling a crisis from the appearance of things will not rashly assign the period of time for the crisis which he anticipates is calculated on by that inevitable march of events which generate each other in human affairs but the period is always dubious being either retarded or accelerated by circumstances of a nature incapable of entering into this moral arithmetic it is probable that a revolution similar to that of france would have occurred in this country had it not been counteracted by the genius of pitt in sixteen eighteen it was easy to foretell by the political prognostic that a mighty war throughout europe must necessarily occur at that moment observes bayle the house of austria aimed at a universal monarchy the consequent domineering spirit of the ministers of the emperor and the king of spain combined with their determination to exterminate the new religion excited a reaction to this imperial despotism public opinion had been suppressed till every people grew impatient while their sovereigns influenced by national feeling were combining against austria but austria was a vast military power and her generals were the first of their class the efforts of europe would then be often repulsed this state of affairs prognosticated a long war and when at length it broke out it lasted thirty years the approach and the duration of the war might have been predicted but the period of its termination could not have been foreseen there is however a spirit of political vaticination which presumes to pass beyond the boundaries of human prescience it has been often ascribed to the highest source of inspiration by enthusiasts but since the language of prophecy has ceased such pretensions are not less impious than they are unphilosophical knox the reformer possessed an extraordinary portion of this awful prophetic confidence he appears to have predicted several remarkable events and the fates of some persons we are told that condemned to a galley at rochelle he predicted that within two or three years he should preach the gospel at st giles's in edinburgh an improbable event which happened of mary and darnley he pronounced that as the king for the queen's pleasure had gone to mass the lord and his justice would make her the instrument of his overthrow other striking predictions of the deaths of thomas maitland and of kirkcaldy of grange and the warning he solemnly gave to the regent murray not to go to linlithgow where he was assassinated occasioned a barbarous people to imagine that the prophet knox had received an immediate communication from heaven 
a spanish friar and almanac maker predicted in clear and precise words the death of henry the fourth of france and pierres though he had no faith in the vain science of astrology yet alarmed at whatever menaced the life of a beloved monarch consulted with some of the king's friends and had the spanish almanac laid before his majesty that high-spirited monarch thanked them for their solicitude but utterly slighted the prediction the event occurred and in the following year the spanish friar spread his own fame in a new almanac i have been occasionally struck at the jeremiads of honest george withers the vaticinating poet of our civil wars some of his works afford many solemn predictions we may account for many predictions of this class without the intervention of any supernatural agency among the busy spirits of a revolutionary age the heads of a party such as knox have frequently secret communications with spies or with friends in a constant source of concealed information a shrewd confident and enthusiastic temper will find ample matter for mysterious prescience knox exercised that deep sagacity which took in the most enlarged views of the future as appears by his machiavellian foresight on the barbarous destruction of the monasteries and the cathedrals the best way to keep the rooks from returning is to pull down their nests in the case of the prediction of the death of henry the fourth by the spanish friar it, it resulted either from his being acquainted with the plot or from his being made an instrument for their purpose by those who were it appears that rumours of henry's assassination were rife in spain and italy before the event occurred such vaticinators as george withers will always rise in those disturbed times which his own prosaic metre has forcibly depicted it may be on that darkness which they find within their hearts a sudden light hath shined making reflections of some things to come which leave within them musings troublesome to their weak spirits or to intricate for them to put in order and relate they act as men in ecstasies have done striving their cloudy visions to declare and i perhaps among these may be one that was let loose for service to be done i blunder out what worldly prudent men count madness page seven separating human prediction from inspired prophecy we only ascribe to the faculties of man that acquired prescience which we have demonstrated that some great minds have unquestionably exercised we have discovered its principles in the necessary dependence of effects on general causes and we have shown that impelled by the same motives and circumscribed by the same passions all human affairs revolve in a circle and we have opened the true source of this yet imperfect science of moral and political prediction in an intimate but a discriminative knowledge of the past authority is sacred when experience affords parallels and analogies if much which may overwhelm when it shall happen can be foreseen the prescient statesman and moralist may provide defensive measures to break the waters whose streams they cannot always direct and the venerable hooker has profoundly observed that the best things have been overthrown not so much by puissance and might of adversaries as through defective counsel in those that should have upheld and defended the same footnote hooker wrote this about fifteen sixty and he wrote before the siecle des revolutions had begun even among ourselves he penetrated into this important principle merely by the force of his own meditation at this moment after more practical experience in political revolutions a very intelligent french writer in a pamphlet entitled monsieur de says experience proclaims a great truth namely that revolutions themselves cannot succeed except when they are favoured by a portion of the government he illustrates the axiom by the different revolutions which have occurred in his nation within these thirty years it is the same truth traced to its source by another road End of footnote the philosophy of history blends the past with the present and combines the present with the future each is but a portion of the other the actual state of a thing is necessarily determined by its antecedent and thus progressively through the chain of human existence while the present is always full of the future as leibniz has happily expressed the idea 
a new and beautiful light is thus thrown over the annals of mankind by the analogies and the parallels of different ages in succession how the seventeenth century has influenced the eighteenth and the results of the nineteenth as they shall appear in the twentieth might open a source of predictions to which however difficult it might be to affix their dates there would be none in exploring into causes and tracing their inevitable effects the multitude live only among the shadows of things in the appearances of the present the learned busied with the past can only trace whence and how all comes but he who is one of the people and one of the learned the true philosopher views the natural tendency and terminations which are preparing for the future End of section thirty four Section 35 of Curiosities of Literature, Volume 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Annie Hill. Curiosities of Literature, Volume 3, by Isaac Disraeli. Dreams at the Dawn of Philosophy. Modern philosophy, theoretical or experimental, only amuses while the action of discovery is suspended or advances the interest ceases with the inquirer when the catastrophe is ascertained as in the romance whose denouement turns on a mysterious incident which once unfolded all future agitation ceases but in the true infancy of science philosophers were as imaginative a race as poets marvels and portents and demonstrable and undefinable with occult fancies perpetually beginning and never ending were delightful as the shifting cantos of ariosto then science entranced the eye by its thaumaturgy when they looked through an optic tube they believed they were looking into futurity or starting at some shadow darkening the glassy globe beheld the absent person while the mechanical inventions of art were toys and tricks with sometimes an automaton which frightened them with life the earlier votaries of modern philosophy only witnessed as garofel calls his collection unheard-of curiosities this state of the marvellous of which we are now for ever deprived prevailed among the philosophers and the virtuosi in europe and with ourselves long after the establishment of the royal society philosophy then depended mainly on authority a single one however was sufficient so that when this had been repeated by fifty others they had the authority of fifty honest men whoever the first man might have been they were then a blissful race of children rambling here and there in a golden age of innocence and ignorance where at every step each gifted discoverer whispered to the few some half-concealed secret of nature or played with some toy of art some invention with great difficulty performed what without it might have been done with great ease the cabinets of the lovers of mechanical arts formed enchanted apartments where the admirers feared to stir or look about them while the philosophers themselves half imagined they were the very thaumaturgy for which the world gave them too much credit at least for their quiet would we run after the shadows in this gleaming land of moonshine or sport with these children in the fresh morning of science ere aurora had scarcely peeped on the hills we must enter into their feelings view with their eyes and believe all they confide to us and out of these bundles of dreams sometimes pick out one or two for our own dreaming they are the fairy tales and the arabian nights entertainments of science but if the reader is stubbornly mathematical and logical he will only be holding up a great torch against the muslin curtain upon which the fantastic shadows playing upon it must vanish at the instant it is an amusement which can only take place by carefully keeping himself in the dark footnote one nine seven goodwin's amusing lives of the necromancers abound in marvellous stories of the supernatural feats of these old students End of footnote. what a subject 
were i to enter on it would be the narratives of magical writers these precious volumes have been so constantly wasted by the profane that now a book of real magic requires some to find it as well as a great magician to use it albertus magnus or albert the great as he is erroneously styled for this sage only derived this enviable epitaph from his surname de groot as did hugo grotius this sage in his admirable secrets delivers his opinion that these books of magic should be most preciously preserved for he prophetically added the time is arriving when they would be understood it seems that they were not intelligible in the thirteenth century but if albertus had not miscalculated in the present day they may be magical terms with talismanic figures may yet conceal many a secret gunpowder came down to us in a sort of anagram and the kaleidoscope with all its interminable multiplications of forms lay at hand for two centuries in baptista porta's natural magic the abbot trithemius in a confidential letter happened to call himself a magician perhaps at the moment he thought himself one and sent three or four leaves stuffed with the names of devils and with their evocations at the death of his friend these leaves fell into the unworthy hands of the prior who was so frightened on the first glance at the diabolical nomenclature that he raised the country against the abbot and trithemius was nearly a lost man yet after all this evocation of devils has reached us in his steganographia and proves to be only one of this ingenious abbot's polygraphic attempts at secret writing for he had flattered himself that he had invented a mode of concealing his thoughts from all the world while he communicated them to a friend roger bacon promised to raise thunder and lightning and disperse clouds by dissolving them into rain the first magical process has been obtained by franklin and the other of far more use to our agriculturists may perchance be found lurking in some corner which has been overlooked in the opus magis of our dr mirabilis do we laugh at their magical works of art are we ourselves such indifferent artists cornelius agrippa before he wrote his vanity of the arts and sciences intended to reduce into a system and method the secret of communicating with spirits and demons footnote one nine eight agrippa was the most fortunate and honoured of occult philosophers he was lodged at courts and favoured by all his contemporaries scholars like erasmus spoke of him with admiration and royalty constantly sought his powers of divination but in advanced life he was accused of sorcery and died poor in fifteen thirty four end of footnote on good authority that of porphyrius silas plotinus jamblicus and on better were it necessary to allege it he was well assured that the upper regions of the air swarmed with what the greeks called demons just as our lower atmosphere is full of birds our waters of fish and our earth of insects yet this occult philosopher who knew perfectly eight languages and married two wives with whom he had never exchanged a harsh word in any of them was everywhere avoided as having by his side for his companion a personage no less than a demon this was a great black dog whom he suffered to stretch himself out among his magical manuscripts or lie on his bed often kissing and patting him and feeding him on choice morsels yet for this would paulus jovius and all the world have had him put into the ordeal of fire and faggot the truth was afterwards boldly asserted by wierus his learned domestic who believed that his master's dog was really nothing more than what he appeared i believe says he that he was a real natural dog he was indeed black but of a moderate size and i have often led him by a string and called him by the french name agrippa had given him monsieur and he had a female who was called mademoiselle i wonder how authors of such great characters should write so absurdly on his vanishing at his death nobody knows how but as it was probable that monsieur and mademoiselle must have generated some puppy demons 
wierus ought to have been more circumstantial albertus magnus for thirty years had never ceased working at a man of brass and had cast together the qualities of his materials under certain constellations which threw such a spirit into his man of brass that it was reported his growth was visible his feet legs thighs shoulder neck and head expanded and made the city of cologne uneasy at possessing one citizen too mighty for them all this man of brass when he reached his maturity was so loquacious that albert's master the great scholastic thomas aquinas one day tired of his babble and declaring it was a devil or devilish with his staff knocked the head off and what was extraordinary this brazen man like any human being thus effectually silenced word never spake more this incident is equally historical and authentic though whether heads of brass can speak and even prophesy was indeed a subject of profound inquiry even at a latter period footnote one nine nine one of the most popular of our old english prose romances the history of friar bacon narrates how he had intended to wall england about with brass by means of such a brazen head had not the stupidity of a servant prevented him the tale may be read in thomas's collection of early english prose romances End of footnote. nod who never questioned their vocal powers but was puzzled concerning the nature of this new species of animal has no doubt most judiciously stated the question whether these speaking brazen heads had a sensitive and reasoning nature or whether demons spoke in them but brass has not the faculty of providing its own nourishment as we see in plants and therefore they were not sensitive and as for the act of reasoning these brazen heads presume to know nothing but the future with the past and present they seem totally unacquainted so that their memory and their observation were very limited and as for the future that is always doubtful and obscure even to heads of brass this learned man then infers that these brazen heads could have no reasoning faculties for nothing altered their nature they said what they had to say which no one could contradict and having said their say you might have broken the head for anything more that you could have got out of it had they had any life in them would they not have moved as well as spoken life itself is but motion and they had no lungs no spleen and in fact though they spoke they had no tongue was a devil in them i think not yet why should men have taken all this trouble to make not a man but a trumpet our profound philosopher was right not to agitate the question whether these brazen heads had ever spoken why should not a man of brass speak since a doll can whisper a statue play chess footnote two hundred the allusion here is to the automaton chess player first exhibited by kempelen its adventure in england about seventeen eighty five the figure was habited as a turk and placed behind a chest this was opened by the exhibitor to display the machinery which seemed to give the figure motion while playing intricate games of chess with any of the spectators but it has been fully demonstrated that this chest could conceal a full-grown man who could place his arm down that of the figure and direct its movements in the game the machinery being really constructed to hide him and disarm suspicion as the whole trick has been demonstrated by diagrams the marvellous nature of the machinery is exploded End of footnote. and brass ducks have performed the whole process of digestion footnote 201. this brass duck was the work of a very ingenious mechanist m Balkinson. it's reported to have uttered its natural voice moved its wings drank water and ate corn in seventeen thirty eight he delighted the parisians by a figure of a shepherd which played on a pipe and beat a tabor and a flute-player who performed twelve tunes End of footnote. 
and another magical invention has been ridiculed with equal reason a magician was annoyed as philosophers still are by passengers in the street and he particularly so by having horses led to drink under his window he made a magical horse of wood according to one of the books of hermes which perfectly answered its purpose by frightening away the horses or rather the grooms the wooden horse no doubt gave some palpable kick the same magical story might have been told of dr franklin who finding that under his window the passengers had discovered a spot which they made too convenient for themselves he charged it with his newly discovered electrical fire after a few remarkable incidents had occurred which at a former period would have lodged the great discoverer of electricity in the inquisition the modern magician succeeded just as well as the ancient who had the advantage of coning over the books of hermes instead of ridiculing these works of magic let us rather become magicians ourselves the works of the ancient alchemists have afforded numberless discoveries to modern chemists nor is even their grand operation despaired of if they have of late not been so renowned this has arisen from a want of what ashmole calls a pertness a qualification early inculcated among these illuminated sages we find authentic accounts of people who have lived three centuries with tolerable complexions possessed of nothing but a crucible and a bellows but they were so unnecessarily mysterious that whenever such a person was discovered he was sure in an instant to disappear and was never afterwards heard of in the liber patris sapiente this selfish consciousness is all along impressed on the student for the accomplishment of the great mystery in the commentary on this precious work of the alchemist norton who counsels be thou in a place secret by thyself alone that no man see or hear what thou shalt say or done trust not thy friend too much wheresoe'er thou go for he thou trustest best some time may be thy foe ashmole observes that norton gives exceeding good advice to the student in this science where he bids him be secret in the carrying on of his studies and operations and not to let any one know of his undertakings but his good angel and himself and such a close and retired breast had norton's master who when men disputed of colours of the rose he would not speak but kept himself full close we regret that by each leaving all his knowledge to his good angel and himself it has happened that the good angels have kept it all to themselves it cannot however be denied that if they could not always extract gold out of lead they sometimes succeeded in washing away the pimples on ladies faces notwithstanding that sir kenelm digby poisoned his most beautiful lady because as sancho would have said he was one of those who would have his bread whiter than the finest wheaten van helmont who could not succeed in discovering the true elixir of life however hit on the spirit of hartshorn which for a good while he considered was the wonderful elixir itself restoring to life persons who seemed to have lost it and though this delightful enthusiast could not raise a ghost yet he thought he had for he raised something aerial from spa water which mistaking it for a ghost he gave it that very name a name which we still retain in gas from the german geist or ghost paraclesiast carried the tiny spirits about him in the hilt of his great sword having first discovered the qualities of laudanum this illustrious quack made use of it as a universal remedy and distributed it in the form of pills which he carried in the basket hilt of his sword the operations he performed were as rapid as they seemed magical doubtless we have lost some inconceivable secrets by some unexpected occurrences which the secret itself would seem ought to have prevented taking place when a philosopher had discovered the art of prolonging life to an indefinite period it is most provoking to find that he should have allowed himself to die at an early age 
we have a very authentic history from sir kenelm digby himself that when he went in disguise to visit descartes at his retirement at egmond lamenting the brevity of life which hindered philosophers getting on in their studies the french philosopher assured him that he had considered that matter to render a man immortal was what he could not promise but that he was very sure it was possible to lengthen out his life to the period of the patriarchs and when his death was announced to the world the abbe picot an ardent disciple for a long time would not believe it possible and at length insisted that if it had occurred it must have been owing to some mistake of the philosophers the late holcroft lutherburg and costway imagined that they should escape the vulgar era of scriptural life by reorganizing their old bones and moistening their dry marrow their new principles of vitality were supposed by them to be found in the powers of the mind this seemed more reasonable but proved to be as little efficacious as those other philosophies who imagine they have detected the hidden principle of life in the eels frisking in vinegar and allude to the bookbinder who creates the bookworm paraclesis has revealed to us one of the grandest secrets of nature when the world began to dispute on the very existence of the elementary folk it was then that he boldly offered to give birth to a fairy and has sent down to posterity the recipe he describes the impurity which is to be transmuted into such purity the gross elements of a delicate fairy which fixed in a vial placed in a fuming dung will in due time settle into a full-grown fairy bursting through its vitreous prison on the vivifying principle by which the ancient egyptians hatched their eggs in ovens i recollect that dr farmer's sale the leaf which preserved this recipe for making a fairy forcibly folded down by the learned commentator from which we must infer the credit he gave to the experiment there was a greatness of mind in Periclesis, who having furnished a recipe to make a fairy had the delicacy to refrain from its formation even baptista porta one of the most enlightened philosophers does not deny the possibility of engendering creatures which at their full growth shall not exceed the size of a mouse but he adds they are only pretty little dogs to play with were these akin to the fairies of periclesis footnote two o two this great charlatan after many successful impositions ended his life in poverty in the hospital of salzburg in fifteen forty one end of footnote they were well convinced of the existence of such elemental beings frequent accidents in mines showed the potency of the metallic spirits which so tormented the workmen in some of the german mines by blindness giddiness and sudden sickness that they have been obliged to abandon mines well known to be rich in silver a metallic spirit at one sweep annihilated twelve miners who were all found dead together the fact was unquestionable and the safety lamp was undiscovered never was a philosophical imagination more beautiful than that exquisite palingenesis as it had been termed from the greek or a regeneration or rather the apparitions of animals and plants schott kircher gaffarel borelli digby and the whole of that admirable school discovered in the ashes of plants their primitive forms which were again raised up by the force of heat nothing they say perishes in nature all is but a continuation or a revival the semina of resurrection are concealed in extinct bodies as in the blood of man the ashes of roses will again revive into roses though smaller and paler than if they had been planted unsubstantial and unodiferous they are not roses which grow on rose trees but their delicate apparitions and like apparitions they are seen but for a moment the process of the palingenesis this picture of immortality is described these philosophers having burnt a flower by calcination disengaged the salts from its ashes and deposited them in a glass vial a chemical mixture acted on it 
till in the fermentation they assumed a bluish and a spectral hue this dust thus excited by heat shoots upward into its primitive forms by sympathy the parts unite and while each is returning to its destined place we see distinctly the stalk the leaves and the flowers arise it is the pale spectre of a flower coming slowly forth from its ashes the heat passes away the magical scene declines till the whole matter again precipitates itself into the chaos at the bottom this vegetable phoenix lies thus concealed in its cold ashes till the presence of heat produces this resurrection in its absence it returns to its death thus the dead naturally revive and a corpse may give out its shadowy reanimation when not too deeply buried in the earth bodies corrupted in their graves have risen particularly the murdered for murderers are apt to bury their victims in a slight and hasty manner their salts exhaled in vapour by means of their fermentation have arranged themselves on the surface of the earth and formed those phantoms which at night have often terrified the passing spectator as authentic history witnesses they have opened the graves of the phantom and discovered the bleeding corpse beneath hence it is astonishing how many ghosts may be seen at night after a recent battle standing over their corpses on the same principle my old philosopher gaffarel conjectures on the reigning of frogs but these frogs we must conceive can only be the ghosts of frogs and gaffarel himself has modestly opened this fact by a peradventure a more satisfactory origin of ghosts modern philosophy has not afforded and who does not believe in the existence of ghosts for as dr moore forcibly says that there should be so universal a fame and fear of that which never was nor is nor can be ever in the world is to me the greatest miracle of all if there had not been at some time or other true miracles it had not been so easy to impose on the people by false the alchemist would never go about to sophisticate metals to pass them off for true gold and silver unless that such a thing was acknowledged as true gold and silver in the world the pharmacopoeia of those times combined more of morals with medicine than our own they discovered that the agate rendered a man eloquent and even witty a laurel leaf placed on the centre of the skull fortified the memory the brains of fowls and birds of swift wing wonderfully helped the imagination all such specifics have now disappeared and have greatly reduced the chances of an invalid recovering that which perhaps he never possessed lentils and rapeseed were a certain cure for the smallpox and very obviously their grains resembling the spots of this disease they discovered that those who lived on fair plants became fair those on fruitful ones were never barren on the principle that hercules acquired his mighty strength by feeding on the marrow of lions but their talismans provided they were genuine seem to have been wonderfully operative and had we the same confidence and melted down the guineas we give physicians engraving on them talismanic figures i would answer for the good effects of the experiment naude indeed has utterly ridiculed the occult virtues of talismans in his defence of virgil accused of being a magician the poet it seems cast into a well a talisman of a horse leech graven on a plate of gold to drive away the great number of horse leeches which infested naples naude positively denies that talismans ever possessed any such occult virtues gaffarel regrets that so judicious a man as naude should have gone this length giving the lie to so many authentic authors and naude's paradox is indeed as strange as his denial he suspects the thing is not true because it is so generally told it leads one to suspect says he as animals are said to have been driven away from so many places by these talismans whether they were ever driven from any one place gaffarel suppressing by his good temper his indignant feelings at such reasoning turns the paradox on its maker 
as if because of the great number of battles that hannibal is reported to have fought with the romans we might not by the same reason doubt whether he fought any one with them the reader must be aware that the strength of the argument lies entirely with the firm believer in talismans gaffarel indeed who passed his days in collecting curiosities in Nuis, is a most authentic historian of unparalleled events even in his own times such as that heavy rain in Poitou, which showered down petit bestioles little creatures like bishops with their mitres and monks with their capuchins over their heads it is true afterwards they all turned into butterflies the museums the cabinets and the inventions of our early virtuosi were the baby houses of philosophers baptista porta bishop wilkins and old ashmole were they now living had been enrolled among the quiet members of the society of arts instead of flying in the air collecting a wing of the phoenix as tradition goes or catching the disjointed syllables of an old doting astrologer but these early dilettanti had not derived the same pleasure from the useful inventions of the aforesaid society of arts as they received from what cornelius agrippa in a fit of spleen calls things vain and superfluous invented to no other end but for pomp and idle pleasure baptista porta was more skilful in the mysteries of art and nature than any man in his day having found the academy the gaily oziosi he held an inferior association in his own house called the secreti where none was admitted but those elect who had communicated some secret for in the early period of modern art and science the slightest novelty became a secret not to be confided to the uninitiated porta was unquestionably a fine genius as his works still show but it was his misfortune that he attributed his own penetrating sagacity to his skill in the art of divination he considered himself a prognosticator and what was more unfortunate some eminent persons really thought he was predictions and secrets are harmless provided they are not believed but his holiness finding portas were warned him that magical sciences were great hindrances to the study of the bible and paid him the compliment to forbid his prophesying portas genius was now limited to astonish and sometimes to terrify the more ingenious part of i secreti on entering his cabinet some phantom of an attendant was sure to be hovering in the air moving as he who entered moved or he observed in some mirror that his face was twisted on the wrong side of his shoulders and did not quite think that all was right when he clapped his hand on it or passing through a darkened apartment a magical landscape burst on him with human beings in motion the boughs of trees bending and the very clouds passing over the sun or sometimes banquets battles and hunting parties were in the same apartment all these spectacles my friends have witnessed exclaims the self-delighted baptista porta when his friends drank wine out of the same cup which he had used they were mortified with wonder for he drank wine and they only water or on a summer's day when all complained of the sirocco he would freeze his guests with cold air in the room or on a sudden let off a flying dragon to sail along with a cracker in its tail and a cat tied on his back shrill was the sound and awful was the concussion so that it required strong nerves in any age of apparitions and devils to meet this great philosopher when in his best humour albertus magnus entertained the earl of holland as that earl passed through cologne in a severe winter with a warm summer scene luxuriant in fruits and flowers the fact is related by trithemius and this magical scene connected with his vocal head and his books de secretis mulierum and de mirabilibus confirmed the accusations they raised against the great albert for being a magician his apologist theophilus reynaud is driven so hard to defend albertus that he at once asserts the winter change to summer 
and the speaking head to be two infamous flams he will not believe these authenticated facts although he credits a miracle which proves the sanctity of albertus after three centuries the body of albert the great remained as sweet as ever whether such enchantments as old mandeville cautiously observeth two centuries preceding the days of porta were by craft or by nigromancy i want ne'er but that they were not unknown to chaucer appears in his francoline's tale where minutely describing them he communicates the same pleasure he must himself have received from the ocular illusions of the trigator or jugalur chaucer ascribed the miracle to a natural magique in which however it was unsettled whether the prince of darkness was a party concerned for i am sicker that there be sciences by which man maketh diverse appearances switch as this subtle tregator's play for oft at fests have i well heard say the tregators within a hall large have made come in a water and a barge and in the hall grown up and down some hath seemed come a grim leon and sometimes floors spring as in a maid sometime a vine and grapes white and red sometime a castle all of lime and stone and when hem liketh voideth it anon thus seemeth it to every man's sight bishop wilkins museum was visited by evelyn who described the sort of curiosities which occupied and amused the children of science here too there was a hollow statue which gave a voice and uttered words by a long concealed pipe that went to its mouth whilst one speaks through it at a good distance a circumstance which perhaps they were not then aware revealed the whole mystery of the ancient oracles which they attributed to demons rather than to tubes pulleys and wheels they learned charles Peyton in his scientific travels records among other valuable productions of art a cherry stone on which were engraven about a dozen and a half portraits even the greatest of human geniuses leonardo da vinci to attract the royal patronage created a lion which ran before the french monarch dropping fleur-de-lis from its shaggy breast and another philosopher who had a spinet which played and stopped at command might have made a revolution in the arts and sciences had the half-stifled child that was concealed in it not been forced unluckily to crawl into daylight and thus it was proved that a philosopher might be an impostor the arts as well as the sciences at the first institution of the royal society were of the most amusing class the famous sir samuel morland had turned his house into an enchanted palace everything was full of devices which showed art and mechanism in perfection his coach carried a travelling kitchen for it had a fireplace and a grate with which he could make soup broil cutlets and roast an egg and he dressed his meat by clockwork another of these virtuosi who is described as a gentleman of superior order and whose house was a knick-knackatory valued himself on his multifarious inventions but most in sowing salads in the morning to be cut for dinner the house of winstanley who afterwards raised the first eddystone lighthouse must have been the wonder of the age if you kicked aside an old slipper purposely lying in your way up started a ghost before you or if you sat down in a certain chair a couple of gigantic arms would immediately clasp you there was an arbor in the garden by the side of a canal you had scarcely seated yourself when you were sent out afloat into the middle of the canal from whence you could not escape till this man of art and science wound you up to the arbor what was passing at the royal society was also occurring at the academie des sciences at paris a great and gouty member of that philosophical body on the departure of a stranger would point to his legs to show the impossibility of conducting him to the door yet the astonished visitor 
never failed finding the virtuoso waiting for him on the outside to make his final bow. While the visitor was going down the stairs, this inventive genius was descending with great velocity in a machine from the window, so that he proved that if a man of science cannot force nature to walk downstairs, he may drive her out at the window. If they traveled at home, they set off to note down prodigies. Dr. Plot, in a magnificent project of journeying through England for the advantage of learning and trade and the discovery of antiquities and other curiosities, for which he solicited the royal aid which Leyland enjoyed, among other notable designs, discriminates a class thus. Next, I shall inquire of animals, and first of strange people. Strange accidents that attend corporations or families, as that the deans of Rochester, ever since the foundation by turns, have died deans and bishops. The bird with a white breast that haunts the family of Oxenham near Exeter, just before the death of any of that family. The bodies of trees that are seen to swim in a pool near Brereton in Cheshire. A certain warning to the heir of that honourable family to prepare for the next world. And such remarkables as number of children such as the Lady Temple, who before she died saw seven hundred descended from her. Footnote 203. Similar popular fallacies may be seen carefully noted in R. Burton's Admirable Curiosities, Rarities, and Wonders in England, Scotland, and Ireland, 1684. It is one of those curious volumes of folklore sent out by Nat Crouch, the bookseller, under a fictitious name. End of footnote. This fellow of the Royal Society, who lived nearly to 1700, was requested to give an edition of Pliny. We have lost the benefit of a most copious commentary. Bishop Hall went to the spa. The wood about that place was haunted not only by freebooters, but by wolves and witches, although these last are oft times but one. They were called Lupus Gero, and the Greeks, it seems, knew them by the name Lycanropos, men-wolves, witches that have put on the shapes of those cruel beasts. We saw a boy there, whose half-face was devoured by one of them near the village, yet so as that the ear was rather cut than bitten off. Rumor had spread that the boy had had half his face devoured. When it was examined, it turned out that his ear had only been scratched. However, there can be no doubt of the existence of witch-wolves, for Hall saw at Limburg one of those miscreants executed, who confessed on the wheel to have devoured two and forty children in that form. They would probably have found it difficult, to have summoned the mothers who had lost the children, but observe our philosopher's reasoning. It would ask a large volume to scan this problem of lycanthropy. He had laboriously collected all the evidence and had added his arguments. The result offers a curious instance of acute reasoning on a wrong principle. Footnote 204 Hall's postulate is that God's work could not admit of any substantial change, which is above the reach of all infernal powers, but herein the devil plays the double sophister, the sorcerer with sorcerers. He both deludes the witch's conceit and the beholder's eyes. In a word, Hall believes in what he cannot understand. Yet Hall will not believe one of the Catholic miracles of the Virgin of Louvain, though Lipsius had written a book to commemorate the goddess, as Hall sarcastically calls her. Hall was told with great indignation in the shop of the bookseller of Lipsius that when James I had just looked over this work, he flung it down, vociferating, damnation to him that made it, and to him that believes it. End of footnote. Men of science and art, then, pass their days in a bustle of the marvellous. I will furnish a specimen of philosophical correspondence in a letter to old John Aubrey, 
the writer betrays the versatility of his curiosity by very opposite discoveries my hands are so full of work that i have no time to transcribe for dr henry moore an account of the barn stable apparition lord keeper north would take it kindly from you give a sight of this letter from barnstable to dr witchcott he had lately heard of a scotchman who had been carried by fairies into france but the purpose of his present letter is to communicate other sort of apparitions than the ghost of barnstable he had gone to glastonbury to pick up a few berries from the holy thorn which flowered every christmas day Footnote. 205. Thousands flocked to see this miracle in the Middle Ages, and their presence brought great wealth to the Abbey. It was believed to have grown miraculously from the staff used by St. Joseph. It appears to have been brought from Palestine, and merely to have flowered in accordance with its natural season, though differing with ours. End of footnote. The original thorn had been cut down by a military saint in the civil wars, but the trade of the place was not damaged, for they had contrived not to have a single holy thorn, but several, by grafting and inoculation. Footnote 206. Taylor, the water poet, in his Wonders of the West, 1649, says that a slip was preserved by a vintner dwelling at Glastonbury when the soldiers cut down the tree, that he set it in his garden. And he, with others, did tell me that the same doth likewise bloom on the twenty-fifth day of December, yearly. End of footnote. He promised to send these berries, but requests Aubrey to inform that person of quality who had rather have a bush, that it was impossible to get one for him, I am told. He adds, that there is a person about glastonbury who hath a nursery of them which he sells for a crown apiece but they are supposed not to be of the right kind the main object of this letter is the writer's suspicion of gold in this country for which he offers three reasons tacitus says there was gold in england and that agrippa came to a spot where he had a prospect of ireland from which place he writes Secondly, that an honest man had in this spot found stones from which he had extracted good gold, and that he himself had seen in the broken stones a clear appearance of gold. And thirdly, there is a story which goes by tradition in that part of the country, that in the hill alluded to there was a door into a hole, that when any wanted money they used to go and knock there, that a woman used to appear, and give to such as came footnote two o seven many of these tales of treasures in hills are now reduced to the simple facts of discoveries being made of coins and personal ornaments in tumuli of roman and saxon settlers in england in the british museum is a gold breastplate found in a grave at mould in flintshire the grave hills of bohemia have furnished the museum at vienna with a large number of gold objects of great size and value in russia the dead have been found placed between large plates of pure gold in the centre of such tumuli and in ireland very large and valuable gold personal ornaments have been frequently found in grave hills End of footnote at a time when by greediness or otherwise gave her offence she flung to the door and delivered this old saying still remembered in the country when all the daws be gone and dead then hill shall shine gold red my fancy is that this relates to an ancient family of this name of which there is now but one man left and he not likely to have any issue these are his three reasons and some minds have perhaps been opened with no better ones. But let us not imagine that this great naturalist was credulous, for he tells Aubrey that he thought it was but a monkish tale forged in the abbey so famous in former time. But as I have learned not to despise our forefathers, I question whether this may not refer to some rich mine in the hill, formerly in use, but now lost. 
i shall shortly request you to discourse with my lord about it to have advice and see in the meantime it will be best to keep all private for his majesty's service his lordship's and perhaps some private person's benefit but he has also positive evidence a mason not long ago coming to the renter of the abbey for a freestone and sawing it out came divers pieces of gold of three pounds ten value apiece of ancient coins the stone belonged to some chimney work the gold was hidden in it perhaps when the dissolution was near this last incident of finding coins in a chimney piece which he had accounted for very rationally serves only to confirm his dream that they were coined out of the gold of the mine in the hill and he becomes more urgent for a private search into these mines which i have i think a way to in the postscript he adds an account of a well which by washing wrought a cure on a person deep in the king's evil i hope you don't forget your promise to communicate whatever thing you have relating to your idea this promised idea of aubrey may be found in his m s s under the title of the idea of universal education however whimsical one would like to see it aubrey's life might furnish a volume of these philosophical dreams he was a person who from his incessant bustle and insatiable curiosity was called the carrier of conceptions of the royal society many pleasant nights were privately enjoyed by aubrey and his correspondent about the mine in the hill ashmole's manuscripts at oxford contain a collection of many secrets of the rosicrucians one of the completest inventions is a recipe how to walk invisible such were the fancies which rocked the children of science in their cradles and so feeble were the steps of our curious infancy but i start in my dreams dreading the reader may also have fallen asleep measure is most excellent says one of the oracles to which also we being in like manner persuaded o most friendly and pious asclepiades here finish the dreams at the dawn of philosophy end of section thirty five Section thirty six of Curiosities of Literature, Volume three. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. On Puck the Commentator. Literary forgeries recently have been frequently indulged in, and it is urged that they are of an innocent nature but impostures more easily practised than detected leave their mischief behind to take effect at a distant period. And here we have a footnote. A remarkable instance is afforded in the present work. See the notes of the article on newspapers in volume one, detailing one which has spread falsity to an enormous extent throughout our general literature. And we go on. We have ourselves witnessed versions of Spanish and Portuguese poets, which are passed on their unsuspicious readers without difficulty, but in which no parts of the pretended originals can be traced, and to the present hour, whatever antiquaries may affirm, the poems of Chatterton and Assyan are veiled in mystery. And here we have two more footnotes. The first, the pretended antique manuscripts preserved among the Chatterton papers in the British Museum, as well as the facsimile of the Yellow Roll, published in the Cambridge edition of Chatterton's works, are, however, so totally unlike the writing of the era to which they purport to belong, that no doubt need be entertained as to their falsity. And the second. They are, however, so far determined by the fragments of Gaelic originals, since published by Scottish antiquaries, that the amplifications of Macpherson can be detected. And we go on. If we possessed the secret history of the literary life of George Stevens, it would display an unparalleled series of arch deception and malicious ingenuity. He has been happily characterised by Gifford as the puck of commentators. Stevens is a creature so spotted over with literary forgeries and adulterations that any remarkable one around the time he flourished may be attributed to him. There were the habits of a depraved mind, and there was a darkness in his character many shades deeper than belonged to Puck. Even in the playfulness of his invention there was usually a turn of personal malignity, 
and the real object was not so much to raise a laugh as to grin horribly a ghastly smile on the individual. It is more than rumoured that he carried his ingenious malignity into the privacies of domestic life, and it is to be regretted that Mr. Nichols, who might have furnished much secret history of this extraordinary literary forger, has from delicacy mutilated his collective vigour. George Stevens usually commenced his operations by opening some pretended discovery in the evening papers, which were then of a more literary cast than they are at present. The St. James's Chronicle, the General Evening Post, or the Whitehall, were they not dead in body and in spirit, would now bear witness to his successful efforts. The late Mr. Boswell told me that Stevens frequently wrote notes on Shakespeare purposely to mislead or entrap Malone, and obtained for himself an easy triumph in the next edition. Stevens loved to assist the credulous in getting up for them some strange new thing, dancing them about with a will-o'-the-wisp, now alarming them by a shriek of laughter, and now like a grinning pig-wigging, sinking them chin-deep into a quagmire. Once he presented them with a fictitious portrait of Shakespeare, and when the Brotherhood were sufficiently divided in their opinions, he pounced upon them with a demonstration that every portrait of Shakespeare partook of the same doubtful authority. Stevens usually assumed a nom de guerre of Collins, a pseudo-commentator, and sometimes of Amner, who was discovered to be an obscure Puritanic minister who never read text or notes of a playwright, whenever he explored into a thousand notable secrets with which he has polluted the pages of Shakespeare. The marvellous narrative of the Upas tree of Java, which Darwin adopted in his plan of enlisting imagination under the banner of science, appears to have been another forgery which amused our puck. It was first given in the London magazine as an extract from a Dutch traveller, but the extract was never discovered in the original author and the effluvia of this noxious tree, which through a district of twelve or fourteen miles had killed all vegetation, and had spread the skeletons of men and animals, affording a scene of melancholy beyond what poets have described or painted delineated, is perfectly chimerical. A splendid flim-flam. When Dr. Birkenhout was busied in writing, without much knowledge or skill, a history of our English authors, Stevens allowed the good man to insert a choice letter by George Peel, giving an account of a merry meeting at the Globe, wherein Shakespeare said Ben Jonson and Nedaline are admirably made to perform their respective parts. As the nature of the biographical literary required authorities, Stevens ingeniously added, whence I copied this letter I do not recollect. However, we well know it came from the theatrical mirror, where he had first deposited the precious original, to which he had unguardedly ventured to affix the date of 1600. Unluckily, Peel was discovered to have died two years before he wrote his own letter. The date is adroitly dropped in Birkenhout. Stevens did not wish to refer to his original, which I have often seen quoted as authority. One of these numerous forgeries of our puck appears in an article in Isaac Reed's catalogue, Article 8708. The Book of Soldan, containing strange matters touching his life and death and the ways of his course, in two parts, with this marginal note by Reed. The foregoing was written by George Stevens, from whom I received it. It was composed merely to impose on a literary friend, and had its effect. For he was so far deceived as to its authenticity that he gave implicit credit to it, and put down the person's name in whose possession the original books were supposed to be. One of the sort of inventions which I attribute to Stevens has been got up with a deal of romantic effect to embellish the poetical life of Milton, and unquestionably must have sadly perplexed his last matter-of-fact editor, who is not a man to comprehend a flim-flam, for he has sanctioned the whole fiction by preserving it in his biographical narrative. The first impulse of Milton to travel in Italy is ascribed to the circumstance of his having been found asleep at the foot of a tree in the vicinity of Cambridge, when two foreign ladies, attracted by the loveliness of the youthful poet, alighted from their carriage and having admired him for some time as they imagined unperceived, the youngest, who was very beautiful, drew a pencil from her pocket and having written some lines, put the paper, with a trembling hand, into his own. But it seems, for something was to account for how the youth could have been aware of these minute particulars, unless he had been dreaming them, that the ladies had been observed at a distance by some friends of Milton, and they explained to him the whole silent adventure. Milton, on opening the paper, read four verses from Guarini, addressed to those human stars, his own eyes. On this romantic adventure, Milton set off for Italy, to discover the fair incognita to which undiscovered lady, we are told, we stand indebted for the most impassioned touches in the paradise lost. We know how Milton passed his time in Italy, with Dati and Gardi and Frescobaldi and other literary friends amidst its academies, and often busied in book collecting. Had Milton's tour in Italy been an adventure of knight errantry, to discover a lady whom he had never seen, at least he had not the merit of going out of the direct road to Florence and Rome. 
nor of having once alluded to this Don de Sanspensis in his letters or inquiries among his friends, who would have thought themselves fortunate to have introduced so poetical an adventure in the numerous canzonies they showered on our youthful poet. This historiette, scarcely fitted for a novel, first appeared where generally Stephen's literary musings were carried on, the General Evening Post or the St. James's Chronicle. And Mr. Todd, in the improved edition of Milton's life, obtained this spurious original, where the reader may find it. But the more curious part of the story remains to be told. Mr. Todd proceeds. The proceedingly highly coloured relation, however, is not singular. My friend Mr. Walker points out to me a counterpart in the extract from the preface to Poissy de Marguerite Eleanor Clotilde depuis Madame de Seville, poet François de Quinze siècle, Paris, 1803. And true enough, we find among the family traditions of the same Clotilde that Justine de Lévy, great-grandmother of this unknown poetess of the 15th century, walking in a forest, witnessed the same beautiful spectacle which the Italian unknown had at Cambridge. Never was such an impression to be effaced, and she could not avoid leaving her tablets by the side of the beautiful sleeper, declaring her passion in her tablets by four Italian verses. The very number our Milton had meted out to him. Oh, these four verses, they are as fatal in their number as the date of Peel's letter proved to George Stevens. Something still escapes in the most ingenious fabrication which serves to decompose the materials. It is well that our voracious historian dropped all mention of Guarini, else that would have given that coup de grâce a fatal anachronism. However, his invention supplied him with more originality than the adoption of this story and the four verses would lead us to infer. He tells us how Petrarch was jealous of the genius of his Clotilde's grandmother, and has even pointed out a sonnet which, among the traditions of the family, was addressed to her. He narrates that the gentleman, when he fairly awoke and had read the four verses, set off for Italy, which he ran over until he found Justine, and Justine found him, at a tournament at Medina. This parallel adventure disconcerted our two grave English critics. They find a tale which they wisely judge improbable, and because they discover the tale copied, they conclude that it is not singular. This knot of perplexity is, however, easily cut through if we substitute, which we are fully justified in, for poet de quinze siècle de dix-neuf siècle. The Poissies of Clotilde are as genuine a fabrication as Chatterton's, subject to the same objections, having many ideas and expressions which were unknown in the language at the time they are pretended to have been composed and exhibiting many imitations of Voltaire and other poets. The present story of the four Italian verses in The Beautiful Sleeper would be quite sufficient evidence of the authenticity of the family traditions of Clotilde depuis Madame de Seville, and also of Monsieur de Seville himself, a pretended editor who was said to have found by mere accident the precious manuscript. And while he was copying from the press in 1793, these pretty poems, for such they are, of his grand tante was shot in the Reign of Terror, and so completely expired that no one could ever trace his existence. The real editor, who we must presume to be the poet, published them in 1803. Such, then, is the history of a literary forgery. A puck composes a short romantic adventure, which is quietly thrown out to the world in a newspaper or a magazine. Some collector, such as the late Mr. Bindley, who procured for Mr. Todd his original, as idle at least as he is curious, houses the forlorn fiction, and it enters into literary history. A French Chatterton picks up the obscure tale, and behold, astonishes the literary inquirers of the very country, hence the imposture sprung. But the four Italian verses in The Sleeping Youth, oh, Monsieur Vanderberg, for that gentleman is the ostensible editor of Clotilde's Poissies of the 15th century. Some ingenious persons are unlucky in this world. Perhaps one day we may yet discover that this romantic adventure of Milton and Justine de Lévy is not so original as it seems. It may lie hid in the Ustry of Durf, or some of the long romances of the Scuderies, whence the English and the French Chattertons may have drawn it. To such literary inventions we say with Swift, Such are your tricks, that since you hatch, pray your own chicks. Will it be credited that for the enjoyment of a temporary piece of malice, Stevens would even risk his own reputation as a poetical critic? Yet this he ventured by throwing out of his edition the poems of Shakespeare with a remarkable hypercriticism that the strongest act of Parliament that could be framed would fail to compel readers into their service. Not only he denounced the sonnets of Shakespeare, but the sonnet itself with an absurd question. What has truth or nature to do with sonnets? The secret history of this unwarrantable mutilation of a great author by his editor was, as I was informed by the late Mr. Boswell, merely done to spite his rival commentator Malone, 
who had taken extraordinary pains in their elucidation. Stevens himself had formally reprinted them, but when Malone from these sonnets claimed for himself one ivy leaf of a commentator's pride, behold, Stevens in a rage would annihilate even Shakespeare himself, that he might gain a triumph over Malone. In the same spirit, but with more caustic pleasantry, he opened a controversy with Malone respecting Shakespeare's wife. It seems that the poet had forgotten to mention his wife in his copious will, and his recollection of Mrs. Shakespeare seems to mark the slightness of his regard, for he only introduced by an interlineation a legacy to her out of his second best bed with the furniture, and nothing more. Malone naturally inferred that the poet had forgot her, and so recollected her as more strongly to mark how little he esteemed her. He had already, as is vulgarly expressed, cut her off not indeed with a shilling, but with an old bed. And here we have a footnote. Mr. Charles Knight, in his edition of Shakespeare, first clearly pointed out the true nature of the bequest. The great poet's estates, with the exception of a copyhold tenement expressly mentioned in his will, were freehold. His wife was entitled to dower, or a life interest of one-third of the proceeds arising from the lands or tenements the property of Shakespeare, and which were of considerable value. She was thus amply provided for by the clear and undeniable operation of the law of England. Mr. Halliwell has further proved that such bequests were the constant modes of showing regard to such relatives as were well provided for by the usual legal course of events. And he adds, So far from this bequest being one of slight importance and exhibiting small esteem, it was the usual mode of expressing a mark of great affection. Let me go on. All this seems judicious, till Stevens asserts the conjugal affection of the bard tells us that the poet, having, when in health, provided for her by settlement, or knowing that her father had already done so, circumstances entirely conjectural, he bequeathed to her at his death not merely an old piece of furniture, but perhaps, as a mark of peculiar tenderness, the very bed that on his bridal night received him to the arms of Belvedere. Stephen's severity of satire marked the deep malevolence of his heart, and Murphy has strongly portrayed him in his address to the malevoly. Such another puck was Horace Walpole. The King of Prussia's letter to Rousseau, and the memorial, pretended to have been signed by noblemen and gentlemen, were fabrications, as he confesses, only to make mischief. It well became him, whose happier invention, the castle of Otranto, was brought forward in the guise of forgery, so unfeelingly to have reprobated the innocent inventions of a Chatterton. We have Pucks busied among our contemporaries. Whoever shall discover their history will find it copious, though intricate. The malignity at least will exceed tenfold the merriment. End of section 36thirty seven of Curiosities of Literature, Volume three. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Curiosities of Literature, Volume three by Isaac Disraeli. Literary Forgeries. The preceding article has reminded me of a subject by no means incurious to the lovers of literature. A large volume might be composed on literary impostors. Their modes of deception, however, were frequently repetitions, particularly those at the restoration of letters, when there prevailed a mania for burying spurious antiquities that they might afterwards be brought to light to confound their contemporaries they even perplex us at the present day more sinister forgeries have been performed by scotchmen of whom archibald bower lauder and macpherson are well known even harmless impostures by some unexpected accident have driven an unwary inquirer out of the course george stevens must again make his appearance for a memorable trick played on the antiquary golf this was the famous tombstone on which was engraved the drinking horn of hardy canute to indicate his last fatal carouse for this royal dane died drunk to prevent any doubt the name in saxon characters was sufficiently legible steeped in pickle to hasten a precocious antiquity it was then consigned to the corner of a broker's shop where the antiquarian eye of golf often poured on the venerable odds and ends it perfectly succeeded on the director of the antiquarian society he purchased the relic for a trifle and dissertations of a due size were preparing for the archaeologia 
footnote i have since been informed that this famous invention was originally a flim-flam of a mr thomas white a noted collector and dealer in antiquities but it was stevens who placed it in the broker's shop where he was certain of catching the antiquary when the late mr pegg a profound brother was preparing to write a dissertation on it the first inventor of the flam stepped forward to save any further tragical termination the wicked wit had already succeeded too well in the footnote goff never forgave himself nor stevens for this flagrant act of ineptitude on every occasion in the gentleman's magazine when compelled to notice this illustrious imposition he always struck out his own name and muffled himself up under his titular office of the director goff never knew that this modern antique was only a piece of retaliation in reviewing master's life of baker he found two heads one scratched down from painted glass by george stevens who would have passed it off for a portrait of one of our kings goff on the watch to have a fling at george stevens attacked his graphic performance and reprobated a portrait which had nothing human in it stevens vowed that wretched as goff deemed his pencil to be it should make the director ashamed of his own eyes and be fairly taken in by something scratched much worse such was the origin of his adoption of this fragment of a chimney slab which i have seen and with a better judge wondered at the injudicious antiquary who could have been duped by the slight and ill-formed scratches and even with a false spelling of the name which however succeeded in being passed off as a genuine saxon inscription but he had counted on his man Footnote. the stone may be found in the british museum h a r d c n v t is the reading on the hartha knut stone but the true orthography of the name is h a r d a c n v t it was reported to have been discovered in kennington lane where the palace of the monarch was said to have been located and the inscription carefully made in anglo-saxon characters was to the effect that here hard knut drank a wine horn dry stared about him and died sylvanus urban my once excellent and old friend seems a trifle uncourteous on this grave occasion he tells us however that the history of this wanton trick with a facsimile of schneibeli's drawing may be seen in the volume forty page two hundred and seventeen he says that this wicked contrivance of george stevens was to entrap this famous draughtsman does sylvanus then deny that the director was not also entrapped and that he always struck out his own name in the proof sheets of the magazine substituting his official designation by which the whole society itself seemed to screen the director End of footnote the trick is not so original as it seems one de grasses had engraved on marble the epitaph of a mule which he buried in his vineyard some time after having ordered a new plantation on the spot the diggers could not fail of disinterring what lay ready for them the inscription imported that one publius grasses had raised this monument to his mule de grasses gave it out as an odd coincidence of names and a prophecy about his own mule it was a simple joke the marble was thrown by and no more thought of several years after it rose into celebrity for with the erudite it then passed for an ancient inscription and the antiquary parachi inserted the epitaph in his work on burials thus de grasses and his mule equally respectable would have come down to posterity had not the story by some means got wind an incident of this nature is recorded in portuguese history contrived with the intention to keep up the national spirit and diffuse hopes of the new enterprise of vasco da gama who had just sailed on a voyage of discovery to the indies three stones were discovered near sintra bearing in ancient characters a latin inscription a sibylline oracle addressed prophetically to the inhabitants of the west stating that when these three stones shall be found the ganges the indus and the tagus should exchange their commodities this was the pious fraud of a portuguese poet sanctioned by the approbation of the king 
when the stones had lain a sufficient time in the damp earth so as to become apparently antique our poet invited a numerous party to a dinner at his country house in the midst of the entertainment a peasant rushed in announcing the sudden discovery of this treasure the inscription was placed among the royal collections as a sacred curiosity the prophecy was accomplished and the oracle was long considered genuine in such cases no mischief resulted the annals of mankind were not confused by spurious dynasties and fabulous chronologies but when literary forgeries are published by those whose character hardly admits of a suspicion that they are themselves the impostors the difficulty of assigning a motive only increases that of forming a decision to adopt or reject them may be equally dangerous in this class we must place annius of viterbo footnote he was a dominican monk his real name being giovanni nani which he latinized in conformity with the custom of his era he was born in fourteen thirty two and died fifteen hundred and two his great work antiquitatum rariorum professes to contain the works of manetho barosis and other authors of equal antiquity End of footnote who published a pretended collection of historians of the remotest antiquity some of whose names had descended to us in the works of ancient writers while their works themselves had been lost afterwards he subjoined commentaries to confirm their authority by passages from known authors these at first were eagerly accepted by the learned the blunders of the presumed editor one of which was his mistaking the right name of the historian he forged were gradually detected till at length the imposture was apparent the pretended originals were more remarkable for their number than their volume for the whole collection does not exceed one hundred and seventy-one pages which lessened the difficulty of the forgery while the commentaries which were afterwards published must have been manufactured at the same time as the text in favour of annius the high rank he occupied at the roman court his irreproachable conduct and his declaration that he had recovered some of these fragments at mantua and that others had come from armenia induced many to credit these pseudo-historians a literary war soon kindled niceron has discriminated between four parties engaged in this conflict one party decried the whole of the collection as gross forgeries another obstinately supported their authenticity a third decided that they were forgeries before annius possessed them who was only credulous while a fourth party considered them as partly authentic and described their blunders to the interpolations of the editor to increase their importance such as they were they scattered confusion over the whole face of history the false barosus opens his history before the deluge when according to him the chaldeans through preceding ages had faithfully preserved their historical evidences annius hints in his commentary at the archives and public libraries of the babylonians the days of noah comparatively seemed modern history with this dreaming editor some of the fanciful writers of italy were duped sansovino to delight the florentine nobility accommodated them with a new title of antiquity in their ancestor noor imperatore e monarca delle genti visa e mori in quella parte the spaniards complained that in forging these fabulous origins of different nations a new series of kings from the ark of noah had been introduced by some of their rhodomontade historians to pollute the sources of their history bowden's otherwise valuable works are considerably injured by annius's supposititious discoveries one historian died of grief for having raised his elaborate speculations on these fabulous originals and their credit was at length so much reduced that pignori and maffi both announced to their readers that they had not referred in their works to the pretended writers of annius yet to the present hour these presumed forgeries are not always given up the problem remains unsolved and the silence of the respectable annius in regard to the forgery as well as what he affirmed when alive leave us in doubt whether he really intended to laugh at the world by these fairy tales of the giants of antiquity 
sancho niathon as preserved by eusebius may be classed among these ancient writings or forgeries and has been equally rejected and defended another literary forgery supposed to have been grafted on those of annius involved the ingirami family it was by digging in their grounds that they discovered a number of etruscan antiquities consisting of inscriptions and also fragments of a chronicle pretended to have been composed sixty years before the vulgar era the characters on the marbles were the ancient etruscan and the historical work tended to confirm the pretended discoveries of annius they were collected and enshrined in a magnificent folio by courteous ingirami who a few years after published a quarto volume exceeding one thousand pages to support their authenticity notwithstanding the erudition of the forger these monuments of antiquity betrayed their modern condiment footnote a forgery of a similar character has been recently effected in the debris of the chapelle saint eloi département de lure france where many inscriptions connected with the early history of france were exhumed which a deputation of antiquaries convened to examine their authenticity have since pronounced to be forgeries End of footnote. there were unsealed letters which no one knew but these were said to be undiscovered ancient etruscan characters it was more difficult to defend the small italic letters for they were not used in the age assigned to them besides that there were dots on the letter i a custom not practised till the eleventh century the style was copied from the latin of the psalms and the breviary but ingarami discovered that there had been an intercourse between the etruscans and the hebrews and that david had imitated the writings of noah and his descendants of noah the chronicle details speeches and anecdotes the romans who have preserved so much of the etruscans had not however noticed a single fact recorded in these etruscan antiquities ingarami replied that the manuscript was the work of the secretary of the college of the etrurian augurs who alone was permitted to draw his materials from the archives and who it would seem was the only scribe who has favoured posterity with so much secret history it was urged in favour of the authenticity of these etruscan monuments that ingarami was so young an antiquary at the time of the discovery that he could not even explain them and that when fresh researches were made on the spot other similar monuments were also disinterred where evidently they had long lain the whole affair however contrived was confined to the ingarami family one of them half a century before had been the librarian of the vatican and to him is ascribed the honour of the forgeries which he buried where he was sure they would be found this however is a mere conjecture ingarami who published and defended their authenticity was not concerned in their fabrication the design was probably merely to raise the antiquity of volaterra the family estate of the ingarami and for this purpose one of its learned branches had bequeathed his posterity a collection of spurious historical monuments which tended to overturn all received ideas on the first ages of history footnote the volume of these pretended antiquities is entitled etruscarum antiquitatum fragmento fo franc sixteen thirty seven that which ingarami published to defend their authenticity is in italian discorso sopri l'opozioni fate antichita toscane quarto firenze sixteen forty five end of footnote it was probably such impostures and those of false decretals of isidore which were forged for the maintenance of the papal supremacy and for eight hundred years formed the fundamental basis of the canon law the discipline of the church and even the faith of christianity which led to the monstrous pyrrhonism of father hardouin who with immense erudition had persuaded himself that excepting the bible and homer herodotus plautus pliny the elder with fragments of cicero virgil and horace all the remains of classical literature were forgeries of the thirteenth and fourteenth centuries in two dissertations he imagined that he approved that the aeneid was not written by virgil nor the odes of 
chorus by that poet hardouin was one of those wrong-headed men who once having fallen into a delusion whatever afterwards occurs to them on their favourite subject only tends to strengthen it he died in his own faith he seems not to have been aware that by ascribing such prodigal inventions as plutarch thucydides livy tacitus and other historians to the men he did he was raising up an unparalleled age of learning and genius when monks could only write meagre chronicles while learning and genius themselves lay in an enchanted slumber with a suspension of all their vital powers there are numerous instances of the forgeries of smaller documents the prayer-book of columbus presented to him by the pope which the great discoverer of a new world bequeathed to the genoese republic has a codicil in his own writing as one of the leaves testifies but as volumes composed against its authenticity deny the famous description in petrarch's virgil so often quoted of his first rencontre with laura in the church of st clair on a good friday sixth april thirteen twenty seven and has been recently attempted to be shown is a forgery by calculation it appears that the sixth april thirteen twenty seven fell on a monday the good friday seems to have been a blunder of the manufacturer of the note he was entrapped by reading the second sonnet as it appears in the printed editions era il giorno chalso si scolorana per la pieta del suo tefartore il re it was on the day when the rays of the sun were obscured by compassion for his maker the forger imagined this description alluded to good friday and the eclipse at the crucifixion but how stands the passage in the manuscript in the imperial library of vienna which abbe costang has found era il giorno chal so di colorero parve la pieta da suo fattore e rai quand io fu presso e non mi guardai che ben vosti occhi dentro mi legaro it was on the day that i was captivated devotion for its maker appeared in the rays of a brilliant sun and i did not well consider that it was your eyes that enchained me the first meeting according to the abbe costang was not in a church but in a meadow as appears by the ninety-first sonnet the lore of sade was not the lore of petrarch but lore de beau unmarried and who died young residing in the vicinity of vaucluse petrarch had often viewed her from his own window and often enjoyed her society amidst her family Footnote i draw this information from a little new year's gift which my learned friend the rev s weston presented to his friends in eighteen twenty two entitled a visit to vaucluse accompanied by a supplement he derives his account apparently from a curious publication of l'abbe costang de poussigny d'avignon which i with other inquirers have not been able to procure but which it is absolutely necessary to examine before we can decide on the very curious but unsatisfactory accounts we have hitherto possessed of the laura of petrarch End of footnote if the abbe costang's discovery be confirmed the good name of petrarch is freed from the idle romantic passion for a married woman it would be curious if the famous story of the first meeting with laura in the church of st clair originated in the blunder of the forger's misconception of a passage which was incorrectly printed as appears by existing manuscripts literary forgeries have been introduced into bibliography dates have been altered fictitious titles fixed and books have been reprinted either to leave out or to interpolate whole passages i forbear entering minutely into this part of the history of literary forgery for this article has already grown voluminous when we discover however that one of the most magnificent of amateurs and one of the most critical of bibliographers were concerned in a forgery of this nature it may be useful to spread an alarm among collectors the duc de la valliere and the abbe de saint leger once concerted together to supply the eager purchaser of literary rarities with a copy of de tribus impostoribus a book by the date pretended to have been printed in fifteen ninety eight though probably a modern forgery of sixteen ninety eight 
the title of such a work had long existed by rumour but never was a copy seen by a man works printed with this title have all been proved to be modern fabrications a copy however of the introuvable original was sold at the duc de la villiere's sale the history of this volume is curious the duke and the abbe having manufactured a text had it printed in the old gothic character under the title de tribus impostoribus they proposed to put the great bibliopolist de bure in good humour whose agency would sanction the imposture they were afterwards to dole out copies at twenty-five louis each which would have been a reasonable price for a book which no one ever saw they invited de bure to dinner flattered and cajoled him and as they imagined at a moment they had wound him up to their pitch they exhibited their manufacture the keen-eyed glance of the renowned cataloguer of the bibliographie instructive instantly shot like lightning over it and like lightning destroyed the whole edition he not only discovered the forgery but reprobated it he refused his sanction and the forging duke and abbe in confusion suppressed the livre introuvable but they owed a grudge to the honest bibliographer and attempted to write down the work whence the de bures derived their fame among the extraordinary literary impostors of our age if we except louder who detected by the ethereal pen of bishop douglas lived to make his public recantation of his audacious forgeries and chatterton who has buried his inexplicable story in his own grave a tale which seems but half told we must place a man well known in the literary world under the assumed name of george salmanazar he composed his autobiography as the penance of contrition not to be published till he was no more when all human motives have ceased which might cause his veracity to be suspected the life is tedious but i have curiously traced the progress of the mind in an ingenious imposture which is worth preservation the present literary forgery consisted of personating a converted islander of formosa a place then little known but by the reports of the jesuits and constructing a language and a history of a new people and a new religion entirely of his own invention this man was evidently a native of the south of france educated in some provincial college of the jesuits where he had heard much of their discoveries of japan he had looked over their maps and listened to their comments he forgot the manner in which the japanese wrote but supposed like orientalists they wrote from the right to the left which he found difficult to manage he set about excogitating an alphabet but actually forgot to give names to his letters which afterwards baffled him before literary men he fell into gross blunders having inadvertently affirmed that the formosans sacrificed eighteen thousand male infants annually he persisted in not lessening the number it was proved to be an impossibility in so small an island without occasioning a depopulation he had made it a principle in this imposture never to vary when he had once said a thing all this was projected in haste fearful of detection by those about him he was himself surprised at this facility of invention and the progress of his forgery he had formed an alphabet a considerable portion of a new language a grammar a new division of the year into twenty months and a new religion he had accustomed himself to write his language but being an inexpert writer with the unusual way of writing backwards he found this so difficult that he was compelled to change the complicated forms of some of his letters he now finally quitted his home assuming the character of a formosan convert who had been educated by the jesuits he was then in his fifteenth or sixteenth year to support his new character he practised some religious mummeries he was seen worshipping the rising and setting sun he made a prayer-book with rude drawings of the sun moon and stars to which he added some gibberish prose and verse written in his invented character muttering or chanting it as the humour took him his custom of eating raw flesh seemed to assist his deception more than the sun and the moon in a garrison at sluys 
he found a scotch regiment in the dutch pay the commander had the curiosity to invite our formosan to confer with innes the chaplain to his regiment this innes was probably the chief cause of the imposture being carried to the extent it afterwards reached innes was a clergyman but a disgrace to his cloth as soon as he fixed his eye on our formosan he hit on a project it was nothing less than to make salmanazar the ladder of his own ambition and the stepping-place for him to climb up to a good living innes was a worthless character as afterwards appeared when by an audacious imposition innes practised on the bishop of london he avowed himself to be the author of an anonymous work entitled a modest inquiry after moral virtue for this he obtained a good living in essex the real author a poor scotch clergyman obliged him afterwards to disclaim the work in print and to pay him the profit of the edition which innes had made he lost his character and retired to the solitude of his living if not penitent at least mortified such a character was exactly adapted to become the foster father of imposture innes courted the formosan and easily won on the adventurer who had hitherto in vain sought for a patron meanwhile no time was lost by innes to inform the unsuspicious and generous bishop of london of the prize he possessed to convert the formosan was his ostensible pretext to procure preferment his concealed motive it is curious enough to observe that the ardour of conversion died away in innes and the most marked neglect of his convert prevailed while the answer of the bishop was protracted or doubtful he had at first proposed to our formosan impostor to procure his discharge and convey him to england this was eagerly consented to by our pliant adventurer a few dutch shellings and fair words kept him in good humour but no letter coming from the bishop there were fewer words and not a stiver this threw a new light over the character of innes to the inexperienced youth salmanazar sagaciously now turned all his attention to some dutch ministers innes grew jealous lest they should pluck the bird which he had already in his net he resolved to baptize the impostor which only the more convinced salmanazar that innes was one himself for before this time innes had practised a stratagem on him which had clearly shown what sort of a man his formosan was this stratagem was this he made him translate a passage in cicero of some length into his pretended language and give it him in writing this was easily done by salmanazar's facility of inventing characters after innes had made him construe it he desired to have another version of it on another paper the proposal and the arch manner of making it threw our impostor into the most visible confusion he had had but a short time to invent the first paper less to recollect it so that in the second transcript not above half the words were to be found which existed in the first innes assumed a solemn air and salmanazar was on the point of throwing himself on his mercy but innes did not wish to unmask the impostor he was rather desirous of fitting the mask closer to his face salmanazar in this hard trial had given evidence of uncommon facility combined with a singular memory innes cleared his brow smiled with a friendly look and only hinted in a distant manner that he ought to be careful to be better provided for the future an advice which salmanazar afterwards bore in mind and at length produced the forgery of an entire new language and which he remarkably observes by what i have tried since i came into england i cannot say but i could have compassed it with less difficulty than can be conceived had i applied closely to it when a version of the catechism was made into the pretended formosan language which was submitted to the judgment of the first scholars it appeared to them grammatical and was pronounced to be a real language from the circumstance that it resembled no other and they could not conceive that a stripling could be the inventor of a language if the reader is curious to examine this extraordinary imposture i refer him to that literary curiosity and historical and geographical description of formosa with accounts of the religion customs and manners of the inhabitants by george salmanazar a native of the said isle seventeen hundred and four 
with numerous plates wretched inventions of their dress religious ceremonies their tabernacle and altars to the sun the moon and the ten stars their architecture the viceroy's castle a temple a city house a countryman's house and the formosan alphabet in his conferences before the royal society with a jesuit just returned from china the jesuit had certain strong suspicions that our hero was an impostor the good father remained obstinate in his own conviction but could not satisfactorily communicate it to others and salmanazar after politely asking pardon for the expression complains of the jesuit that he lied most impudently mentitur impudentissime dr mead absurdly insisted salmanazar was a dutchman or a german some thought him a jesuit in disguise a tool of the nonjurors the catholics thought him bribed by the protestants to expose their church the presbyterians that he was paid to explode their doctrine and cry up episcopacy this fabulous history of formosa seems to have been projected by his artful prompter innes who put varenius into salmanazar's hands to assist him trumpeted forth in the domestic and foreign papers an account of this converted formosan maddened the booksellers to hurry the author who was scarcely allowed two months to produce this extraordinary volume and as the former accounts which the public possessed of this island were full of monstrous absurdities and contradictions these assisted the present imposture our forger resolved not to describe new and surprising things as they had done but rather studied to clash with them probably that he might have an opportunity of pretending to correct them the first edition was immediately sold the world was more divided than ever in opinion in a second edition he prefixed a vindication the unhappy forger got about twenty guineas for an imposture whose delusion spread far and wide some years afterwards salmanazar was engaged in a minor imposture one man had persuaded him to father a white composition called the formosan japan which was to be sold at a high price it was curious for its whiteness but it had its faults the project failed and salmanazar considered the miscarriage of the white formosan japan as a providential warning to repent of all his impostures of formosa among these literary forgeries may be classed several ingenious ones fabricated for a political purpose we have certainly numerous ones during our civil wars in the reign of charles i this is not the place to continue the controversy respecting the mysterious icon basilicae which has been ranked among them from the ambiguous claim of gowden footnote the question has been discussed with great critical acumen by dr wordsworth End of footnote a recent writer who would probably incline not to leave the monarch were he living not only his head but the little fame he might obtain by the verses said to be written by him at carisbrook castle would deprive him also of these henderson's deathbed recantation is also reckoned among them and we have a large collection of letters of sir henry martin to his lady of delight which were the satirical effusions of a wit of that day but by the price they have obtained are probably considered as genuine ones and exhibit an amusing picture of his loose rambling life footnote since this was published i have discovered that harry martin's letters are not forgeries but i cannot immediately recover my authority End of footnote. there is a ludicrous speech of the strange earl of pembroke which was forged by the inimitable butler sir john birkenhead a great humorist and wit had a busy pen in these spurious letters and speeches footnote one of the most amusing of these tricks was perpetuated on william prynne the well-known puritanic hater of the stage by some witty cavalier prynne's great work historiomastics the player's scourge or actor's tragedy an immense quarto of eleven hundred pages was a complete condemnation of all theatrical amusements but in sixteen forty nine appeared a tract of four leaves entitled mr william prynne his defence of stage plays or a retract of a former book of his called historiomastics it must have astonished many readers in his own day and would have passed for his work in more modern times but for the accidental preservation of a single copy of a handbill print published disclaiming the whole thing his style is most amusingly imitated throughout and his great love for quoting authorities in his margin he is made to complain that this wicked and tyrannical army did lately in a most inhumane cruel 
cruel rough and barbarous manner take away the poor players from their houses being met there to discharge the duty of their callings as if this army were fully bent and most traitorously and maliciously set to put down and depress all the king's friends not only in the parliament but in the very theatres they have no care of covenant or anything else and he is further made to declare in spite of what the malicious clamorous and obstreperous people may object that he once wrote against stage plays that it was when i had not so clear a light as now i have we can fancy the amusement this pamphlet must have been to many readers during the great civil war End of section thirty seven Section 38 of Curiosities of Literature, Volume 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Greg Giordano. Curiosities of Literature. Volume 3 by Isaac Desraeli Of Literary Filchers An honest historian at times will have to inflict severe stroke on his favorites. This has fallen to my lot, for in the course of my researches I have to record that we have both forgers and purloiners as well as other more obvious impostors in the republic of letters the present article descends to relate anecdotes of some contrivances to possess our literary curiosities by other means than by purchase and the only apology which can be alleged for the splendida piccata as st austin calls the virtues of the heathen of the present innocent criminals is their excessive passion for literature and otherwise the respectability of their names. According to Gross's Classical Dictionary of the Vulgar Tongue, we have had celebrated collectors, both in the learned and vulgar idioms. But one of them, who had some reasons, too, to be tender on this point, distinguished this mode of completing his collections, not by book-stealing, but by book-coveting, on some occasions, in mercy, we must allow of softening names. Were not the Spartans allowed to steal from one another, and the bunglers only punished? It is said that Pinelli made occasional additions to his literary treasures, sometimes by his skill in an art which lay much more in the hand than in the head. However, as Pinelli never stirred out of his native city but once in his lifetime, when the plague drove him from home, his field of action was so restricted that we can hardly conclude that he could have been so great an enterpriser in this way. No one can have lost their character by this sort of exercise in a confined circle, and be allowed to prosper. A light-fingered mercury would hardly haunt the same spot. However, this is as it may be. It is probable that we owe to this species of accumulation many precious manuscripts in the Catonian collection. It appears by the manuscript notebook of Sir Nicholas Hyde, Chief Justice of the King's Bench, from the second to the seventh year of Charles I, that Sir Robert Cotton had in his library records, evidences, ledger books, original letters, and other state papers belonging to the King. For the Attorney General of that time, to prove this, showed a copy of the pardon which Sir Robert had obtained from King James for embezzling records, etc. Footnote. Lansdowne, Manuscript 888, in the former printed catalogue, Article 79. End of footnote. Guff has more than insinuated that Rawlinson and his friend, Umvreville, quote, lie under very strong suspicions. End quote. And he asserts that the collector of the Wilton treasures made as free as Dr. Willis with his friend's coins. Footnote. 
Coins are the most dangerous things which can be exhibited to a professed collector. One of the fraternity, who died but a few years since, absolutely kept a record of his pilferings. He succeeded in improving his collection by attending sales also, and changing his own coins for others in better preservation. End of footnote. But he has also put forth a declaration relating to Bishop Moore, the famous collector, that, quote, the bishop collected his library by plundering those of the clergy in his diocese. Some he paid with sermons or more modern books. Others, less civilly, only with a quid illiterate cum libris. End quote. This plundering then consisted rather of cajoling others out of what they knew not how to value, and this is an advantage which every skillful lover of books must enjoy over those whose apprenticeship has not expired. I have myself been plundered by a very dear friend of some such literary curiosities, in the days of my innocence, and of his precocity of knowledge. However, it does appear that Bishop Moore did actually lay violent hands in his snug corner on some irresistible little charmer, which we gather from a precaution adopted by a friend of the bishop, who one day was found busy in hiding his rarest books, and locking up as many as he could. On being asked the reason of this odd occupation, the bibliopolist ingeniously replied, quote, The Bishop of Eli dines with me today. End quote. This fact is quite clear, and here is another as indisputable. Sir Robert Seville, writing to Sir Robert Cotton, appointing an interview with the founder of the Bodleian Library, cautioned Sir Robert that, quote, If he held any book so dear, is that he would be loath to lose it. He should not let Sir Thomas out of his sight, but set the book aside beforehand. End quote. A surprise and detection of this nature has been revealed in a secret piece of history by Amelot de la Jose, which terminated in very important political consequences. He assures us that the personal dislike which Pope Innocent X bore to the French had originated in his youth, when cardinal, from having been detected in the library of an eminent French collector, of having purloined a most rare volume. The delirium of a collector's rage overcame even French politesse. The Frenchman not only openly accused his illustrious culprit, but was resolved that he should not quit the library without replacing the precious volume. From accusation and denial, both resolved to try their strength. But in this literary wrestling match, the book dropped out of the cardinal's robes, and from that day he hated the French. At least, they're more curious collectors. Even an author on his dying bed, at those awful moments, should a collector be by his side, may not be considered secure from his too curious hands. Sir William Dugdale possessed the minutes of King James's life, written by Camden, so within a fortnight of his death, as also Camden's own life, which he had from Hackett, the author of the folio life of Bishop Williams, who, adds Aubrey, quote, did filch it from Mr. Camden as he lay a-dying, end quote. He afterwards corrects his information by the name of Dr. Thorndike, which, however, equally answers our purpose to prove that even dying authors may dread such collectors. The medalists have, I suspect, have been more predatory than those subtractors of our literary treasures, not only from the facility of their conveyance, but from a peculiar contrivance, which of all things which admit of being secretly purloined can only be practiced in this department. For they can steal and no human hand can search them with any possibility of detection. They can pick a cabinet and swallow the curious things, and transport them with perfect safety, to be digested at their leisure. An adventure of this kind happened to Baron Stosh, the famous antiquary. It was in looking over the gems of the royal cabinet of metals that the keeper perceived the loss of one. 
his place, his pension, and his reputation were at stake, and he insisted that Baron Stosh should be most minutely examined. In this dilemma, forced to confession, this erudite collector assured the keeper of the royal cabinet that the strictest search would not avail. Quote, Alas, sir, I have it here within, end quote, he said, pointing to his breast. An emetic was suggested by the learned practitioner himself, probably from some former experiment. This was not the first time that such a natural cabinet had been invented. The antiquary, valiant, when attacked at sea by an Algerine, zealously swallowed a whole series of Syrian kings. When he landed at Lyon, groaning with his concealed treasure, he hastened to his friend, his physician, and his brother antiquary, Dufour, who at first was only anxious to inquire of his patient whether the medals were of the higher empire. Valent showed two or three, of which nature had kindly relieved him. A collection of medals was left to the city of Exeter, and the donor accompanied the bequest by a clause in his will, that should a certain antiquary, his old friend and rival, be desirous of examining the coins, he should be watched by two persons, one on each side. Le Croix informs us in his life that the learned Charles Patton, who has written a work on medals, was one of the present race of collectors. Patton offered the curators of the public library at Basel to draw up a catalogue of the cabinet of Amberback, there preserved, containing a good number of medals. But they would have been more numerous had the catalogue writer not diminished both them and his labour by sequestering some of the most rare, which were not discovered till this plunderer of antiquity was far out of their reach. When Gough touched on this odd subject in his first edition of his British Topography, an academic in the Gentleman's Magazine for August 1772, insinuated that this charge of literary pilfering was only a jocular one, on which Gough, in his second edition, observed that this was not the case, and that, quote, one might point out enough light-fingered antiquaries in the present age to render such a charge extremely probable against earlier ones, end quote. The most extraordinary part of this slight history is that our public denouncer some time after proved himself to be one of those, quote, light-fingered antiquaries, end quote. The deed itself, however, was more singular than disgraceful. At the disinterment of the remains of Edward I, around which thirty years ago assembled our most erudite antiquaries, Guff was observed, as Stevens used to relate, in a wrapping great coat of unusual dimensions, that witty and malicious Puck, so capable himself of inventing mischief, easily suspected others, and divided his glance as much on the living piece of antiquity as on the elder. In the act of closing up the relics of royalty, there was found wanting an entire forefinger of Edward I, and as the body was perfect when opened, a murmur of dissatisfaction was spreading, when Puck directed their attention to the great antiquary in the watchman's great coat, from whence too surely was extracted Edward I's great forefinger, so that the light-figured antiquary was recognized ten years after he denounced the race, when he came to try his hand. Footnote. It is probable that the story of Guff's pocketing the forefinger of Edward I was one of the malicious inventions of George Stevens, after he discovered that the antiquary was among the few admitted to the untombing of the royal corpse. Stevens himself was not there. Sylvanus Irving, the late respected John Nichols, who must know much more than he cares to record of Puck, has, however, given the following secret history of what he calls, quote, ungentlemanly and unwarrantable attacks, end quote, on Guff by Stevens. It seems that Stevens was a collector of the works of Hogarth, and while engaged in forming his collection, wrote an abrupt letter to Guff, to obtain from him some early impressions by purchase or exchange. Gough resented the manner of his address by a rough refusal, for it is admitted to have been a peremptory one, 
Thus arose the implacable vengeance of Stevens, who used to boast that all the mischievous tricks he played on the grave antiquary, who was rarely overkind to anyone, was but a pleasant kind of revenge. End of footnote. End of section thirty seven. Recording by Greg Giordano. Newport Ritchie, Florida. Section thirty nine of Curiosities of Literature, Volume three. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Curiosities of Literature, Volume Three by Isaac Disraeli, of Lord Bacon at Home. The history of Lord Bacon would be that of the intellectual faculties, and a theme so worthy of the philosophical biographer remains yet to be written the personal narrative of this master genius or inventor must for ever be separated from the scala intellectus he was perpetually ascending and the domestic history of this creative mind must be consigned to the most humiliating chapter in the volume of human life a chapter already sufficiently enlarged and which has irrefutably proved how the greatest minds are not freed from the infirmities of the most vulgar the parent of our philosophy is now to be considered in a new light one which others do not appear to have observed my researches into contemporary notices of bacon have often convinced me that his philosophical works in his own days and among his own countrymen were not only not comprehended but often ridiculed and sometimes reprobated that they were the occasion of many slights and mortifications which this depreciated man endured but that from a very early period in his life to that last record of his feelings which appears in his will this servant of posterity as he prophetically called himself sustained his mighty spirit with the confidence of his own posthumous greatness bacon cast his views through the maturity of ages and perhaps amidst the sceptics and the rejectors of his plans may have felt at times all that idolatry of fame which has now consecrated his philosophical works at college bacon discovered how that scrap of grecian knowledge the peripatetic philosophy and the scholastic babble could not serve the ends and purposes of knowledge that syllogisms were not things and that a new logic might teach us to invent and judge by induction he found that theories were to be built upon experiments when a young man abroad he began to make those observations on nature which afterwards led on to the foundations of the new philosophy at sixteen he philosophized at twenty-six he had framed his system into some form and after forty years of continued labors unfinished to his last hour he left behind him sufficient to found the great philosophical reformation on his entrance into active life study was not however his prime object with his fortune to make his court connections and his father's example opened a path for ambition he chose the practice of common law as his means while his inclinations were looking upwards to political affairs as his end a passion for study however had strongly marked him he had read much more than was required in his professional character and this circumstance excited the mean jealousies of the minister cecil and the attorney-general coke both were mere practical men of business whose narrow conceptions and whose stubborn habits assume that whenever a man acquires much knowledge foreign to his profession he will know less of professional knowledge than he ought these men of strong minds yet limited capacities hold in contempt all studies alien to their habits 
bacon early aspired to the situation of solicitor-general the court of elizabeth was divided into factions bacon adopted the interests of the generous essex which were inimical to the party of cecil the queen from his boyhood was delighted by conversing with her young lord keeper as she early distinguished the precocious gravity and the ingenious turn of mind of the future philosopher it was unquestionably to attract her favour that bacon presented to the queen his maxims and elements of the common law not published till after his death elizabeth suffered her minister to form her opinions on the legal character of bacon it was alleged that bacon was addicted to more general pursuits than law and the miscellaneous books which he was known to have read confirmed the accusation this was urged as a reason why the post of solicitor-general should not be conferred on a man of speculation more likely to distract than to direct her affairs elizabeth in the height of that political prudence which marked her character was swayed by the vulgar notion of cecil and believed that bacon who afterwards filled the situation both of solicitor-general and lord chancellor was a man rather of show than of depth we have recently been told by a great lawyer that bacon was a master on the accession of james i when bacon still found the same party obstructing his political advancement he appears in some momentary fit of disgust to have meditated on a retreat into a foreign country a circumstance which has happened to several of our men of genius during a fever of solitary indignation he was for some time thrown out of the sunshine of life but he found its shade more fitted for contemplation and unquestionably philosophy was benefited by his solitude at gray's inn his hand was always on his work and better thoughts will find an easy entrance into the mind of those who feed on their thoughts and live amidst their reveries in a letter on this occasion he writes my ambition now i shall only put upon my pen whereby i shall be able to maintain memory and merit of the times succeeding and many years after when he had finally quitted public life he told the king i would live to study and not study to live yet i am prepared for date obolum belisario and i that have borne a bag can bear a wallet ever were the times succeeding in his mind in that delightful latin letter to father fulgentio where with the simplicity of true grandeur he takes a view of all his works and in which he describes himself as one who served posterity in communicating his past and his future designs he adds that they require some ages for the ripening of them there while he despairs of finishing what was intended for the sixth part of his instauration how nobly he despairs of the perfecting this i have cast away all hopes but in future ages perhaps the design may bud again and he concludes by avowing that the zeal and constancy of his mind in the great design after so many years had never become cold and indifferent he remembers how forty years ago he had composed a juvenile work about those things which with confidence but with too pompous a title he had called temporis partis maximus the great birth of time besides the public dedication of his novum organum to james the first he accompanied it with a private letter he wishes the king's favour to the work which he accounts as much as a hundred years time for he adds i am persuaded the work will gain upon men's minds in ages in his last will appears his remarkable legacy of fame my name and memory i leave to foreign nations and to mine own countrymen after some time be passed over time seemed always personated in the imagination of our philosopher and with time he wrestled with a consciousness of triumph i shall now bring forward sufficient evidence to prove how little bacon was understood and how much he was even despised in his philosophical character in those prescient views by which the genius of 
verulam has often anticipated the institutions and the discoveries of succeeding times there was one important object which even his foresight does not appear to have contemplated lord bacon did not foresee that the english language would one day be capable of embalming all that philosophy can discover or poetry can invent that his country would at length possess a national literature of its own and that it would exult in classical compositions which might be appreciated with the finest models of antiquity his taste was far unequal to his invention so little did he esteem the language of his country that his favourite works are composed in latin and he was anxious to have what he had written in english preserved in that universal language which may last as long as books last it would have surprised bacon to have been told that the most learned men in europe have studied english authors to learn to think and to write our philosopher was surely somewhat mortified when in his dedication of the essays he observed that of all my other works my essays have been the most current for that as it seems they come home to men's business and bosoms it is too much to hope to find in a vast and profound inventor a writer also who bestows immortality on his language the english language is the only object in his great survey of art and of nature which owes nothing of its excellence to the genius of bacon he had reason indeed to be mortified at the reception of his philosophical works and dr raleigh even some years after the death of his illustrious master had occasion to observe that his fame is greater and sounds louder in foreign parts abroad than at home in his own nation thereby verifying that divine sentence a prophet is not without honour save in his own country and in his own house even the men of genius who ought to have comprehended this new source of knowledge thus open to them reluctantly entered into it so repugnant are we suddenly to give up ancient errors which time and habit have made a part of ourselves harvey who himself experienced the sluggish obstinacy of the learned which repelled a great but a novel discovery could however in his turn deride the amazing novelty of bacon's novum organum harvey said to aubrey that bacon was no great philosopher he writes philosophy like a lord chancellor it has been suggested to me that bacon's philosophical writings have been much overrated his experimental philosophy from the era in which they were produced must be necessarily defective the time he gave to them could only have been had at spare hours but like the great prophet on the mount bacon was doomed to view the land afar which he himself could never enter bacon found but small encouragement for his new learning among the most eminent scholars to whom he had submitted his early discoveries a very copious letter by sir thomas bodley on bacon's desiring him to return the manuscript of the cogitata et visa some portion of the novum organum has come down to us it is replete with objections to the new philosophy i am one of that crew says sir thomas that say we possess a far greater holdfast of certainty in the sciences than you will seem to acknowledge he gives a hint too that solomon complained of the infinite making of books in his time that all bacon delivers is only by averment without other force of argument to disclaim all our axioms maxims etc left by tradition from our elders unto us which have passed all probations of the sharpest wits that ever were and he concludes that the end of all bacon's philosophy by a fresh creating new principles of sciences would be to be dispossessed of the learning we have and he fears that it would require as many ages as have marked before us that knowledge should be perfectly achieved bodley truly compares himself to the carrier's horse which cannot blanch the beaten way in which i was trained bacon did not lose heart by the timidity of the carrier's horse a smart vivacious note in return shows his quick apprehension 
as i am going to my house in the country i shall want my papers which i beg you therefore to return you are slothful and you help me nothing so that i am half in conceit you affect not the argument for myself i know well you love and affect i can say no more but non canimus surdus respondent omnia silvi if you be not of the lodgings chalked up whereof i speak in my preface i am but to pass by your door but if i had you a fortnight at gorhambury i would make you tell another tale or else i would add a cogitation against libraries and be revenged on you that way a keen but playful retort of a great author too conscious of his own views to be angry with his critic the singular phrase of the lodgings chalked up is a sarcasm explained by this passage in the advancement of learning as alexander borgia was wont to say of the expedition of the french for naples that they came with chalk in their hands to mark up their lodgings and not with weapons to fight so i like better that entry of truth that cometh peaceably with chalk to mark up those minds which are capable to lodge and harbour it than that which cometh with pugnacity and contention Footnote i have been favoured with this apt illustration by an anonymous communicator who dates from the london university i request him to accept my grateful acknowledgments End of footnote. the threatened agitation against libraries must have caused bodley's cheek to tingle let us now turn from the scholastic to the men of the world and we shall see what sort of notion these critics entertained of the philosophy of bacon chamberlain writes this week the lord chancellor hath set forth his new work called instauratio magna or a kind of novum organum of all philosophy in sending it to the king he wrote that he wished his majesty might be so long in reading it as he hath been in composing and polishing it which is well near thirty years i have read no more than the bare title and am not greatly encouraged by mr cuff's judgment footnote henry cuff secretary to robert earl of essex and executed being concerned in his treason a man noted for his classical acquirements and his genius who perished early in life End of footnote. who having long since perused it gave this censure that a fool could not have written such a work and a wise man would not a month or two afterwards we find that the king cannot forbear sometimes in reading the lord chancellor's last book to say that it is like the peace of god that surpasseth all understanding two years afterwards the same letter writer proceeds with another literary paragraph about bacon this lord busies himself altogether about books and hath set out two lately historia ventorum and de vita a morte with promise of more i have yet seen neither of them because i have not leisure but if the life of henry the eighth the seventh which they say he is about might come out after his own manner meaning his moral essays i should find time and means enough to read it when this history made its appearance the same writer observes my lord Werelum's history of henry the seventh is come forth i have not read much of it but they say it is a very pretty book footnote chamberlain adds the price of this moderate sized folio which was six shillings it would be worth the while of some literary student to note the prices of our earlier books which are often found written upon them by their original possessor a rare tract first purchased for tuppence has often realized four guineas or more in modern days End of footnote. bacon in his vast survey of human knowledge included even its humbler provinces and condescended to form a collection of apothems his lordship regretted the loss of a collection made by julius caesar while plutarch indiscriminately drew much of the dregs the wits who could not always comprehend his plans ridiculed the sage i shall now quote a contemporary poet whose works for by their size they may assume that distinction were never published a dr andrews wasted a sportive pen on fugitive events but though not always deficient in humour and wit such is the freedom of his writings that they will not often admit of quotation the following is indeed but a strange pun on bacon's title derived from the town of st albans and his collection of apothems on lord bacon publishing apothems 
when learned bacon wrote essays he did deserve and hath the praise but now he writes his apothems surely he dozes or he dreams one said st albans now is grown unable and is in the high road way to dunstable that is dunce table to the close of his days were lord bacon's philosophical pursuits still disregarded and depreciated by ignorance and envy in the forms of friendship or rivalry i shall now give a remarkable example sir edward coke was a mere great lawyer and like all such had a mind so walled in by law knowledge that in its bounded views it shut out the horizon of the intellectual faculties and the whole of his philosophy lay in the statutes in the library at holcombe there will be found a presentation copy of lord bacon's novum organum the instauratio magna sixteen twenty it was given to coke for it bears the following note on the title page in the writing of coke edward coke ex dono authoris auctori concilium instaurare paris veterum documentus sephorum star legis justitiamque prius the verses not only reprove bacon for going out of his profession but must have alluded to his character as a prerogative lawyer and his corrupt administration of the chancery the book was published in october sixteen twenty a few months before his impeachment and so far one may easily excuse the causticity of coke but how he really valued the philosophy of bacon appears by this in this first edition there is a device of a ship passing between hercules's pillars the plus ultra the proud exultation of our philosopher over this device coke has written a miserable distich in english which marks his utter contempt of the philosophical pursuits of his illustrious rival this ship passing beyond the columns of hercules he sarcastically conceits as the ship of fools the famous satire of the german sebastian brandt translated by alexander barclay it deserveth not to be read in schools but to be freighted in the ship of fools such then was the fate of lord bacon a history not written by his biographers but which may serve as a comment on that obscure passage dropped from the pen of his chaplain and already quoted that he was more valued abroad than at home End of section thirty nine section forty of curiosities of literature volume three this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by bruce peary curiosities of literature volume three by isaac disraeli secret history of the death of queen elizabeth it is an extraordinary circumstance in our history that the succession to the english dominion in two remarkable cases was never settled by the possessors of the throne themselves during their lifetime and that there is every reason to believe that this mighty transfer of three kingdoms became the sole act of their ministers who considered the succession merely as a state expedient two of our most able sovereigns found themselves in this predicament queen elizabeth and the protector cromwell cromwell probably had his reasons not to name his successor his positive election would have dissatisfied the opposite parties of his government whom he only ruled while he was able to cajole them he must have been aware that latterly he had need of conciliating all parties to his usurpation and was probably as doubtful on his deathbed whom to appoint his successor as at any other period of his reign ludlow suspects that cromwell was so discomposed in body or mind that he could not attend to that matter and whether he named any one is to me uncertain all that we know is the report of the secretary thurlow and his chaplains who when the protector lay in his last agonies suggested to him the propriety of choosing his eldest son and they tell us that he agreed to this choice 
had cromwell been in his senses he would have probably fixed on henry the lord lieutenant of ireland rather than on richard or possibly had not chosen either of his sons elizabeth from womanish infirmity or from state reasons could not endure the thoughts of her successor and long threw into jeopardy the politics of all the cabinets of europe each of which had its favorite candidate to support the legitimate heir to the throne of england was to be the creature of her breath yet elizabeth would not speak him into existence this had however often raised the discontents of the nation and we shall see how it harassed the queen in her dying hours it is even suspected that the queen still retained so much of the woman that she could never overcome her perverse dislike to name a successor so that according to this opinion she died and left the crown to the mercy of a party this would have been acting unworthy of the magnanimity of her great character and as it is ascertained that the queen was very sensible when she lay in a dying state several days before the natural catastrophe occurred it is difficult to believe that she totally disregarded so important a circumstance it is therefore reasoning a priori most natural to conclude that the choice of a successor must have occupied her thoughts as well as the anxieties of her ministers and that she would not have left the throne in the same unsettled state at her death as she had persevered in during her whole life how did she express herself when bequeathing the crown to james i or did she bequeath it at all in the popular pages of her female historian miss aiken it is observed that the closing scene of the long and eventful life of queen elizabeth was marked by that peculiarity of character and destiny which attended her from the cradle and pursued her to the grave the last days of elizabeth were indeed most melancholy she died a victim of the higher passions and perhaps as much of grief as of age refusing all remedies and even nourishment but in all the published accounts i can nowhere discover how she conducted herself respecting the circumstance of our present inquiry the most detailed narrative or as gray the poet calls it the earl of monmouth's odd account of queen elizabeth's death is the one most deserving notice and there we find the circumstance of this inquiry introduced the queen at that moment was reduced to so sad a state that it is doubtful whether her majesty was at all sensible of the inquiries put to her by her ministers respecting the succession the earl of monmouth says on wednesday the twenty-third of march she grew speechless that afternoon by signs she called for her counsel and by putting her hand to her head when the king of scots was named to succeed her they all knew he was the man she desired should reign after her such a sign as that of a dying woman putting her hand to her head was to say the least a very ambiguous acknowledgment of the right of the scottish monarch to the english throne the odd but very naive account of robert carey afterwards earl of monmouth is not furnished with dates nor with the exactness of a diary something might have occurred on a preceding day which had not reached him camden describes the deathbed scene of elizabeth by this authentic writer it appears that she had confided her state secret of the succession to the lord admiral the earl of nottingham and when the earl found the queen almost at her extremity he communicated her majesty's secret to the council who commissioned the lord admiral the lord keeper and the secretary to wait on her majesty and acquaint her that they came in the name of the rest to learn her pleasure in reference to the succession the queen was then very weak and answered them with a faint voice that she had already declared that as she held a regal sceptre so she desired no other than a royal successor when the secretary requested her to explain herself the queen said i would have a king succeed me and who should that be but my nearest kinsman the king of scots 
here this state conversation was put an end to by the interference of the archbishop advising her majesty to turn her thoughts to god never she replied has my mind wandered from him an historian of camden's high integrity would hardly have forged a fiction to please the new monarch yet camden has not been referred to on this occasion by the exact birch who draws his information from the letters of the french ambassador villeroy information which it appears the english ministers had confided to this ambassador nor do we get any distinct ideas from elizabeth's more recent popular historian who could only transcribe the account of carey he had told us a fact which he could not be mistaken in that the queen fell speechless on wednesday twenty third of march on which day however she called her council and made that sign with her hand which as the lords choose to understand for ever united the two kingdoms but the noble editor of Carey's memoirs, the Earl of Cork and Orrery, has observed that the speeches made for Elizabeth on her deathbed are all forged. Etchard, Rappin, and a long string of historians make her say faintly, so faintly indeed that it could not possibly be heard, I will that a king succeed me, and who should that be but my nearest kinsman, the King of Scots? A different account of this matter will be found in the following memoirs. She was speechless and almost expiring when the chief counsellors of state were called into her bedchamber, as soon as they were perfectly convinced that she could not utter an articulate word, and scarce could hear or understand one, they named the King of Scots to her, a liberty they dared not to have taken if she had been able to speak she put her hand to her head which was probably at that time in agonizing pain the lords who interpreted her signs just as they pleased were immediately convinced that the motion of her hand to her head was a declaration of james the sixth as her successor what was this but the unanimous interpretation of persons who were adoring the rising sun this is lively and plausible but the noble editor did not recollect that the speeches made by elizabeth on her deathbed which he deems forgeries in consequence of the circumstance he had found in carey's memoirs originate with camden and were only repeated by rapin and etchard etc i am now to confirm the narrative of the elder historian as well as the circumstance related by carey describing the sign of the queen a little differently which happened on wednesday the twenty third a hitherto unnoticed document pretends to give a fuller and more circumstantial account of this affair which commenced on the preceding day when the queen retained the power of speech and it will be confessed that the language here used has all that loftiness and brevity which was the natural style of this queen i have discovered a curious document in a manuscript volume formerly in the possession of pettit and seemingly in his own handwriting i do not doubt its authenticity and it could only have come from some of the illustrious personages who were the actors in that solemn scene probably from cecil this memorandum is entitled account of the last words of queen elizabeth about her successor on the tuesday before her death being the twenty-third of march the admiral being on the right side of her bed the lord keeper on the left and mr secretary cecil afterwards earl of salisbury at the bed's feet all standing the lord admiral put her in mind of her speech concerning the succession had at whitehall and that they in the name of all the rest of her council came unto her to know her pleasure who should succeed whereunto she thus replied i told you my seat had been the seat of kings and i will have no rascal to succeed me and who should succeed me but a king the lords not understanding this dark speech and looking one on the other at length mr secretary boldly asked her what she meant by those words that no rascal should succeed her whereto she replied that her meaning was that a king should succeed and who quoth she should that be but our cousin of scotland 
They asked her whether that were her absolute resolution, whereto she answered, I pray you trouble me no more, for I will have none but him. With which answer they departed. Notwithstanding, after again, about four o'clock in the afternoon the next day, being Wednesday, after the Archbishop of Canterbury and other divines had been with her, and left her in a manner speechless, the three lords aforesaid repaired unto her again, asking her if she remained in her former resolution, and who should succeed her, but not being able to speak, was asked by Mr. Secretary in this sort. We beseech your majesty, if you remain in your former resolution, and that you would have the King of Scots to succeed you in your kingdom, show some sign unto us, whereat, suddenly heaving herself upwards in her bed, and putting her arms out of bed, she held her hands jointly over her head in manner of a crown, whence, as they guessed, she signified that she did not only wish him the kingdom, but desire continuance of his estate, after which they departed, and the next morning she died. Immediately after her death all the lords, as well of the council as other noblemen that were at the court, came from Richmond to Whitehall by six o'clock in the morning, where other noblemen that were in London met them. Touching the succession, after some speeches of diverse competitors and matters of state, at length the admiral rehearsed all the aforesaid premises which the late queen had spoken to him, and to the lord keeper and Mr. Secretary Cecil, with the manner thereof, which they, being asked, did affirm to be true upon their honour. Such is this singular document of secret history. I cannot but value it as authentic, because the one part is evidently alluded to by Camden, and the other is fully confirmed by Carey, and besides this, the remarkable expression of rascal is found in the letter of the French ambassador. There were two interviews with the Queen, and Carey appears only to have noticed the last, on Wednesday, when the Queen lay speechless. Elizabeth all her life had persevered in an obstinate mysteriousness respecting the succession, and it harassed her latest moments. The second interview of her ministers may seem to us quite supernumerary, but Carey's putting her hand to her head too meanly describes the joining her hands in manner of a crown. End of section 40《セクション41 of Curiosities of Literature, Volume 3。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Bruce Peary。Curiosities of Literature, Volume 3 by Isaac Disraeli。James the First as a Father and a Husband。Calumnies and sarcasms have reduced the character of James I to contempt among general readers, while the narrative of historians, who have related facts in spite of themselves, is in perpetual contradiction with their own opinions. Perhaps no sovereign has suffered more by that art, which is described by an old Irish proverb of killing a man by lies. The surmises and the insinuations of one party, dissatisfied with the established government in church and state, the misconceptions of more modern writers who have not possessed the requisite knowledge, and the anonymous libels sent forth at a particular period to vilify the stewards, all these cannot be treasured up by the philosopher as the authorities of history. It is at least more honorable to resist popular prejudice than to yield to it a passive obedience, and what we can ascertain it would be a dereliction of truth to conceal. Much can be substantiated in favor of the domestic affections and habits of this pacific monarch, and those who are more intimately acquainted with the secret history of the times will perceive how erroneously the personal character of this sovereign is exhibited in our popular historians, and often even among the few who, with better information, have re-echoed their preconceived opinions. 
confining myself here to his domestic character i shall not touch on the many admirable public projects of this monarch which have extorted the praise and even the admiration of some who have not spared their pens in his disparagement james i has been taxed with pusillanimity and foolishness this monarch cannot however be reproached with having engendered them all his children in whose education their father was so deeply concerned sustained through life a dignified character and a high spirit the short life of henry was passed in a school of prowess and amidst an academy of literature of the king's paternal solicitude even to the hand and the letter-writing of prince henry when young i have preserved a proof in the article of the history of writing-masters charles i in his youth more particularly designed for a studious life with a serious character was however never deficient in active bravery and magnanimous fortitude of elizabeth the queen of bohemia tried as she was by such vicissitudes of fortune it is much to be regretted that the interesting story remains untold her buoyant spirits rose always above the perpetual changes of a princely to a private state a queen to an exile the father of such children derives some distinction for capacity in having reared such a noble offspring and the king's marked attention to the formation of his children's minds was such as to have been pointed out by ben jonson who in his gypsies metamorphosed rightly said of james using his native term you are an honest good man and have care of your bairns among the flouts and jibes so freely bespattering the personal character of james the first is one of his coldness and neglect of his queen it would however be difficult to prove by any known fact that james was not as indulgent a husband as he was a father yet even a writer so well informed as danes barrington who as a lawyer could not refrain from lauding the royal sage during his visit to denmark on his marriage for having borrowed three statutes from the danish code found the king's name so provocative of sarcasm that he could not forbear observing that james spent more time in those courts of judicature than in attending upon his destined consort men of all sorts have taken a pride to gird at me might this monarch have exclaimed but everything has two handles saith the ancient adage had an austere puritan chosen to observe that james i when abroad had lived jovially and had this historian then dropped silently the interesting circumstance of the king's spending his time in the danish courts of judicature the fact would have borne him out in his reproof and francis osborne indeed has censured james for giving marks of his uxoriousness there was no deficient gallantry in the conduct of james i to his queen the very circumstance that when the princess of denmark was driven by a storm back to norway the king resolved to hasten to her and consummate his marriage in denmark was itself as romantic an expedition as afterwards was that of his sons into spain and betrays no mark of that tame pusillanimity with which he stands overcharged the character of the queen of james i is somewhat obscure in our public history for in it she makes no prominent figure while in secret history she is more apparent anne of denmark was a spirited and enterprising woman and it appears from a passage in sully whose authority should weigh with us although we ought to recollect that it is the french minister who writes that she seems to have raised a court faction against james and inclined to favour the spanish and catholic interests yet it may be alleged as a strong proof of james's political wisdom that the queen was never suffered to head a formidable party though she latterly might have engaged prince henry in that court opposition the bonhomie of the king on this subject expressed with a simplicity of style which though it may not be royal is something better 
appears in a letter to the queen which has been preserved in the appendix to sir david dalrymple's collections it is without date but written when in scotland to quiet the queen's suspicions that the earl of mar who had the care of prince henry and whom she wished to take out of his hands had insinuated to the king that her majesty was strongly disposed to any popish or spanish course this letter confirms the representation of sully but the extract is remarkable for the manly simplicity of style which the king used i say over again leave these froward womanly apprehensions for i thank god i carry that love and respect unto you which by the law of god and nature i ought to do to my wife and mother of my children but not for that ye are a king's daughter for whether ye were a king's daughter or a cook's daughter ye must be all alike to me since my wife for the respect of your honourable birth and descent i married you but the love and respect i now bear you is because that ye are my married wife and so partaker of my honour as of my other fortunes i beseech you excuse my plainness in this for casting up of your birth is a needless impertinent that is not pertinent argument to me god is my witness i ever preferred you to my bairns much more than to a subject in an ingenious historical dissertation but one perfectly theoretical respecting that mysterious transaction the gowry conspiracy pinkerton has attempted to show that anne of denmark was a lady somewhat inclined to intrigue and that the king had cause to be jealous he confesses that he cannot discover any positive charge of adultery against anne of denmark but merely of coquetry footnote the historical dissertation is appended to the first volume of mr malcolm lang's history of scotland who thinks that it has placed that obscure transaction in its genuine light End of footnote to what these accusations amount it would be difficult to say the progeny of james i sufficiently bespeak their family resemblance if it be true that the king had ever reason to be jealous and yet that no single criminal act of the queen's has been recorded it must be confessed that one or both of the parties were singularly discreet and decent for the king never complained and the queen was never accused if we accept this burthen of an old scottish ballad oh the bonny earl of murray he was the queen's love whatever may have happened in scotland in england the queen appears to have lived occupied chiefly by the amusements of the court and not to have interfered with the arcana of state she appears to have indulged a passion for the elegancies and splendours of the age as they were shown in those gorgeous court masks with which the taste of james harmonized either from his gallantry for the queen or his own poetic sympathy but this taste for court masks could not escape the slur and scandal of the puritanic and these high-flying fancies are thus recorded by honest arthur wilson whom we summon into court as an indubitable witness of the mutual cordiality of this royal couple in the spirit of his party and like milton he censures the taste but likes it he says the court being a continued masquerado where she the queen and her ladies like so many sea nymphs or nereides appeared often in various dresses to the ravishment of the beholders the king himself not being a little delighted with such fluent elegancies as made the night more glorious than the day footnote see the article on court masks in the early pages of the present volume for notices of the elaborate splendour and costliness of these favourite displays End of footnote this is a direct proof that james was by no means cold or negligent in his attentions to his queen and the letter which has been given is the picture of his mind that james the first was fondly indulgent to his queen and could perform an act of chivalric gallantry with all the generosity of passion and the ingenuity of an elegant mind 
a pleasing anecdote which i have discovered in an unpublished letter of the day will show i give it in the words of the writer august sixteen thirteen at their last being at tybald's about a fortnight ago the queen shooting at a deer mistook her mark and killed jewel the king's most principal and special hound at which he stormed exceedingly a while but after he knew who did it he was soon pacified and with much kindness wished her not to be troubled with it for he should love her never the worse and the next day sent her a diamond worth two thousand pounds as a legacy from his dead dog love and kindness increased daily between them such is the history of a contemporary living at court very opposite to that representation of coldness and neglect with which the king's temper has been so freely aspersed and such too is the true portrait of james the first in domestic life his first sensations were thoughtless and impetuous and he would ungracefully thunder out an oath which a puritan would set down in his tables while he omitted to note that this king's forgiveness and forgetfulness of personal injuries were sure to follow the feeling they had excited End of section 41。section 42 of curiosities of literature volume 3 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by bruce peary curiosities of literature volume 3 by isaac disraeli the man of one book mr morris in his animated memoirs has recently acquainted us with a fact which may be deemed important in the life of a literary man he tells us we have been just informed that sir william jones invariably read through every year the works of cicero whose life indeed was the great exemplar of his own the same passion for the works of cicero has been participated by others when the best means of forming a good style were inquired of the learned arnol he advised the daily study of cicero but it was observed that the object was not to form a latin but a french style in that case replied arnol you must still read cicero a predilection for some great author among the vast number which must transiently occupy our attention seems to be the happiest preservative for our taste accustomed to that excellent author whom we have chosen for our favorite we may in this intimacy possibly resemble him it is to be feared that if we do not form such a permanent attachment we may be acquiring knowledge while our enervated taste becomes less and less lively taste embalms the knowledge which otherwise cannot preserve itself he who has long been intimate with one great author will always be found to be a formidable antagonist he has saturated his mind with the excellences of genius he has shaped his faculties insensibly to himself by his model and he is like a man who ever sleeps in armor ready at a moment the old latin proverb reminds us of this fact cave ab homine unius libri be cautious of the man of one book pliny and seneca gave very safe advice on reading that we should read much but not many books but they had no monthly list of new publications since their days others have favored us with methods of study and catalogues of books to be read vain attempts to circumscribe that invisible circle of human knowledge which is perpetually enlarging itself the multiplicity of books is an evil for the many for we now find an helluo librorum not only among the learned but with their pardon among the unlearned for those who even to the prejudice of their health persist only in reading the incessant book novelties of our own time will after many years acquire a sort of learned ignorance we are now in want of an art to teach how books are to be read rather than not to read them 
such an art is practicable but amidst this vast multitude still let us be the man of one book and preserve an uninterrupted intercourse with that great author with whose mode of thinking we sympathize and whose charms of composition we can habitually retain it is remarkable that every great writer appears to have a predilection for some favorite author and with alexander had they possessed a golden casket would have enshrined the works they so constantly turned over demosthenes felt such delight in the history of thucydides that to obtain a familiar and perfect mastery of his style he recopied his history eight times while brutus not only was constantly perusing polybius even amidst the most busy periods of his life but was abridging a copy of that author on the last awful night of his existence when on the following day he was to try his fate against antony and octavius selim the second had the commentaries of caesar translated for his use and it is recorded that his military ardor was heightened by the perusal we are told that scipio africanus was made a hero by the writings of xenophon when clarendon was employed in writing his history he was in a constant study of livy and tacitus to acquire the full and flowing style of the one and the portrait painting of the other he records this circumstance in a letter voltaire had usually on his table the atalie of racine and the petit carême of Massillon the tragedies of the one were the finest model of french verse the sermons of the other of french prose were i obliged to sell my library exclaimed diderot i would keep back moses homer and richardson and by the eloge which this enthusiastic writer composed on our english novelist it is doubtful had the frenchman been obliged to have lost two of them whether richardson had not been the elected favorite monsieur thomas a french writer who at times displays high eloquence and profound thinking Hérault de seychelle tells us studied chiefly one author but that author was cicero and never went into the country unaccompanied by some of his works fenelon was constantly employed on his homer he left a translation of the greater part of the odyssey without any design of publication but merely as an exercise for style montesquieu was a constant student of tacitus of whom he must be considered a forcible imitator he has in the manner of tacitus characterized tacitus that historian he says who abridged everything because he saw everything the famous bourdaloo reperused every year saint paul saint chrysostom and cicero these says a french critic were the sources of his masculine and solid eloquence grotius had such a taste for lucan that he always carried a pocket edition about him and has been seen to kiss his handbook with the rapture of a true votary if this anecdote be true the elevated sentiments of the stern roman were probably the attraction with the batavian republican the diversified reading of leibniz is well known but he still attached himself to one or two favorites virgil was always in his hand when at leisure and leibniz had read virgil so often that even in his old age he could repeat whole books by heart barclay's argenus was his model for prose when he was found dead in his chair the argenus had fallen from his hands rabelais and marot were the perpetual favorites of la fontaine from one he borrowed his humor and from the other his style quevedo was so passionately fond of the don quixote of cervantes that often in reading that unrivalled work he felt an impulse to burn his own inferior compositions to be a sincere admirer and a hopeless rival is a case of authorship the hardest imaginable few writers can venture to anticipate the award of posterity yet perhaps quevedo had not even been what he was without the perpetual excitement he received from his great master 
Horace was the friend of his heart to Malherbe. He laid the Roman poet on his pillow, took him in the fields, and called his Horace his breviary. Plutarch, Montaigne, and Locke were the three authors constantly in the hands of Rousseau, and he has drawn from them the groundwork of his ideas in his Emile. The favorite author of the great Earl of Chatham was Barrow, and on his style he had formed his eloquence, and had read his great master so constantly as to be able to repeat his elaborate sermons from memory. The great Lord Burley always carried Tully's offices in his pocket. Charles V and Bonaparte had Machiavel frequently in their hands, and Davila was the perpetual study of Hampton. He seemed to have discovered in that historian of civil wars those which he anticipated in the land of his fathers. These facts sufficiently illustrate the recorded circumstance of Sir William Jones's invariable habit of reading his Cicero through every year, and exemplify the happy result for him who, amidst the multiplicity of his authors, still continues in this way to be the man of one book. End of section 42「Section 43 of Curiosities of Literature, Volume 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Curiosities of Literature, Volume 3 by Isaac Disraeli. A Bibliognost. A startling literary prophecy recently sent forth from our oracular literature threatens the annihilation of public libraries which are one day to moulder away. Listen to the vaticinator. As conservatories of mental treasures, their value in times of darkness and barbarity was incalculable, and even in these happier days when men are incited to explore new regions of thought, they command respect as depots of methodical and well-ordered references for the researches of the curious." But what in one state of society is invaluable may at another be worthless, and the progress which the world has made within a very few centuries has considerably reduced the estimation which is due to such establishments. We will say more, but enough. This idea of striking into dust the god of his idolatry, the dagon of his devotion, is sufficient to terrify the bibliographer who views only a blind Samson pulling down the pillars of his temple. This future universal inundation of books, this superfluity of knowledge in billions and trillions, overwhelms the imagination. It is now about 400 years since the art of multiplying books has been discovered, and an arithmetician has attempted to calculate the incalculable of these four ages of typography, which he discovers have actually produced 3,641,960 works. Taking each work at three volumes and reckoning only each impression to consist of three hundred copies, which is too little, the actual amount from the presses of Europe will give to 1816 three billion two hundred and seventy seven million seven hundred and sixty four thousand volumes, each of which being an inch thick if placed on a line would cover six thousand sixty nine leagues leibniz facetiously maintained that such would be the increase of literature that future generations would find whole cities insufficient to contain their libraries we are however indebted to the patriotic endeavours of our grocers and trunk makers alchemists of literature they annihilate the gross bodies without injuring the finer spirits we are still more indebted to that neglected race the bibliographers. 
the science of books for so bibliography is sometimes dignified may deserve the gratitude of a public who are yet insensible of the useful zeal of those book practitioners the nature of whose labours is yet so imperfectly comprehended who is this vaticinator of the uselessness of public libraries is he a bibliognost or a bibliograph or a bibliomane or a bibliophile or a bibliotoph a bibliothecaire or a bibliopole the prophet cannot be for the bibliothecaire is too delightfully busied among his shelves and the bibliopole is too profitably concerned in furnishing perpetual additions to admit of this hyperbolical terror of annihilation footnote will this writer pardon me for ranking him for a moment among those generalizers of the age who excel in what a critical friend has happily discriminated as ambitious writing that is writing on any topic and not least strikingly on that of which they know least men otherwise of fine taste and who excel in every charm of composition End of footnote unawares we have dropped into that professional jargon which was chiefly forged by one who though seated in the scorner's chair was the thaumaturgus of books and manuscripts the abbe rive had acquired a singular taste and curiosity not without a fermenting dash of singular charlantarerie in bibliography the little volumes he occasionally put forth are things which but few hands have touched he knew well that for some books to be noised about they should not be read this was one of those recondite mysteries of his which we may have occasion farther to reveal this bibliographical hero was librarian to the most magnificent of book collectors the duc de la valliere the abbe rive was a strong but ungovernable brute rabid surly but très mordant his master whom i have discovered to have been the partner of the cur's tricks would often pat him and when the bibliognos and the bibliomanes were in the heat of contest let his bulldog loose among them as the duke affectionately called his librarian the bulldog of bibliography appears too to have had the taste and appetite of the tiger of politics but he hardly lived to join the festival of the guillotine i judge of this by an expression he used to one complaining of his parish priest whom he advised to give une messe dans son ventre he had tried to exhaust his genius in la chasse au bibliographe et au antiquaire mal avisé and acted cain with his brothers all europe was to receive from him new ideas concerning books and manuscripts yet all his mighty promises fumed away in projects and though he appeared for ever correcting the blunders of others this french ritson left enough of his own to afford them a choice of revenge his style of criticism was perfectly ritsonian he describes one of his rivals as l'insolent et très insensé autour de l'almanach de gotha on the simple subject of the origin of playing cards the abbe rive was one of those men of letters of whom there are not a few who pass all their lives in preparations dr dibden since the above was written has witnessed the confusion of the mind and the gigantic industry of our bibliognost which consisted of many trunks full of memoranda the description will show the reader to what hard hunting these book hunters voluntarily doomed themselves with little hope of obtaining fame in one trunk were about six thousand notices of manuscripts of all ages in another were wedged about twelve thousand descriptions of books in all languages except those of french and italian sometimes with critical notes 
in a third trunk was a bundle of papers relating to the history of the troubadours in a fourth was a collection of memoranda and literary sketches connected with the invention of arts and sciences with pieces exclusively bibliographical a fifth trunk contained between two and three thousand cards written upon each side respecting a collection of prints in a sixth trunk were contained his papers respecting earthquakes volcanoes and geographical subjects footnote the late william upcott possessed in a large degree a similar taste for miscellaneous collections he never threw an old hat away but used it as a receptacle for certain cuttings from books and periodicals on some peculiar subjects he had filled a room with hats and trunks thus crammed but they were sacrificed at his death for want of necessary arrangement in the footnote this ajax phalagella fur of the bibliographical tribe who was as dr dibden observes the terror of his acquaintance and the pride of his patron is said to have been in private a very different man from his public character all which may be true without altering a shade of that public character the french revolution showed how men mild and even kind in domestic life were sanguinary and ferocious in their public the rabbit abbe rive glorified and terrifying without enlightening his rivals he exulted that he was devoting to the rods of criticism and the laughter of europe the bibliopoles or dealers in books who would not get by heart his catechism of a thousand and one questions and answers it broke the slumbers of honest de bure who had found life was already too short for his own bibliographie instructive the abbe rive had contrived to catch the shades of the appellatives necessary to discriminate book amateurs and of the first term he is acknowledged to be the inventor a bibliognost from the greek is one knowing in title pages and colophons and in editions the place and year when printed the presses whence issued and all the minutia of a book a bibliograph is a describer of books and other literary arrangements a bibliomane is an indiscriminate accumulator who blunders faster than he buys cock-brained and purse-heavy a bibliophile the lover of books is the only one in the class who appears to read them for his own pleasure a bibliotaph buries his books by keeping them under lock or framing them in glass cases i shall catch our bibliognost in the hour of book rapture it will produce a collection of bibliographical writers and show to the second-sighted edinburgh what human contrivances have been raised by the art of more painful writers than himself either to postpone the day of universal annihilation or to preserve for our posterity three centuries hence the knowledge which now so busily occupies us and transmit to them something more than what bacon calls inventories of our literary treasures histories and literary bibliothèques or bibliothecas will always present to us says la rive an immense harvest of errors till the authors of such catalogues shall be fully impressed by the importance of their art and as it were reading in the most distant ages of the future the literary good and evil which they may produce force a triumph from the pure devotion to truth in spite of all the disgusts which their professional tasks involve still patiently enduring the heavy chains which bind down those who give themselves up to this pursuit with a passion which resembles heroism the catalogues of bibliotheque fiques or critical historical and classified accounts of writers have engendered that enormous swarm of bibliographical errors which have spread their roots in greater or less quantities in all our bibliographers he has here furnished a long list which i shall preserve in the note footnote Gessner, simler bellarmine labbe mabillon montfaucon moriaille bayle bayet 
Nisseron Dupin, Carway Wharton, Casimir Houdin, Lelande, Gouget, Wolfus, John Albert Fabricius, Argelati, Tirabaski, Nicholas Antonio, Walkius, Struvius, Brucker, Schnauzer, Linnaeus, Segway, Halle, Adamson, Manger, Kessner, Eloy, Douglas, Wheedler, Hal Bronner, Montucla, Lalonde, Bailly, Quadrio, Morhoff, Strolliou, Fontius, Gerdesius, Votes, Freitag, Davy Clement, Chevillier, Mater, Orlandi, Prosper Marchand, Chaplin, De Beauze, Abbe Salier, et de Saint Lager. End of footnote the list though curious is by no means complete such are the men of whom the abbe rive speaks with more respect than his accustomed courtesy if such says he cannot escape from errors who shall i have only marked them out to prove the importance of bibliographical history a writer of this sort must occupy himself with more regard for his reputation than his own profit and yield himself up entirely to the study of books the mere knowledge of books which has been called an erudition of title pages may be sufficient to occupy the life of some and while the wits and the million are ridiculing these hunters of editions who force their passage through secluded spots as well as course in the open fields it would be found that this art of book knowledge may turn out to be a very philosophical pursuit and that men of great name have devoted themselves to labours more frequently contemned than comprehended apostolo zeno a poet a critic and a true man of letters considered it as no small portion of his glory to have annotated fontanini who himself an eminent prelate had passed his life in forming his bibliotheca italiana zeno did not consider that to correct errors and to enrich by information this catalogue of italian writers was a mean task the enthusiasm of the abbe rive considered bibliography as a sublime pursuit exclaiming on zeno's commentary on fontanini he chained together the knowledge of whole generations for posterity and he read in future ages there are few things by which we can so well trace the history of the human mind as by a class catalogue with dates of the first publication of books even the relative prices of books at different periods their decline and then their rise and again their fall form a chapter in this history of the human mind we become critics even by this literary chronology and this appraisement of auctioneers the favourite book of every age is a certain picture of the people the gradual depreciation of a great author marks a change in knowledge or in taste but it is imagined that we are not interested in the history of indifferent writers and scarcely in that of the secondary ones if none but great originals should claim our attention in the course of two thousand years we should not count twenty authors every book whatever be its character may be considered as a new experiment made by the human understanding and as a book is a sort of individual representation not a solitary volume exists but may be personified and described as a human being hence start discoveries they are usually found in very different authors who could go no further and the historian of obscure books is often preserving for men of genius indications of knowledge which without his intervention we should not possess many secrets we discover in bibliography great writers unskilled in this science of books have frequently used defective editions as hume did the castrated whitelock or like robertson they are ignorant of even the sources of the knowledge they would give the public or they compose on a subject which too late they discover had been anticipated bibliography will show what has been done and suggest to our invention what is wanted many have often protracted their journey in a road which had already been worn out by the wheels which had traversed it bibliography unrolls the whole map of the country we propose travelling over the post-roads and the by-paths 
every half-century indeed the obstructions multiply and the edinburgh prediction should it approximate to the event it has foreseen may more reasonably terrify a far distant posterity Matsuchelli declared after his laborious researches in italian literature that one of his more recent predecessors who had commenced a similar work had collected notices of forty thousand writers and yet he adds my work must increase that number to ten thousand more Matsuchelli said this in seventeen fifty three and the amount of nearly a century must now be added for the presses of italy have not been inactive but the literature of germany of france and of england has exceeded the multiplicity of the productions of italy and an appalling population of authors swarm before the imagination footnote the british museum library now numbers more than five hundred thousand volumes the catalogue alone forms a small library in the footnote hail then the peaceful spirit of the literary historian which sitting amidst the night of time by the monuments of genius trims the sepulchral lamps of the human mind hail to the literary roamer who by the clearness of his glasses makes even the minute interesting and reveals to us the world of insects these are guardian spirits who at the close of every century standing on its ascent trace out the old roads we had pursued and with a lighter line indicate the new ones which are opening from the imperfect attempts and even the errors of our predecessors End of section forty three. Section forty four of Curiosities of Literature, Volume three. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org curiosities of literature volume three by isaac disraeli secret history of an elective monarchy a political sketch poland once a potent and magnificent kingdom when it sunk into an elective monarchy became venal thrice an age that country must have exhibited many a diplomatic scene of intricate intrigue which although they could not appear in its public have no doubt been often consigned to its secret history with us the corruption of a rotten borough has sometimes exposed the guarded proffer of one party and the dexterous chaffering of the other but a masterpiece of diplomatic finesse and political invention electioneering viewed on the most magnificent scale with a kingdom to be canvassed and a crown to be won and lost or lost and won in the course of a single day exhibits a political drama which for the honour and happiness of mankind is of rare and strange occurrence there was one scene in this drama which might appear somewhat too large for an ordinary theatre the actors apparently were not less than fifty to a hundred thousand twelve vast tents were raised on an extensive plain a hundred thousand horses were in the environs and palatines and castellans the ecclesiastical orders with the ambassadors of the royal competitors all agitated by the ceaseless motion of different factions during the six weeks of the election and of many preceding months of preconcerted measures and vacillating opinions now were all solemnly assembled at the diet once the poet amidst his gigantic conception of a scene resolved to leave it out so vast a throng the stage can ne'er contain then build a new or act it in a plain exclaimed la mancha's knight kindling at a scene so novel and so vast 
such an electioneering negotiation the only one i am acquainted with is opened in the discours of choisin the secretary of montluc bishop of valence the confidential agent of catherine de medici and who was sent to intrigue at the polish diet to obtain the crown of poland for her son the duke of anjou afterwards henry the third this bold enterprise at first seemed hopeless and in its progress encountered growing obstructions but montluc was one of the most finished diplomatists that the genius of the gallic cabinet ever sent forth he was nicknamed in all the courts of europe from the circumstance of his limping le boiteau our political bishop was in cabinet intrigues the talleyrand of his age and sixteen embassies to italy germany england scotland and turkey had made this connoisseur en um an extraordinary politician catherine de medici was infatuated with the dreams of judicial astrology her pensioned oracles had declared that she should live to see each of her sons crowned by which prediction probably they had only purpose to flatter her pride and her love of dominion they however ended in terrifying the credulous queen and she dreading to witness a throne in france disputed perhaps by fratricides anxiously sought a separate crown for each of her three sons she had been trifled with in her earnest negotiations with our elizabeth twice had she seen herself baffled in her views in the dukes of alencon and of anjou catherine then projected a new empire for anjou by incorporating into one kingdom algiers corsica and sardinia but the other despot he of constantinople selim the second dissipated the brilliant speculation of our female machiavel charles the ninth was sickly jealous and desirous of removing from the court the duke of anjou whom two victories had made popular though he afterwards sunk into a sardanapalus montluc penetrated into the secret wishes of catherine and charles and suggested to them the possibility of encircling the brows of anjou with the diadem of poland the polish monarch then being in a state of visible decline the project was approved and like a profound politician the bishop prepared for an event which might be remote and always problematical by sending into poland a natural son of his balagny as a disguised agent his youth his humble rank and his love of pleasure would not create any alarm among the neighbouring powers who were alike on the watch to snatch the expected spoil but as it was necessary to have a more dexterous politician behind the curtain he recommended his secretary choisin as a travelling tutor to a youth who appeared to want one balagny proceeded to poland where under the veil of dissipation and in the midst of splendid festivities with his trusty adjutant this hare-brained boy of revelry began to weave those intrigues which were afterwards to be knotted or untied by montluc himself he had contrived to be so little suspected that the agent of the emperor had often disclosed important secrets to his young and amiable friend on the death of sigismund augustus balagny leaving choisin behind to trumpet forth the virtues of anjou hastened to paris to give an account of all which he had seen or heard but poor choisin found himself in a dilemma among those who had so long listened to his panegyrics on the humanity and meek character of the duke of anjou for the news of st bartholomew's massacre had travelled faster than the post and choisin complains that he was now treated as an impudent liar and the french prince as a monster in vain he assured them that the whole was an exaggerated account a mere insurrection of the people 
or the effects of a few private enmities praying the indignant poles to suspend their decision till the bishop came attendez le boiteau cried he in agony meanwhile at paris the choice of a proper person for this embassy had been difficult to settle it was a business of intrigue more than of form and required an orator to make speeches and addresses in a sort of popular assembly for though the people indeed had no concern in the diet yet the greater and the lesser nobles and gentlemen all electors were reckoned at one hundred thousand it was supposed that a lawyer who could negotiate in good latin and one as the french proverb runs who could aller et parler would more effectually puzzle their heads and satisfy their consciences to vote for his client catherine at last fixed on montluc himself from the superstitious prejudice which however in this case accorded with philosophical experience that montluc had ever been lucky in his negotiations montluc hastened his departure from paris and it appears that our political bishop had by his skilful penetration into the french cabinet foreseen the horrible catastrophe which occurred very shortly after he had left it for he had warned the count de rochefoucault to absent himself but this lord like so many others had no suspicions of the perfidious projects of catherine and her cabinet montluc however had not long been on his journey ere the news reached him and it occasioned innumerable obstacles in his progress which even his sagacity had not calculated on at strasburg he had appointed to meet some able coadjutors among whom was the famous joseph scaliger but they were so terrified by les matinees parisiennes that scaliger flew to geneva and would not budge out of that safe corner and the others ran home not imagining that montluc would venture to pass through germany where the protestant indignation had made the roads too hot for a catholic bishop but montluc had set his cast on the die he had already passed through several hairbreadth escapes from the stratagems of the guise faction who more than once attempted to hang or drown the bishop who they cried out was a calvinist the fears and jealousies of the guises had been roused by this political mission among all these troubles and delays montluc was most affected by the rumour that the election was on the point of being made and that the plague was universal throughout poland so that he must have felt that he might be too late for the one and too early for the other at last montluc arrived and found that the whole weight of this negotiation was to fall on his single shoulders and further that he was to sleep every night on a pillow of thorns our bishop had not only to allay the ferment of the popular spirit of the evangelicals as the protestants were then called but even of the more rational catholics of poland he had also to face those haughty and feudal lords of whom each considered himself the equal of the sovereign whom he created and whose avowed principle was and many were incorrupt that their choice of a sovereign should be regulated solely by the public interest and it was hardly to be expected that the emperor the czar and the king of sweden would prove unsuccessful rivals to the cruel and voluptuous and bigoted duke of anjou whose political interests were too remote and novel to have raised any faction among these independent poles the crafty politician had the art of dressing himself up in all the winning charms of candour and loyalty a sweet flow of honeyed words melted on his lips while his heart cold and immovable as a rock stood unchanged amidst the most unforeseen difficulties 
the emperor had set to work the abbe seer in a sort of ambiguous character an envoy for the nonce to be acknowledged or disavowed as was convenient and by his activity he obtained considerable influence among the lithuanians the wallachians and nearly all prussia in favour of the archduke ernest two bohemians who had the advantage of speaking the polish language had arrived with a state and magnificence becoming kings rather than ambassadors the muscovite had written letters full of golden promises to the nobility and was supported by a palatine of high character a perpetual peace between two such great neighbours was too inviting a project not to find advocates and this party choisnin observes appeared at first the most to be feared the king of sweden was a close neighbour who had married the sister of their late sovereign and his son urged his family claims as superior to those of foreigners among these parties was a patriotic one who were desirous of a pole for their monarch a king of their fatherland speaking their mother tongue one who would not strike at the independence of his country but preserve its integrity from the stranger this popular party was even agreeable to several of the foreign powers themselves who did not like to see a rival power strengthening itself by so strict a union with poland but in this choice of a sovereign from among themselves there were at least thirty lords who equally thought that they were the proper wood of which kings should be carved out the poles therefore could not agree on the pole who deserved to be a piasta an endearing title for a native monarch which originated in the name of the family of the piastis who had reigned happily over the polish people for the space of five centuries the remembrance of their virtues existed in the minds of the honest poles in this affectionate title and their party were called the piastis montluc had been deprived of the assistance he had depended on from many able persons whom the massacre of st bartholomew had frightened away from every french political connection he found that he had himself only to depend on we are told that he was not provided with the usual means which are considered most efficient in elections nor possessed the interest nor the splendour of his powerful competitors he was to derive all his resources from diplomatic finesse the various ambassadors had fixed on distant residences that they might not hold too close an intercourse with the polish nobles of all things he was desirous to obtain an easy access to these chiefs that he might observe and that they might listen he who would seduce by his own ingenuity must come in contact with the object he would corrupt yet montluc persisted in not approaching them without being sought after which answered his purpose in the end one favourite argument which our talleyrand had set afloat was to show that all the benefits which the different competitors had promised to the poles were accompanied by other circumstances which could not fail to be ruinous to the country while the offer of his master whose interests were remote could not be adverse to those of the polish nation so that much good might be expected from him without any fear of accompanying evil montluc procured a clever frenchman to be the bearer of his first dispatch in latin to the diet which had hardly assembled ere suspicions and jealousies were already breaking out the emperor's ambassadors had offended the pride of the polish nobles by travelling about the country without leave and resorting to the infanta and besides in some intercepted letters the polish nation was designated as jean barbara et jean inepta i do not think that the said letter was really written by the said ambassadors who were statesmen too politic to employ such unguarded language very ingeniously writes the secretary of montluc however it was a blow levelled at the imperial ambassadors while the letter of the french bishop composed 
in a humble and modest style began to melt their proud spirits and two thousand copies of the french bishop's letter were eagerly spread but this good fortune did not last more than four-and-twenty hours mournfully writes our honest secretary for suddenly the news of the fatal day of st bartholomew arrived and every frenchman was detested montluc in this distress published an apology for les matinets parisiennes which he reduced to some excesses of the people the result of a conspiracy plotted by the protestants and he adroitly introduced as a personage his master anjou declaring that he scorned to oppress a party whom he had so often conquered with sword in hand this pamphlet which still exists must have cost the good bishop some invention but in elections the lie of the moment serves a purpose and although montluc was in due time bitterly recriminated on still the apology served to divide public opinion montluc was a whole cabinet to himself he dispersed another tract in the character of a polish gentleman in which the french interests were urged by such arguments that the leading chiefs never met without disputing and montluc now found that he had succeeded in creating a french party the austrian then employed a real polish gentleman to write for his party but this was too genuine a production for the writer wrote too much in earnest and in politics we must not be in a passion the mutual jealousies of each party assisted the views of our negotiator they would side with him against each other the archduke and the czar opposed the turk the muscovite could not endure that sweden should be aggrandized by this new crown and denmark was still more uneasy montluc had discovered how every party had its vulnerable point by which it could be managed the cards had now got fairly shuffled and he depended on his usual good play our bishop got hold of a palatine to write for the french cause in the vernacular tongue and appears to have held a more mysterious intercourse with another palatine albert lasky mutual accusations were made in the open diet the poles accused some lithuanian lords of having contracted certain engagements with the czar these in return accused the poles and particularly this lasky with being corrupted by the gold of france another circumstance afterwards arose the spanish ambassador had forty thousand dollars sent to him but which never passed the frontiers as this fresh supply arrived too late for the election i believe writes our secretary with great simplicity that this money was only designed to distribute among the trumpeters and the tambourines the usual expedient in contested elections was now evidently introduced our secretary acknowledging that montluc daily acquired new supporters because he did not attempt to gain them over merely by promises resting his whole cause on this argument that the interest of the nation was concerned in the french election still would ill fortune cross our crafty politician when everything was proceeding smoothly the massacre was refreshed with more damning particulars some letters were forged and others were but too true all parties with rival intrepidity were carrying on a complete scene of deception a rumour spread that the french king disavowed his accredited agent and apologised to the emperor for having yielded to the importunities of a political speculator whom he was now resolved to recall this somewhat paralysed the exertions of those palatines who had involved themselves in the intrigues of montluc who was now forced patiently to wait for the arrival of a courier with renewed testimonials of his diplomatic character from the french court 
a great odium was cast on the french in the course of this negotiation by a distribution of prints which exposed the most inventive cruelties practised by the catholics on the reformed such as women cleaved in half in the act of attempting to snatch their children from their butchers while charles the ninth and the duke of anjou were hideously represented in their persons and as spectators of such horrid tragedies with words written in labels complaining that the executioners were not zealous enough in this holy work these prints accompanied by libels and by horrid narratives inflamed the popular indignation and more particularly the women who were affected to tears as if these horrid scenes had been passing before their eyes montluc replied to the libels as fast as they appeared while he skilfully introduced the most elaborate panegyrics on the duke of anjou and in return for the caricatures he distributed two portraits of the king and the duke to show the ladies if not the diet that neither of these princes had such ferocious and inhuman faces such are the small means by which the politician condescends to work his great designs and the very means by which his enemies thought they should ruin his cause montluc adroitly turned to his own advantage anything of instant occurrence serves electioneering purposes and montluc eagerly seized this favourable occasion to exhaust his imagination on an ideal sovereign and to hazard with address anecdotes whose authenticity he could never have proved till he perplexed even unwilling minds to be uncertain whether that intolerant and inhuman duke was not the most heroic and most merciful of princes it is probable that the frenchman abused even the license of the french eloge for a noble pole to montluc that he was always amplifying his duke with such ideal greatness and attributing to him such immaculate purity of sentiment that it was inferred there was no man in poland who could possibly equal him and that his declaration that the duke was not desirous of reigning over poland to possess the wealth and grandeur of the kingdom and that he was solely ambitious of the honour to be the head of such a great and virtuous nobility had offended many lords who did not believe that the duke sought the polish crown merely to be the sovereign of a virtuous people these polish statesmen appear indeed to have been more enlightened than the subtle politician perhaps calculated on for when montluc was over anxious to exculpate the duke of anjou from having been an actor in the parisian massacre a noble pole observed that he need not lose his time at framing any apologies for if he could prove that it was the interest of the country that the duke ought to be elected their king it was all that was required his cruelty were it true would be no reason to prevent his election for we have nothing to dread from it once in our kingdom he will have more reason to fear us than we him should he ever attempt our lives our property or our liberty another polish lord whose scruples were as pious as his patriotism was suspicious however observed that in his conferences with the french bishop the bishop had never once mentioned god whom all parties ought to implore to touch the hearts of the electors in the choice of god's anointed montluc might have felt himself unexpectedly embarrassed at the religious scruples of this lord but the politician was never at a fault speaking to a man of letters as his lordship was replied the french bishop it was not for him to remind his lordship what he so well knew but since he had touched on the subject he would however say that were a sick man desirous of having a physician the friend who undertook to procure one would not do his duty should he say it was necessary to call in one whom god had chosen to restore his health but another who should say that the most learned and skilful is he whom god has chosen would be doing the best for the patient and evince most judgment by a parity of reason we must believe that god will not send an angel to point out the man whom he would have his anointed sufficient for us that god has given us a knowledge of the requisites of a good king and if the polish gentlemen choose such a sovereign it will be him who god has chosen 
this shrewd argument delighted the polish lord who repeated the story in different companies to the honour of the bishop and in this manner as the secretary with great naivete did the sieur strengthened by good arguments divulge his opinions which were received by many and run from hand to hand montluc had his inferior manoeuvres he had to equipoise the opposite interests of the catholics and the evangelists or the reformed it was mingling fire and water without suffering them to hiss or to extinguish one another when the imperial ambassadors gave fetes to the higher nobility only they consequently offended the lesser the frenchman gave no banquets but his house was open to all at all times who were equally welcome you will see that the fetes of the imperialists will do them more harm than good observed montluc to his secretary having gained over by every possible contrivance a number of the polish nobles and showered his courtesies on those of the inferior orders at length the critical moment approached and the finishing hand was to be put to the work poland with the appearance of a popular government was a singular aristocracy of a hundred thousand electors consisting of the higher and the lower nobility and the gentry the people had no concern with the government yet still it was to be treated by the politician as a popular government where those who possessed the greatest influence over such large assemblies were orators and he who delivered himself with the most fluency and the most pertinent arguments would infallibly bend every heart to the point he wished the french bishop depended greatly on the effect which his oration was to produce when the ambassadors were respectively to be heard before the assembled diet the great and concluding act of so many tedious and difficult negotiations which had cost my master writes the ingenuous secretary six months daily and nightly labours he had never been assisted or comforted by any but his poor servants and in the course of these six months had written ten reams of paper a thing which for forty years he had not used himself to every ambassador was now to deliver an oration before the assembled electors and thirty-two copies were to be printed to present one to each palatine who in his turn was to communicate it to his lords but a fresh difficulty occurred to the french negotiator as he trusted greatly to his address influencing the multitude and creating a popular opinion in his favour he regretted to find that the imperial ambassador would deliver his speech in the bohemian language so that he would be understood by the greater part of the assembly a considerable advantage over montluc who could only address them in latin the inventive genius of the french bishop resolved on two things which had never before been practised first to have his latin translated into the vernacular idiom and secondly to print an edition of fifteen hundred copies in both languages and thus to obtain a vast advantage over the other ambassadors with their thirty-two manuscript copies of which each copy was used to be read to one thousand two hundred persons the great difficulty was to get it secretly translated and printed this fell to the management of choisnin the secretary he set off to the castle of the palatine solikotsky who was deep in the french interest solikotsky dispatched the version in six days hastening with the precious manuscript to krakow choisnin flew to a trusty printer with whom he was connected the sheets were deposited every night at choisnin's lodgings and at the end of a fortnight the diligent secretary conducted the one thousand five hundred copies in secret triumph to warsaw yet this glorious labour was not ended 
montluc was in no haste to deliver his wonder-working oration on which the fate of a crown seemed to depend when his turn came to be heard he suddenly fell sick the fact was that he wished to speak last which would give him the advantage of replying to any objection raised by his rivals and admit also of an attack on their weak points he contrived to obtain copies of their harangues and discovered five points which struck at the french interest our poor bishop had now to sit up through the night to rewrite five leaves of his printed oration and cancel five which had been printed and worse he had to get them by heart and to have them translated and inserted by employing twenty scribes day and night it is scarcely credible what my master went through about this time saith the historian of his jests the council or diet was held in a vast plain twelve pavilions were raised to receive the polish nobility and the ambassadors one of a circular form was supported by a single mast and was large enough to contain six thousand persons without any one approaching the mast nearer than by twenty steps leaving this space void to preserve silence the different orders were placed around the archbishop and the bishops the palatines the castellans each according to their rank during the six weeks of the sittings of the diet one hundred thousand horses were in the environs yet forage and every sort of provisions abounded there were no disturbances not a single quarrel occurred although there wanted not in that meeting for enmities of long standing it was strange and even awful to view such a mighty assembly preserving the greatest order and every one seriously intent on this solemn occasion at length the elaborate oration was delivered it lasted three hours and choisnin assures us not a single auditor felt weary a cry of joy broke out from the tent and was re-echoed through the plain when montluc ceased it was a public acclamation and had the election been fixed for that moment when all hearts were warm surely the duke had been chosen without a dissenting voice thus writes in rapture the ingenuous secretary and in the spirit of the times communicates a delightful augury attending this speech by which evidently was foreseen its happy termination those who disdain all things will take this to be a mere invention of mine says honest choisnin but true it is that while the said sieur delivered his harangue a lark was seen all the while upon the mast of the pavilion singing and warbling which was remarked by a great number of lords because the lark is accustomed only to rest itself on the earth the most impartial confess this to be a good augury footnote our honest secretary reminds me of a passage in geoffrey of monmouth who says at this place an eagle spoke while the wall of the town was building and indeed i should not have failed transmitting the speech to posterity had i thought it true as the rest of the history in the footnote also it was observed that when the other ambassadors were speaking a hare and at another time a hog ran through the tent and when the swedish ambassador spoke the great tent fell halfway down this lark singing all the while did no little good to our cause for many of the nobles and gentry noticed this curious particularity because when a thing which does not commonly happen occurs in a public affair such appearances give rise to hopes either of good or of evil the singing of this lark in favour of the duke of anjou is not so evident as the cunning trick of the other french agent the political bishop of valence who now reaped the full advantage of his one thousand five hundred copies over the thirty-two of his rivals every one had the french one in hand or read it to his friends while the others in manuscript were confined to a very narrow circle 
The period from the 10th of April to the 6th of May, when they proceeded to the election, proved to be an interval of infinite perplexities, troubles, and activity. It is probable that the secret history of this period of the negotiations was never written the other ambassadors were for protracting the election perceiving the french interest prevalent but delay would not serve the purpose of montluc he not being so well provided with friends and means on the spot as the others were the public opinion which he had succeeded in creating by some unforeseen circumstance might change during this interval the bishop had to put several agents of the other parties hors de combat he got rid of a formidable adversary in the cardinal commandant an agent of the pope's whom he proved ought not to be present at the election and the cardinal was ordered to take his departure a bullying colonel was set upon the french negotiator and went about from tent to tent with a list of the debts of the duke of anjou to show that the nation could expect nothing profitable from a ruined spendthrift the page of a polish count flew to montluc for protection entreating permission to accompany the bishop on his return to paris the servants of the count pursued the page but this young gentleman had so insinuated himself into the favour of the bishop that he was suffered to remain the next day the page desired montluc would grant him the full liberty of his religion being an evangelical that he might communicate this to his friends and thus fix them to the french party montluc was too penetrating for this young political agent whom he discovered to be a spy and the pursuit of his fellows to have been a farce he sent the page back to his master the evangelical count observing that such tricks were too gross to be played on one who had managed affairs in all the courts of europe before he came into poland another alarm was raised by a letter from the grand vizier of selim the second addressed to the diet in which he requested that they would either choose a king from among themselves or elect the brother of the king of france some zealous frenchmen at the sublime port had officiously procured this recommendation from the enemy of christianity but an alliance with mahometanism did no service to montluc either with the catholics or the evangelicals the bishop was in despair and thought that his handiwork of six months toil and trouble was to be shook into pieces in an hour montluc being shown the letter instantly insisted that it was a forgery designed to injure his master the duke the letter was attended by some suspicious circumstances and the french bishop quick at expedience snatched at an advantage which the politician knows how to lay hold of in the chapter of accidents the letter was not sealed with the golden seal nor enclosed in a silken purse or cloth of gold and farther if they examined the translation he said they would find that it was not written on turkish paper this was a piece of the good fortune for the letter was not forged but owing to the circumstance that the boyar of valachia had taken out the letter to send a translation with it which the vizier had omitted it arrived without its usual accompaniments and the courier when inquired after was kept out of the way so that in a few days nothing more was heard of the great vizier's letter such was our fortunate escape says the secretary from the friendly but fatal interference of the sultan than which the sewer dreaded nothing so much many secret agents of the different powers were spinning their dark intrigues and often when discovered or disconcerted the creatures were again at their dirty work these agents were conveniently disavowed or acknowledged by their employers the abbe seer was an active agent of the emperor's and though not publicly accredited was still hovering about in lithuania he had contrived matters so well as to have gained over that important province for the archduke and was passing through prussia to hasten to communicate with the emperor but some honest men 
quelques bons personnages says the french secretary and no doubt some good friends of his master took him by surprise and laid him up safely in the castle of marienburg where truly he was a little uncivilly used by the soldiers who rifled his portmanteau and sent us his papers when we discovered all his foul practices the emperor it seems was angry at the arrest of his secret agent but as no one had the power of releasing the abbe sir at that moment what with receiving remonstrances and furnishing replies the time passed away and a very troublesome adversary was in safe custody during the election the dissensions between the catholics and the evangelicals were always on the point of breaking out but montluc succeeded in quieting these inveterate parties by terrifying their imaginations with sanguinary civil wars and invasions of the turks and the tartars he satisfied the catholics with the hope that time would put an end to heresy and the evangelicals were glad to obtain a truce from persecution the day before the election montluc found himself so confident that he dispatched a courier to the french court and expressed himself in the true style of a speculative politician that des deux tables du damier nous en avons les neuf assurés there were preludes to the election and the first was probably in acquiescence with a saturnalian humour prevalent in some countries where the lower orders are only allowed to indulge their taste for the mockery of the great at stated times and on fixed occasions a droll scene of a mock election as well as combat took place between the numerous polish pages who saith the grave secretary are still more mischievous than our own these elected among themselves for competitors made a senate to burlesque the diet and went to loggerheads those who represented the archduke were well beaten the swede was hunted down and for the piastus they seized on a cart belonging to a gentleman laden with provisions broke it into pieces and burnt the axle tree which in that country is called a piasti and cried out the piasti is burnt nor could the senators at the diet that day command any order or silence the french party wore white handkerchiefs in their hats and they were so numerous as to defeat the others the next day however opened a different scene the nobles prepared to deliberate and each palatine in his quarters was with his companions on their knees and many with tears in their eyes chanting a hymn to the holy ghost it must be confessed that this looked like a work of god says our secretary who probably understood the manoeuvring of the mock combat or the mock prayers much better than we may everything tells at an election burlesque or solemnity the election took place and the duke of anjou was proclaimed king of poland but the troubles of montluc did not terminate when they presented certain articles for his signature the bishop discovered that these had undergone material alterations from the proposals submitted to him before the proclamation these alterations referred to a disavowal of the parisian massacre the punishment of its authors and toleration in religion montluc refused to sign and cross-examined his polish friends about the original proposals one party agreed that some things had been changed but that they were too trivial to lose a crown for others declared that the alterations were necessary to allay the fears or secure the safety of the people our gallic diplomatist was outwitted and after all his intrigues and cunning he found that the crown of poland was only to be delivered on conditional terms in this dilemma with a crown depending on a stroke of his pen remonstrating entreating arguing and still delaying like ancient pistol swallowing his leak he witnessed with alarm some preparations for a new election and his rivals on the watch with their protests montluc in despair signed the conditions assured however says the secretary who groans over this finale that when the elected monarch should arrive the states would easily be induced to correct them and place things in statu quo 
as before the proclamation i was not a witness being then dispatched to paris with the joyful news but i heard that the sieur evesque it was thought would have died in this agony of being reduced to the hard necessity either to sign or to lose the fruits of his labours the conditions were afterwards for a long while disputed in france de tu informs us in liber fifty seven of his history that montluc after signing these conditions wrote to his master that he was not bound by them because they did not concern poland in general and that they had compelled him to sign what at the same time he had informed them his instructions did not authorize such was the true jesuitic conduct of a grey-haired politician who at length found that honest plain sense could embarrass and finally entrap the creature of the cabinet the artificial genius of diplomatic finesse the secretary however views nothing but his master's glory in the issue of this most difficult negotiation and the triumph of anjou over the youthful archduke whom the poles might have moulded to their will and over the king of sweden who claimed the crown by his queen's side and had offered to unite his part of livonia with that which the poles possessed he labours hard to prove that the palatines and the castellans were not pratique that is had their votes brought up by montluc as was reported from their number and their opposite interests he confesses that the sieur evesque slept little while in poland and that he only gained over the hearts of men by that natural gift of god which acquired him the title of the happy ambassador he rather seems to regret that france was not prodigal of her purchase money than to affirm that all palatines were alike scrupulous of their honour one more fact may close this political sketch a lesson of the nature of court gratitude the french court affected to receive Choisnin with favour but their suppressed discontent was reserved for the happy ambassador affairs had changed charles the ninth was dying and catherine de medici in despair for a son to whom she had sacrificed all while anjou already immersed in the wantonness of youth and pleasure considered his elevation to the throne of poland as an exile which separated him from his depraved enjoyments montluc was rewarded only by incurring disgrace catherine de medici and the duke of anjou now looked coldly on him and expressed their dislike of his successful mission the mother of kings as Choisnin, designates catherine de medici to whom he addresses his memoirs with the hope of awakening her recollections of the zeal the genius and the success of his old master had no longer any use for her favourite and montluc found as the commentator of Choisnin expresses in a few words an important truth in political morality that at court the interest of the moment is the measure of its affections and its hatreds footnote i have drawn up this article for the curiosity of its subject and its details from the discours au frais de tout ce qui s'est fait et passé pour l'entière négociation de l'excision du roi du pologne divisé en trois livres par Johann choisnin du chantelleron naguère secrétaire de m levesque de valence fifteen seventy four in the footnote end of section forty four section forty five of curiosities of literature volume three this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org curiosities of literature volume three by isaac disraeli buildings in the metropolis and residence in the country recently more than one of our learned judges from the bench have perhaps astonished their auditors by impressing them with an old-fashioned notion of residing more on their estates than the fashionable modes of life and the esprit de société now overpowering all other esprit will ever admit 
these opinions excited my attention to a curious circumstance in the history of our manners the great anxiety of our government from the days of elizabeth till much later than those of charles the second to preserve the kingdom from the evils of an overgrown metropolis the people themselves indeed participated in the same alarm at the growth of the city while however they themselves were perpetuating the grievance which they complained of it is amusing to observe that although the government was frequently employing even their most forcible acts to restrict the limits of the metropolis the suburbs were gradually incorporating with the city and westminster at length united itself to london since that happy marriage their fertile progenies have so blended together that little londons are no longer distinguishable from the ancient parent we have succeeded in spreading the capital into a county and have verified the prediction of james i that england will shortly be london and london england i think it a great object said justice best in delivering his sentiments in favour of the game laws that gentlemen should have a temptation to reside in the country amongst their neighbours and tenantry whose interests must be materially advanced by such a circumstance the links of society are thereby better preserved and the mutual advantages and dependence of the higher and lower classes on one another are better maintained the baneful effects of our present system we have lately seen in a neighbouring country and an ingenious french writer has lately shown the ill consequences of it on the continent these sentiments of a living luminary of the law afford some reason of policy for the dread which our government long entertained on account of the perpetual growth of the metropolis the nation like a hypochondriac was ludicrously terrified that their head was too monstrous for their body and that it drew all the moisture of life from the middle and the extremities proclamations warned and exhorted but the very interference of a royal prohibition seemed to render the crowded city more charming in vain the statute against new buildings was passed by elizabeth in vain during the reigns of james i and both the charleses we find proclamations continually issuing to forbid new erections james was apt to throw out his opinions in these frequent addresses to the people who never attended to them his majesty notices those swarms of gentry who through the instigation of their wives or to new model and fashion their daughters who if they were unmarried marred their reputations and if married lost them did neglect their country hospitality and cumber the city a general nuisance to the kingdom he addressed the star chamber to regulate the exorbitancy of the new buildings about the city which were but a shelter for those who when they had spent their estates in coaches lackeys and fine clothes like frenchmen lived miserably in their houses like italians but the honour of the english nobility and gentry is to be hospitable among their tenants once conversing on this subject the monarch threw out that happy illustration which has been more than once noticed that gentlemen resident on their estates were like ships in port their value and magnitude were felt and acknowledged but when at a distance as their size seemed insignificant so their worth and importance were not duly estimated footnote a proclamation was issued in the first year of king james commanding gentlemen to depart the court and city because it hinders hospitality and endangers the people near their own residences who had from such houses much comfort and ease toward their living the king graciously says he took no small contentment in the resort of gentlemen and other 
our subjects coming to visit us holding their affectionate desire to see our person to be a certain testimony of their inward love but he says he must not give way to so great a mischief as the continual resort may breed and that therefore all that have no special cause of attendance must at once go back until the time of his coronation when they may return until the solemnity be passed but only for that time for if the proclamation be slighted he shall make them an example of contempt if we shall find any making stay here contrary to this direction such proclamations were from time to time issued and though sometimes evaded were frequently enforced by fines so that living in london was a risk and danger to country gentlemen of fortune End of footnote. a manuscript writer of the times complains of the breaking up of old family establishments all crowding to upstart london every one strives to be a diogenes in his house and an emperor in the streets not caring if they sleep in a tub so they may be hurried in a coach giving that allowance to horses and mares that formerly maintained houses full of men pinching many a belly to paint a few backs and bearing all the treasures of the kingdom into a few citizens coffers their woods into wardrobes their leases into laces and their goods and chattels into guarded coats and gaudy toys such is the representation of an eloquent contemporary and however contracted might have been his knowledge of the principles of political economy and of that prosperity which a wealthy nation is said to derive from its consumption of articles of luxury the moral effects have not altered nor has the scene in reality greatly changed the government not only frequently forbade new buildings within ten miles of london but sometimes ordered them to be pulled down after they had been erected for several years every six or seven years proclamations were issued in charles the first reign offenders were sharply prosecuted by a combined operation not only against houses but against persons many of the nobility and gentry in sixteen thirty two were informed against for having resided in the city contrary to the late proclamation and the attorney-general was then fully occupied in filing bills of indictment against them as well as ladies for staying in town the following curious information in the star chamber will serve our purpose the attorney-general informs his majesty that both elizabeth and james by several proclamations had commanded that persons of livelihood and means should reside in their counties and not abide or sojourn in the city of london so that counties remain unserved these proclamations were renewed by charles the first who had observed a greater number of nobility and gentry and abler sort of people with their families had resorted to the cities of london and westminster residing there contrary to the ancient usage of the english nation by their abiding in their several counties where their means arise they would not only have served his majesty according to their ranks but by their housekeeping in those parts the meaner sort of people formerly were guided directed and relieved he accuses them of wasting their estates in the metropolis which would employ and relieve the common people in their several counties the loose and disorderly people that follow them living in and about the cities are so numerous that they are not easily governed by the ordinary magistrates mendicants increase in great numbers the prices of all commodities are highly raised etc the king had formerly proclaimed that all ranks who were not connected with public offices at the close of forty days notice should resort to their several counties and with their families continue their residence there and his majesty further warned them not to put themselves to unnecessary charge in providing themselves to return in winter 
to the said cities as it was the king's firm resolution to withstand such great and growing evil the information concludes with a most copious list of offenders among whom are a great number of nobility and ladies and gentlemen who were accused of having lived in london for several months after the given warning of forty days it appears that most of them to elude the grasp of the law had contrived to make a show of quitting the metropolis and after a short absence had again returned and thus the service of your majesty and your people in the several counties have been neglected and undone such is the substance of this curious information which enables us at least to collect the ostensible motives of this singular prohibition proclamations had hitherto been considered little more than the news of the morning and three days afterwards were as much read as the last week's newspapers they were now however resolved to stretch forth the strong arm of law and to terrify by an example the constables were commanded to bring in a list of the names of strangers and the time they proposed to fix their residence in their parishes a remarkable victim on this occasion was a mr palmer a sussex gentleman who was brought ore tenus into the star chamber for disobeying the proclamation for living in the country palmer was a squire of one thousand pounds per annum then a considerable income he appears to have been some rich bachelor for in his defence he alleged that he had never been married never was a housekeeper and had no house fitting for a man of his birth to reside in as his mansion in the country had been burnt down within two years these reasons appeared to his judges to aggravate rather than extenuate his offence and after a long reprimand for having deserted his tenants and neighbours they heavily fined him in one thousand pounds the condemnation of this sussex gentleman struck a terror through a wide circle of sojourners in the metropolis i find accounts pathetic enough of their packing away on all sides for fear of the worst and gentlemen grumbling that they should be confined to their houses and this was sometimes backed to by a second proclamation respecting their wives and families and also widows which was duris sermo to the women it is nothing pleasing to all says the letter-writer but least of all to the women to encourage gentlemen to live more willingly in the country says another letter-writer all game-fowl as pheasants partridges ducks as also hares are this day by proclamation forbidden to be dressed or eaten in any inn here we find realized the argument of mr justice best in favour of the game laws it is evident that this severe restriction must have produced great inconvenience to certain persons who found a residence in london necessary for their pursuits this appears from the manuscript diary of an honest antiquary sir simon's dues he has preserved an opinion which no doubt was spreading fast that such prosecutions of the attorney-general were a violation of the liberty of the subject most men wondered at mr noy the attorney-general being accounted a great lawyer that so strictly took away men's liberties at one blow confining them to reside at their own houses and not permitting them freedom to live where they pleased within the king's dominions i was myself a little startled upon the first coming out of the proclamation but having first spoken with the lord coventry lord keeper of the great seal at islington when i visited him and afterwards with sir william jones one of the king's justices of the bench about my condition and residence at the said town of islington and they both agreeing that i was not within the letter of the proclamation nor the intention of it neither i rested satisfied and thought myself secure 
laying in all my provisions for housekeeping for the year ensuing and never imagined myself to be in danger till this unexpected censure of mr palmer passed in the star chamber so having advised with my friends i resolved for a remove being much troubled not only with my separation from records but with my wife being great with child fearing a winter journey might be dangerous to her he left islington and the records in the tower to return to his country seat to the great disturbance of his studies it is perhaps difficult to assign the cause of this marked anxiety of the government for the severe restriction of the limits of the metropolis and the prosecution of the nobility and gentry to compel a residence on their estates whatever were the motives they were not peculiar to the existing sovereign but remained transmitted from cabinet to cabinet and were even renewed under charles the second at a time when the plague often broke out a close and growing metropolis might have been considered to be a great evil a terror expressed by the manuscript writer before quoted complaining of this deluge of building that we shall be all poisoned with breathing in one another's faces the police of the metropolis was long imbecile notwithstanding their strong watches and guards set at times and bodies of the idle and the refractory often assumed some mysterious title and were with difficulty governed we may conceive the state of the police when london apprentices growing in number and insolence frequently made attempts on bridewell or pulled down houses one day the citizens improving some ordnance terrified the whole court of james the first with a panic that there was a rising in the city it is possible that the government might have been induced to pursue this singular conduct for i do not know that it can be paralleled of pulling down new-built houses by some principle of political economy which remains to be explained or ridiculed by our modern adepts it would hardly be supposed that the present subject may be enlivened by a poem the elegance and freedom of which may even now be admired it is a great literary curiosity and its length may be excused for several remarkable points an ode by sir richard fanshaw upon occasion of his majesty's proclamation in the year sixteen thirty commanding the gentry to reside upon their estates in the country now war is all the world about and everywhere erinyes reigns or of the torch so late put out the stench remains holland for many years hath been of christian tragedies the stage yet seldom hath she played a scene of bloodier rage and france that was not long composed with civil drums again resounds and ere the old are fully closed receives the wounds the great gustavus in the west plucks the imperial eagle's wing than whom the earth did ne'er invest a fiercer king only the island which we sow a world without the world so far from present wounds it cannot show an ancient scar white peace the beautifulest of things seems here her everlasting rest to fix and spread the downy wings over the nest as when great jove usurping reign from the plagued world did her exile and tied her with a golden chain to one blest isle which in a sea of plenty swam and turtles sang on every bough a safe retreat to all that came as ours is now yet we as if some foe were here leave the despised fields to clowns and come to save ourselves as twere in walled towns hither we bring wives babes rich clothes and gems till now my sovereign the growing evil 
doth oppose counting in vain his care preserves us from annoy of enemies his realms to invade unless he force us to enjoy the peace he made to roll themselves in envied leisure he therefore sends the landed heirs whilst he proclaims not his own pleasure so much was theirs the sap and blood of the land which fled into the root and choked the heart are bid their quickening power to spread through every part o oh, twas an act not for my muse to celebrate nor the dull age until the country air infuse a purer rage and if the fields as thankful prove for benefits received as seed they will to quite so great a love a virgil breed nor let the gentry grudge to go into those places whence they grew but think them blessed they may do so who would pursue the smoky glory of the town that may go till his native earth and by the shining fire sit down of his own hearth free from the griping scrivener's bands and the more biting mercer's books free from the bait of oiled hands and painted looks the country too even chops for rain you that exhale it by your power let the fat drops fall down again in a full shower and you bright beauties of the time that waste yourselves here in a blaze fix to your orb and proper clime your wandering rays let no dark corner of the land be unembellished with one gem and those which here too thick to stand sprinkle on them believe me ladies you will find in that sweet light more solid joys more true contentment to the mind than all town toys nor cupid there less blood doth spill but heads his shafts with chaster love not feathered with a sparrow's quill but of a dove there you shall hear the nightingale the harmless siren of the wood how prettily she tells a tale of rape and blood the lyric lark with all beside of nature's feathered choir and all the commonwealth of flowers inst pride behold you shall the lily queen the royal rose the gilly flower prince of the blood the courtier tulip gay and close the regal bud the violet purple senator how they do mock the pomp of state and all that at the surly door of great ones wait plant trees you may and see them shoot up with your children to be served to your clean boards and the fairest fruit to be preserved and learn to use their several gums tis innocence in the sweet blood of cherry apricots and plums to be imbrued end of section forty five Section 46 of Curiosities of Literature, Volume 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Curiosities of Literature, Volume 3 by Isaac Disraeli. Royal Proclamations the satires and the comedies of the age have been consulted by the historian of our manners and the features of the times have been traced from those amusing records of folly danes barrington enlarged this field of domestic history in his very entertaining observations on the statutes another source which to me seems not to have been explored is the proclamations which have frequently issued from our sovereigns and were produced by the exigencies of the times these proclamations or royal edicts in our country were never armed with the force of laws only as they enforce the execution of laws already established and the proclamation of a british monarch may become even an illegal act if it be in opposition to the law of the land once indeed it was enacted under the arbitrary government of henry the eighth by the sanction of a pusillanimous parliament that the force of acts of parliament should be given to the king's proclamations 
and at a much later period the chancellor lord ellesmere was willing to have advanced the king's proclamations into laws on the sophistical maxim that all precedents had a time when they began but this chancellor argued ill as he was told with spirit by lord coke in the presence of james the first footnote the whole story is in twelve coke seven forty six i owe this curious fact to the author of eunomus to one hundred and sixteen end of footnote who probably did not think so ill of the chancellor's logic blackstone to whom on this occasion i could not fail to turn observes on the statute under henry the eighth that it would have introduced the most despotic tyranny and must have proved fatal to the liberties of this kingdom had it not been luckily repealed in the minority of his successor whom he elsewhere calls an amiable prince all our young princes we discover were amiable blackstone has not recorded the subsequent attempt of the lord chancellor under james the first which tended to raise proclamations to the nature of a ukase of the autograph of both the russias it seems that our national freedom notwithstanding our ancient constitution has had several narrow escapes royal proclamations however in their own nature are innocent enough for since the manner time and circumstances of putting laws in execution must frequently be left to the discretion of the executive magistrate a proclamation that is not adverse to existing laws need not create any alarm the only danger they incur is that they seem never to have been attended to and rather testified the wishes of the government than the compliance of the subjects they were not laws and were therefore considered as sermons or pamphlets or anything forgotten in a week's time these proclamations are frequently alluded to by the letter-writers of the times among the news of the day but usually their royal virtue hardly kept them alive beyond the week some on important subjects are indeed noticed in our history many indications of the situation of affairs the feelings of the people and the domestic history of our nation may be drawn from these singular records i have never found them to exist in any collected form and they have been probably only accidentally preserved footnote a quarto volume was published by barker the king's printer and is entitled a book of proclamations published since the beginning of his majesty's most happy reign over england until this present month of february sixteen hundred and nine it contains one hundred and ten in all the society of antiquaries of london possesses at the present time the largest and most perfect collection of royal proclamations in existence brought together since the above was written they are on separate broad sheets as issued End of footnote the proclamations of every sovereign would characterize his reign and open to us some of the interior operations of the cabinet the despotic will yet vacillating conduct of henry the eighth towards the close of his reign may be traced in a proclamation to abolish the translations of the scriptures and even the reading of bibles by the people commanding all printers of english books and pamphlets to affix their names to them and forbidding the sale of any english books printed abroad footnote in fifteen twenty nine the king had issued a proclamation for resisting and withstanding of most damnable heresies sown within the realm of the disciples of luther and other heretics perverters of christ's religion in june fifteen thirty this was followed by the proclamation for damning or condemning of erroneous books and heresies and prohibiting the having of holy scripture translated into the vulgar tongues of english french or dutch he notes many books printed beyond the sea which he will not allow that is to say the book called the wicked mamana 
the book named the obedience of a christian man the supplication of beggars and the book called the revelation of antichrist the summary of scripture and divers other books made in the english tongue in fact all books in the vernacular not issued by native printers and that having respect to the malignity of this present time with the inclination of people to erroneous opinions the translation of the new testament and the old into the vulgar tongue of english should rather be the occasion of continuance or increase of errors among the said people than any benefit or commodity toward the weal of their souls and he determines therefore that the scriptures shall only be expounded to the people as heretofore and that these books be clearly exterminate and exiled out of this realm of england for ever when the people were not suffered to publish their opinions at home all the opposition flew to foreign presses and their writings were then smuggled into the country in which they ought to have been printed hence many volumes printed in a foreign type at this period are found in our collections the king shrunk in dismay from that spirit of reformation which had only been a party business with him and making himself a pope decided that nothing should be learnt but what he himself deigned to teach the antipathies and jealousies which are populous too long indulged by their incivilities to all foreigners are characterized by a proclamation issued by mary commanding her subjects to behave themselves peaceably towards the strangers coming with king philip that noblemen and gentlemen should warn their servants to refrain from strife and contention either by outward deeds taunting words unseemly countenance by mimicking them etc the punishment not only her grace's displeasure but to be committed to prison without bail or main prize the proclamations of edward the sixth curiously exhibit the unsettled state of the reformation where the rites and ceremonies of catholicism were still practised by the new religionists while an opposite party resolutely bent on an eternal separation from rome were avowing doctrines which afterwards consolidated themselves into puritanism and while others were hatching up that demoralizing fanaticism which subsequently shocked the nation with those monstrous sects the indelible disgrace of our country in one proclamation the king denounces to the people those who despise the sacrament by calling it idol or such other vile name another is against such as innovate any ceremony and who are described as certain private preachers and other laymen who rashly attempt of their own and singular wit and mind not only to persuade the people from the old and accustomed rites and ceremonies but also themselves bring in new and strange orders according to their fantasies the which as it is an evident token of pride and arrogancy so it tendeth both to confusion and disorder another proclamation to press a godly conformity throughout his realm where we learn the following curious fact of divers unlearned and indiscreet priests of a devilish mind and intent teaching that a man may forsake his wife and marry another his first wife yet living likewise that the wife may do the same to the husband others that a man may have two wives or more at once for that these things are not prohibited by god's law but by the bishop of rome's law so that by such evil and fantastical opinions some have not been afraid indeed to marry and keep two wives here as in the bud we may unfold those subsequent scenes of our story which spread out in the following century the branching out of the nonconformists into their various sects and the indecent haste of our reformed priesthood who in their zeal to cast off the yoke of rome desperately submitted to the liberty of having two wives or more there is a proclamation to abstain from flesh on fridays and saturdays 
exhorted on the principle not only that men should abstain on those days and forbear their pleasures and the meats wherein they had more delight to the intent to subdue their bodies to the soul and spirit but also for worldly policy to use fish for the benefit of the commonwealth and profit of many who be fishers and men using that trade unto the which this realm in every part environed with the seas and so plentiful of fresh waters be increased the nourishment of the land by saving flesh it did not seem to occur to the king and council that the butchers might have had cause to petition against this monopoly of two days in the week granted to the fishmongers and much less that it was better to let the people eat flesh or fish as suited their conveniency in respect to the religious rite itself it was evidently not considered as an essential point of faith since the king enforces it on the principle for the profit and commodity of his realm burnett has made a just observation on religious fasts a proclamation against excess of apparel in the reign of elizabeth and renewed many years after shows the luxury of dress which was indeed excessive footnote in june fifteen seventy four the queen issued from her manor of greenwich this proclamation against excess of apparel and the superfluity of unnecessary foreign wares thereto belonging which is declared to have grown by sufferance to such an extremity that the manifest decay not only of a great part of the wealth of the whole realm generally is like to follow by bringing into the realm such superfluities of silks clothes of gold silver and other most vain devices of so great cost for the quantity thereof as of necessity the monies and treasure of the realm is and must be yearly conveyed out of the same this is followed by three folio leaves minutely describing what may be worn on the dresses of every grade of persons descending to such minutiae as to note what classes are not to be allowed to put lace or fringes or borders of velvet upon their gowns and petticoats under pain of fine or punishment because improper for their station and above their means the order appears to have been evaded for it was followed by another in february fifteen eighty which recapitulates these prohibitions and renders them more stringent End of footnote there is a curious one against the iconoclasts or image breakers and picture destroyers for which the antiquary will hold her in high reverence her majesty informs us that several persons ignorant malicious or covetous of late years have spoiled and broken ancient monuments erected only to show a memory to posterity and not to nourish any kind of superstition the queen laments that what is broken and spoiled would be now hard to recover but advises her good people to repair them and commands them in future to desist from committing such injuries a more extraordinary circumstance than the proclamation itself was the manifestation of her majesty's zeal in subscribing her name with her own hand to every proclamation dispersed throughout england these image breakers first appeared in elizabeth's reign it was afterwards that they flourished in all the perfection of their handicraft and have contrived that these monuments of art shall carry down to posterity the memory of their shame and of their age these image breakers so famous in our history had already appeared under henry the eighth and continued their practical zeal in spite of proclamations and remonstrances till they had accomplished their work in sixteen forty one an order was published by the commons that they should take away all scandalous pictures out of churches but more was intended than was expressed and we are told that the people did not at first carry their barbarous practice against all art to the lengths which they afterwards did till they were instructed by private information dowsing's journal has been published and shows what the order meant 
he was their giant destroyer such are the machiavellian secrets of revolutionary governments they give a public order in moderate words but the secret one for the deeds is that of extermination it was this sort of men who discharged their prisoners by giving a secret sign to lead them to their execution the proclamations of james i by their number are said to have sunk their value with the people footnote the list of a very few of those issued at the early part of his reign may illustrate this in sixteen o four was published a proclamation for the true winding or folding of wools as well as one for the due regulation of prices of victuals within the verge of kent in sixteen hundred and five against certain calumnious surmises concerning the church government of scotland in sixteen hundred and eight a proclamation against making starch in sixteen hundred and twelve that none buy or sell any bullion of gold and silver at higher prices than is appointed to be paid for the same another against dyeing silk with slip or any corrupt stuff in sixteen hundred and thirteen for prohibiting the untimely bringing in of wines as well as for prohibiting the publishing of any reports or writings of duels and also the importation of felt hats or caps in sixteen hundred and fifteen prohibiting the making of glass with timber or wood because of late years the waste of wood and timber hath been exceeding great and intolerable by the glass houses and glass works of late in divers parts erected and which his majesty fears may have the effect of depriving england of timber to construct her navy End of footnote he was fond of giving them gentle advice and it is said by wilson that there was an intention to have this king's printed proclamations bound up in a volume that better notice might be taken of the matters contained in them there is more than one to warn the people against speaking too freely of matters above their reach prohibiting all undutiful speeches i suspect that many of these proclamations are the composition of the king's own hand he was often his own secretary there is an admirable one against private duels and challenges the curious one respecting cowell's interpreter is a sort of royal review of some of the arcana of state i refer to the quotation i will preserve a passage of a proclamation against excess of lavish and licentious speech james was a king of words although the commixture of nations confluence of ambassadors and the relation which the affairs of our kingdoms have had towards the business and interests of foreign states have caused during our regiment government a greater openness and liberty of discourse even concerning matters of state which are no themes or subjects fit for vulgar persons or common meetings than hath been in former times used or permitted and although in our own nature and judgment we do well allow of convenient freedom of speech esteeming any over-curious or restrained hands carried in that kind rather as a weakness or else over much severity of government than otherwise yet for as much as it is come to our ears by common report that there is at this time a more licentious passage of lavish discourse and bold censure in matters of state than is fit to be suffered we give this warning etc to take heed how they intermeddle by pen or speech with causes of state and secrets of empire either at home or abroad but contain themselves within that modest and reverent regard of matters above their reach and calling or to give any manner of applause to such discourse without acquainting one of our privy council within the space of twenty-four hours it seems that the bold speakers as certain persons were then denominated practised an old artifice of lauding his majesty while they severely arraigned the counsels of the cabinet on this james observes neither let any man mistake us so much as to think that by giving fair and specious attributes to our person they cover the scandals which they otherwise lay upon our government but conceive that we make no other construction of them but as fine and artificial glosses the better to give passage to the rest of their imputations and scandals 
this was a proclamation in the eighteenth year of his reign he repeated it in the nineteenth and he might have proceeded to the crack of doom with the same effect rushworth in his second volume of historical collections has preserved a considerable number of the proclamations of charles the first of which many are remarkable but latterly they mark the feverish state of his reign one regulates access for cure of the king's evil by which his majesty it appears hath had good success therein but though ready and willing as any king or queen of this realm ever was to relieve the distresses of his good subjects his majesty commands to change the seasons for his sacred touch from easter and whitsuntide to easter and michaelmas as times more convenient for the temperature of the season etc another against departure out of the realm without license one to erect an office for the suppression of cursing and swearing to receive the forfeitures against libellous and seditious pamphlets and discourses from scotland framed by factious spirits and republished in london this was in sixteen forty and charles at the crisis of that great insurrection in which he was to be at once the actor and the spectator fondly imagined that the possessors of these scandalous pamphlets would bring them as he proclaimed to one of his majesty's justices of peace to be by him sent to one of his principal secretaries of state on the restoration charles the second had to court his people by his domestic regulations he early issued a remarkable proclamation which one would think reflected on his favourite companions and which strongly marks the moral disorders of those depraved and wretched times it is against vicious debauched and profane persons who are thus described a sort of men of whom we have heard much and are sufficiently ashamed who spend their time in taverns tippling houses and debauches giving no other evidence of their affection to us but in drinking our health and inveighing against all others who are not of their own dissolute temper and who in truth have more discredited our cause by the license of their manners and lives than they could ever advance it by their affection or courage we hope all persons of honour or in place and authority will so far assist us in discountenancing such men that their discretion and shame will persuade them to reform what their conscience would not and that the displeasure of good men towards them may supply what the laws have not and it may be cannot well provide against there being by the license and corruption of the times and the depraved nature of man many enormities scandals and impieties in practice and manners which laws cannot well describe and consequently not enough provide against which may by the example and severity of virtuous men be easily discountenanced and by degrees suppressed surely the gravity and moral severity of clarendon dictated this proclamation which must have afforded some mirth to the gay debauched circle the loose cronies of royalty it is curious that in sixteen sixty charles the second issued a long proclamation for the strict observance of lent and alleges for it the same reason as we found in edward the sixth proclamation for the good it produces in the employment of fishermen no ordinaries taverns etc to make any supper on friday nights either in lent or out of lent charles the second issues proclamations to repress the excess of gilding of coaches and chariots to restrain the waste of gold which as they supposed by the excessive use of gilding had grown scarce against the exportation and the buying and selling of gold and silver at higher rates than in our mint alluding to a statute made in the ninth year of edward the third called the statute of money against building in and about london and westminster in sixteen sixty one the inconveniences daily growing by increase of new buildings are that the people increasing in such great numbers are not well to be governed by the wanted officers the prices of victuals are enhanced the health of the subject inhabiting the cities much endangered and many good towns and boroughs unpeopled and in their trades much decayed frequent fires occasioned by timber buildings it 
orders to build with brick and stone which would beautify make an uniformity in the buildings and which are not only more durable and safe against fire but by experience are found to be of little more if not less charge than the building with timber we must infer that by the general use of timber it had considerably risen in price while brick and stone not then being generally used became as cheap as wood footnote lilly the astrologer in his memoirs notes that thomas howard earl of arundel the famous collector of the arundelian marbles now at oxford brought over the new way of building with brick in the city greatly to the safety of the city and preservation of the wood of this nation End of footnote the most remarkable proclamations of charles the second are those which concern the regulations of coffee-houses and one for putting them down footnote. this proclamation for the suppression of coffee-houses bears date december twenty sixteen seventy five and is dated to have been issued because the multitude of coffee-houses lately set up and kept within this kingdom and the great resort of idle and dissipated persons to them have produced very evil and dangerous effects particularly in spreading of rumours and inducing tradesmen to neglect their calling tending to the danger of the common weal by the idle waste of time and money it therefore orders all coffee-house keepers that they or any of them do not presume from and after the tenth day of january next ensuing to keep any public coffee-house or utter or sell by retail in his her or their house or houses to be spent or consumed within the same any coffee chocolate sherbet or tea as they will answer it at their utmost peril End of footnote. to restrain the spreading of false news and licentious talking of state and government the speakers and the hearers were made alike punishable this was highly resented as an illegal act by the friends of civil freedom who however succeeded in obtaining the freedom of the coffee-houses under the promise of not sanctioning treasonable speeches it was urged by the court lawyers as the high tory roger north tells us that the retailing coffee might be an innocent trade when not used in the nature of a common assembly to discourse of matters of state news and great persons as a means to discontent the people on the other side kennett asserted that the discontents existed before they met at the coffee-houses and that the proclamation was only intended to suppress an evil which was not to be prevented at this day we know which of those two historians exercised the truest judgment it was not the coffee-houses which produced political feeling but the reverse whenever government ascribes effects to a cause quite inadequate to produce them they are only seeking means to hide the evil which they are too weak to suppress End of section forty six Section 47 of Curiosities of Literature, Volume 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Annie Hill. Curiosities of Literature, Volume 3, by Isaac Disraeli. True Sources of Secret History this is a subject which has been hitherto but imperfectly comprehended even by some historians themselves and has too often incurred the satire and even the contempt of those volatile spirits who play about the superficies of truth wanting the industry to view it on more than one side and those superficial readers who imagine that every tale is told when it is written secret history is the supplement of history itself and is its great corrector and the combination of secret with public history has in itself a perfection which each taken separately has not the popular historian composes a plausible rather than an accurate tale researches too fully detailed would injure the just proportions or crowd the bold design of the elegant narrative and facts presented as they occur would not adapt themselves to those theoretical writers of history who arrange events not in a natural but in a systematic order 
but in secret history we are more busied in observing what passes than in being told of it we are transformed into the contemporaries of the writers while we are standing on the vantage ground of their posterity and thus what to them appeared ambiguous to us has become unquestionable what was secret to them has been confided to us they mark the beginnings and we the ends from the fullness of their accounts we recover much which had been lost to us in the general views of history and it is by this more intimate acquaintance with persons and circumstances that we are enabled to correct the less distinct and sometimes the fallacious appearances in the page of the popular historian he who only views things in masses will have no distinct notion of any one particular he may be a fanciful or a passionate historian but he is not the historian who will enlighten while he charms but as secret history appears to deal in minute things its connection with great results is not usually suspected the circumstantiality of its story the changeable shadows of its character the redundance of its conversations and the many careless superfluities which egotism or vanity may throw out seem usually confounded with that small talk familiarity termed gossiping but the gossiping of a profound politician or a vivacious observer in one of their letters or in their memoirs often by a spontaneous stroke reveals the individual or by a simple incident unriddles a mysterious event we may discover the value of these pictures of human nature with which secret history abounds by an observation which occurred between two statesmen in office lord raby our ambassador apologized to lord bolingbroke then secretary of state for troubling him with the minuter circumstances which occurred in his conferences in reply the minister requests the ambassador to continue the same manner of writing and alleges an excellent reason those minute circumstances give very great light to the general scope and design of the persons negotiated with and i own that nothing pleases me more in that valuable collection of the cardinal dossat's letters than the naive descriptions which he gives of the looks gestures and even tones of voice of the persons he conferred with i regret to have to record the opinions of another noble author who has recently thrown out some degrading notions of secret history and particularly of the historians i would have silently passed by a vulgar writer superficial prejudiced and uninformed but as so many are yet deficient in correct notions of secret history it is but justice that their representatives should be heard before they are condemned his lordship says that of late the appetite for remains of all kinds has surprisingly increased a story repeated by the duchess of portsmouth's waiting woman to lord rochester's valet forms the subject of investigation for a philosophical historian and you may hear of an assembly of scholars and authors discussing the validity of a piece of scandal invented by a maid of honour more than two centuries ago and repeated to an obscure writer by queen elizabeth's housekeeper it is a matter of the greatest interest to see the letters of every busy trifler yet who does not laugh at such men this is the attack but as if some half-truths like light through the cranny in a dark room had just darted in a stream of atoms over this scoffer at secret history he suddenly views his object with a very different appearance for his lordship justly concludes that it must be confessed however that knowledge of this kind is very entertaining and here and there among the rubbish we find hints that may give the philosopher a clue to important facts and afford to the moralist a better analysis of the human mind than a whole library of metaphysics the philosopher may well abhor all intercourse with wits because the faculty of judgment is usually quiescent with them and in their orgasm they furiously decry what in their sober senses they as eagerly laud 
let me inform his lordship that the waiting woman and the valet of eminent persons are sometimes no unimportant personages in history by the memoirs de mont de la porte premier valet de chambre de louis fourteenth we learn what before the valet wrote had not been known the shameful arts which mazarin allowed to be practised to give a bad education to the prince and to manage him by depraving his tastes madame de montville in her memoirs the waiting lady of our henrietta has preserved for our own english history some facts which have been found so essential to the narrative that they are referred to by our historians in guy joly the humble dependent of cardinal de retz we discover an unconscious but a useful commentator on the memoirs of his master and the most affecting personal antidotes of charles i have been preserved by thomas herbert his gentleman-in-waiting clary the valet of louis the sixteenth with pathetic faithfulness has shown us the man in the monarch whom he served of secret history there are obviously two species it is positive or it is relative it is positive when the facts are first given to the world a sort of knowledge which can only be drawn from our own personal experience or from contemporary documents preserved in their manuscript state in public or private collections or it is relative in proportion to the knowledge of those to whom it is communicated and will be more or less valued according to the acquisitions of the reader and this inferior species of secret history is drawn from rare and obscure books and other published authorities often as scarce as manuscripts some experience i have had in those literary researches were curiosity ever wakeful and vigilant discoverers among contemporary manuscripts new facts illustrations of old ones and sometimes detect not merely by conjecture the concealed causes of many events often opens a scene in which some well-known personage is exhibited in a new character and thus penetrates beyond those generalizing representations which satisfy the superficial and often cover the page of history with delusion and fiction it is only since the latter institution of natural libraries that these immense collections of manuscripts have been formed with us they are an indescribable variety usually classed under the vague title of state papers footnote two five two the large mass of important documents in the national state paper office has recently been made available to the use of the historic student with the best results and cannot fail to have important influence on the future historic literature of the country End of footnote. instructions of ambassadors but more particularly their own dispatches charters and chronicles brown with antiquity which preserve a world which had been else lost for us like the one before the deluge series upon series of private correspondence among which we discover the most confidential communications designed by the writers to have been destroyed by the hand which received them memoirs of individuals by themselves or by their friends such as now are published by the pomp of vanity or the faithlessness of their possessors and the miscellaneous collections formed by all kinds of persons characteristic of all countries and of all eras materials for the history of man records of the force or of the feebleness of the human understanding and still the monuments of their passions the original collectors of these dispersed manuscripts were a race of ingenious men silent benefactors of mankind to whom justice has not yet been fully awarded but in their fervour of accumulation everything in a manuscript state bore its spell acquisition was the sole point aimed at by our early collectors and to this these searching spirits sacrificed their fortunes their ease and their days but life would have been too short to have decided on the intrinsic value of the manuscripts flowing in a stream to the collectors and suppression even of the disjointed reveries of madmen or the sensible madness of projectors might have been indulging a capricious state or what has proved more injurious to historical pursuits 
that party feeling which has frequently annihilated the memorials of their adversaries these manuscripts now assume a formidable appearance a toilsome march over these alps rising over alps a voyage in a sea without a shore has turned away most historians from their severer duties those who have grasped at early celebrity have been satisfied to have given a new form to rather than contributed to the new matter of history the very sight of these masses of history has terrified some modern historians when pere daniel undertook a history of france the learned boivin the king's librarian opened for his inspection an immense treasure of charters and another of royal autograph letters and another of private correspondence treasures reposing in fourteen hundred folios the modern historian passed two hours impatiently looking over them but frightened at another plunge into the gulf this courteous of history would not immolate himself for his country he wrote a civil letter to the librarian for his supernumerary kindness but insinuated that he could write a very readable history without any further aid of such paper asses or paper rubbish pere daniel therefore quietly sat down to his history copying others a compliment which was never returned by any one but there was this striking novelty in his readable history that according to the accurate computation of count boulain villiers pere daniel's history of france contains ten thousand blunders the same circumstance has been told me by a living historian of the late gilbert stuart who on some manuscript volumes of letters being pointed out to him when composing his history of scotland confessed that what was already printed was more than he was able to read and thus much for his theoretical history written to run counter to another theoretical history being stuart versus robertson they equally depend on the simplicity of their readers and the charms of style another historian and queto the author of l'esprit de la ligue has described his embarrassment at an inspection of the contemporary manuscripts of that period after thirteen years of research to glean whatever secret history printed books afforded the author residing in the country resolved to visit the royal library at paris monsieur melot received him with that kindness which is one of the official duties of the public librarian towards the studious opened the cabinets in which were deposited the treasures of french history this is what you require come here at all times and you shall be attended said the librarian to the young historian who stood by with a sort of shudder while he opened cabinet after cabinet the intrepid investigator repeated his visits looking over the mass as chance directed attacking one side and then flying to another the historian who had felt no weariness during thirteen years among printed books discovered that he was now engaged in a task apparently always beginning and never ending the esprit de la ligue was however enriched by labors which at the moment appeared so barren the study of these paper asses is not perhaps so disgusting as the impatient pere daniel imagined there is a literary fascination in looking over the same papers which the great characters of history once held and wrote on catching from themselves their secret sentiments and often detecting so many of their unrecorded actions by habit the toil becomes light and with a keen inquisitive spirit even delightful for what is more delightful to the curious than to make fresh discoveries every day addison has a true and pleasing observation on such pursuits our employments are converted into amusements so that even in those objects which were indifferent or even displeasing to us the mind not only gradually loses its aversion but conceives a certain fondness and affection for them addison illustrates this case by one of the greatest geniuses of the age who by habit took incredible pleasure in searching into rolls and records till he preferred them to virgil and cicero the faculty of curiosity is as fervid and even as refined in its search after truth as that of taste in the object of imagination and the more it is indulged the more exquisitely it is enjoyed 
the popular historians of england and of france have in truth made little use of manuscript researches life is very short for long histories and those who rage with an avidity of fame or profit will gladly taste the fruit which they cannot mature researches too remotely sought after or too slowly acquired or too fully detailed would be so many obstructions in the smooth texture of a narrative our theoretical historians write from some particular and preconceived result unlike livy and de Thau and machiavel who described events in their natural order these cluster them together by the fanciful threads of some political or moral theory by which facts are distorted displaced and sometimes altogether omitted one single original document has sometimes shaken into the dust their palladian edifice of history at the moment hume was sending some sheets of his history to press murden's state papers appeared and we are highly amused and instructed by a letter of our historian to his rival robertson who probably found himself often in the same forlorn situation our historian discovered in that collection what compelled him to retract his preconceived system he hurries to stop the press and paints his confusion and his anxiety with all the ingenious simplicity of his nature we are all in the wrong he exclaims of fume i have heard that certain manuscripts at the state paper office had been prepared for his inspection during a fortnight but he never could muster courage to pay his promised visit satisfied with the common accounts and the most obvious sources of history when librarian at the advocate's library where yet may be examined the books he used marked by his hand he spread the volumes about the sofa from which he rarely rose to pursue obscure inquiries or delay by fresh difficulties the page which every day was growing under his charming pen and striking proof of his careless happiness i discovered in his never referring to the perfect edition of whitelock's memorials of seventeen thirty two but to the old truncated and faithless ones of sixteen eighty two dr birch was a writer with no genius for composition but one to whom british history stands more indebted than to any superior author his incredible love of labor in transcribing with his own hand a large library of manuscripts from originals dispersed in public and in private repositories has enriched the british museum by thousands of the most authentic documents of genuine secret history he once projected a collection of original historical letters for which he had prepared a preface where i find the following passage it is a more important service to the public to contribute something not before known to the general fund of history than to give new form and color to what we are already possessed of by superadding refinement and ornament which too often tend to disguise the real state of the facts a fault not to be atoned for by the pomp of style or even the fine eloquence of the historian this was an oblique stroke aimed at robertson to whom birch had generously opened the stores of history for the scotch historian had needed all his charity but robertson's attractive inventions and highly finished composition seduce the public taste and we may forgive the latent spark of envy in the honest feelings of the man who was profoundly skilled in delving in the native beds of ore but not in fashioning it and whose own neglected historical works constructed on the true principles of secret history we may often turn over to correct the erroneous the prejudiced and the artful accounts of those who have covered their faults by the pomp of style and the eloquence of the historian the large manuscript collections of original documents from whence may be drawn what i have called positive secret history are as i observed comparatively of modern existence formerly they were widely dispersed in private hands and the nature of such sources of historic discovery but rarely occurred to our writers even had they sought them their access must have been partial and accidental 
lord hardwick has observed that there are still many untouched manuscript collections within these kingdoms which through the ignorance or inattention of their owners are condemned to dust and obscurity but how valuable and essential they may be to the interests of authentic history and of sacred truth cannot be more strikingly demonstrated than in the recent publications of the marlborough and the shrewsbury papers by archdeacon cox footnote two five four the editor was fully authorized to observe it is singular that those transactions should either have passed over in silence or imperfectly represented by most of our national historians our modern history would have been a mere political romance without the astonishing picture of william and his ministers exhibited in those unquestionable documents burnett was among the first in our modern historians who showed the world the preciousness of such materials in his history of the reformation which he largely drew from the catonian collection our early historians only repeated a tale ten times told milton who wanted not for literary diligence had no fresh stores to open for his history of england while hume dispatches comparatively in a few pages a subject which has afforded to the fervent diligence of my learned friend sharon turner volumes precious to the antiquary the lawyer and the philosopher to illustrate my idea of the usefulness and of the absolute necessity of secret history i fix first on a public event and secondly on a public character both remarkable in our own modern history and both serving to expose the fallacious appearances of popular history by authorities indisputably genuine the event is the restoration of charles the second and the character is that of mary the queen of william the third in history the restoration of charles appears in all its splendour the king is joyfully received at dover and the shore is covered by his subjects on their knees crowds of the great hurry to canterbury the army is drawn up in number and with a splendour that had never been equalled his enthusiastic reception is on his birthday for that was the lucky day fixed on for his entrance into the metropolis in a word all that is told in history describes a monarch the most powerful and the most happy one of the tracts of the day entitled england's triumph in the mean quaintness of the style of the times tells us that the soldiery who had hitherto made clubs trump resolve now to enthrone the king of hearts turn to the faithful memorialist who so well knew the secrets of the king's heart and who was himself an actor behind the curtain turned to clarendon in his own life and we shall find that the power of the king was then as dubious as when he was an exile and his feelings were so much racked that he had nearly resolved on a last flight clarendon in noticing the temper and spirit of that time observes whoever reflects upon all this composition of contradictory wishes and expectations must confess that the king was not yet the master of the kingdom nor his authority and security such as the general noise and acclamation the bells and the bonfires proclaimed it to be the first mortification the king met with as soon as he arrived at canterbury within three hours after he landed at dover clarendon then relates how many the king found there who while they waited with joy to kiss his hand also came with importunate solicitations for themselves forced him to give them present audience in which they reckoned up the insupportable losses undergone by themselves or their fathers demanding some grant or promise of such or such offices some even for more pressing for two or three with such confidence in importunity and with such tedious discourses that the king was extremely nauseated with their suits though his modesty knew not how to break from them that he no sooner got into his chamber which for some hours he was not able to do than he lamented the condition to which he found he must be subject and did in truth from that minute contract such a prejudice against some of those persons but a greater mortification was to follow 
and one which had nearly thrown the king into despair general monk had from the beginning to this instant acted very mysteriously never corresponding with nor answering a letter of the king's so that his majesty was frequently doubtful whether the general designed to act for himself or for the king an ambiguous conduct which i attribute to the power his wife had over him who was in the opposite interest the general in his rough way presented him a large paper with about seventy names for his privy council of which not more than two were acceptable the king says clarendon was in more than ordinary confusion for he knew not well what to think of the general in whose absolute power he was so that at this moment his majesty was almost alarmed at the demand and appearance of things the general afterwards undid this unfavourable appearance by acknowledging that the list was drawn up by his wife who had made him promise to present it but he permitted his majesty to act as he thought proper at that moment general monk was more king than charles we have not yet concluded when charles met the army at blackheath fifty thousand strong he knew well the ill constitution of the army the distemper and murmuring that was in it and how many diseases and convulsions their infant loyalty was subject to that how united soever their inclinations and acclamations seemed to be at blackheath their affections were not the same and the very countenances there of many officers as well as soldiers did sufficiently manifest that they were drawn thither to a service they were not delighted in the old soldiers had little regard for their new officers and it quickly appeared by the select and affected mixtures of sullen and melancholic parties of officers and soldiers and then the chancellor of human nature adds and in this melancholic and perplexed condition the king and all his hopes stood when he appeared most gay and exalted and wore a pleasantness in his face that became him and looked like as full an assurance of his security as was possible to put on it is imagined that louis the eighteenth would be the ablest commentator on this piece of secret history and add another twin to pierre de saint julien's gemel ou perellis an old french treatise of histories which resemble one another a volume so scarce that i have never met with it burnett informs us that when queen mary held the administration of government during the absence of william it was imagined by some that as every woman of sense loved to be meddling they concluded that she had but a small portion of it because she lived so abstracted from all affairs he praised her exemplary behaviour regular in her devotions much in her closet read a great deal was often busy at work and seemed to employ her time and thoughts in anything rather than matters of state her conversation was lively and obliging everything in her was easy and natural the king told the earl of shrewsbury that though he could not hit on the right way of pleasing england he was confident she would and that we should all be very happy under her such is the miniature of the queen which burnett offers we see nothing but her tranquillity her simplicity her carelessness amidst the important transactions passing under her eye but i lift the curtain from a larger picture the distracted state amidst which the queen lived the vexations the secret sorrows the agonies and the despair of mary in the absence of william nowhere appear in history and as we see escaped the ken of the scotch bishop they were reserved for the curiosity and instruction of posterity and were found by dalrymple in the letters of mary to her husband in king william's cabinet it will be well to place under the eye of the reader the suppressed cries of this afflicted queen at the time when everything in her was so easy and natural employing her time and thoughts in anything rather than matters of state often busy at work i shall not dwell on the pangs of the queen for the fate of william or her deadly suspicions that many were unfaithful about her a battle lost might have been fatal a conspiracy might have undone what even a victory had obtained 
the continual terrors she endured were such that we might be at a loss to determine who suffered most those who had been expelled from or those who had ascended to the throne so far was the queen from not employing her thoughts on matters of state that every letter usually written towards evening chronicles the conflict of the day she records not only events but even dialogues and personal characteristics hints her suspicions and multiplies her fears her attention was incessant i never write but what i think others do not and her terrors were as ceaseless i pray god send you back quickly for i see all breaking out into flames the queen's difficulties were not eased by a single confidential intercourse on one occasion she observes as i do not know what i ought to speak and when not i am as silent as can be i ever fear not doing well and trust to what nobody says but you it seems to me that every one is afraid of themselves i am very uneasy in one thing which is want of somebody to speak my mind freely to for it's a great constraint to think and be silent and there is so much matter that i am one of solomon's fools who am ready to burst i must tell you again how lord monmouth endeavours to frighten me and indeed things have but a melancholy prospect she had indeed reasons to fear lord monmouth who it appears divulged all the secrets of the royal councils to major wildman who was one of our old republicans and to spread alarm in the privy council conveyed in lemon juice all their secrets to france often on the very day they had passed in council they discovered the fact and every one suspected the others as a traitor lord lincoln even once assured her that the lord president and all in general who are in trust were rogues her council was composed of factions and the queen's suspicions were rather general than particular for she observes on them till now i thought you had given me wrong characters of men but now i see they answer my expectation of being as little of a mind as of a body for a final extract take this full picture of royal misery i must seek company on my set days i must play twice a week nay i must laugh and talk though never so much against my will i believe i dissemble very ill to those who know me at least it is a great constraint to myself yet i must endure it all my motions are so watched and all i do so observed that if i eat less or speak less or look more grave all is lost in the opinion of the world so that i have this misery added to that of your absence that i must grin when my heart is ready to break and talk when my heart is so oppressed that i can scarce breathe i go to kensington as often as i can for air but then i can never be quite alone neither can i complain that would be some ease but i have nobody whose humour and circumstances agree with mine enough to speak my mind freely to besides i must hear of business which being a thing i am so new in and so unfit for does but break my brains the more and not ease my heart thus different from the representation of burnett was the actual state of queen mary and i suspect that our warm and vehement bishop had but little personal knowledge of her majesty notwithstanding the elaborate character of the queen which he has given in her funeral eulogium he must have known that she did not always sympathize with his party feelings for the queen writes the bishop of salisbury has made a long thundering sermon this morning which he has been with me to desire to print which i could not refuse though i should not have ordered it for reasons which i told him burnett who i am very far from calling what an inveterate tory edward earl of oxford does in one of his manuscript notes that lying scot unquestionably has told many truths in his gargulous page but the cause in which he stood so deeply engaged coupled to his warm sanguine temper may have sometimes dimmed his sagacity so as to have caused him to have mistaken as in the present case a mask for a face particularly at a time when almost every individual appears to have worn one 
Both these cases of Charles II and Queen Mary show the absolute necessity of researches into secret history to correct the appearances and the fallacies which so often deceive us in public history. The appetite for remains, as the noble author, whom I have already alluded to, calls it, may then be a very wholesome one, if it provide the only materials by which our popular histories can be corrected, and since it often infuses a freshness into a story which, after having been copied from book to book, inspires another to tell it for the tenth time, thus are the sources of secret history unsuspected by the idler and the superficial among those masses of untouched manuscripts, that subterraneous history which indeed may terrify the indolent, bewilder the inexperienced, and confound the injudicious. If they have not acquired the knowledge which not only decides on facts and opinions, but on the authorities which have furnished them. Popular historians have written to their readers, each with different views, but all alike form the open documents of history, like feed advocates they declaim, or like special pleaders they keep only on one side of their case. They are seldom zealous to push on their cross-examination, for they come to gain their cause, and not to hazard it. Time will make the present age as obsolete as the last, for our sons will cast a new light over the ambiguous scenes which distract their fathers. They will know how some things happened for which we cannot account. They will bear witness to how many characters we have mistaken, they will be told many of those secrets which our contemporaries hide from us. They will pause at the ends of our beginnings. They will read the perfect story of man, which can never be told while it is proceeding. All this is the possession of posterity, because they will judge without our passions, and all this we ourselves have been enabled to possess by the secret history of the last two ages. Footnote 255. Since this article has been sent to press, I rise from reading one in the Edinburgh Review on Lord Orford's and Lord Waldgrave's memoirs. This is one of the very rare articles which could only come from the hand of a master long exercised in the studies he criticizes. The critic, or rather the historian, observes that of a period remarkable for the establishment of our present system of government, no authentic materials had yet appeared. Events of public notoriety are to be found, though often inaccurately told, in our common histories, but the secret springs of action, their private views and motives of individuals and see, are as little known to us as if the events to which they relate had taken place in China or Japan. The clear, connected, dispassionate, and circumstantial narrative with which he has enriched the stores of English history is drawn from the sources of secret history, from published memoirs and contemporary correspondence. End of footnotes. End of section 47. Section 48 of Curiosities of Literature, Volume 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Bruce Peary. Curiosities of Literature, Volume 3, by Isaac Disraeli. Literary Residences Men of genius have usually been condemned to compose their finest works, which are usually their earliest ones, under the roof of a garret, and few literary characters have lived, like Pliny and Voltaire, in a villa or chateau of their own. It has not therefore often happened that a man of genius could raise local emotions by his own intellectual suggestions. Ariosto, who built a palace in his verse, lodged himself in a small house, and found that stanzas and stones were not put together at the same rate. Old Montaigne has left a description of his library. Over the entrance of my house, where I view my courtyards and garden, and at once survey all the operations of my family. 
there is however a feeling among literary men of building up their own elegant fancies and giving a permanency to their own tastes we dwell on their favorite scenes as a sort of portraits and we eagerly collect those few prints which are their only vestiges a collection might be formed of such literary residences chosen for their amenity and their retirement and adorned by the objects of their studies from that of the younger pliny who called his villa of literary leisure by the endearing term of Wilila, to that of cassiodorus the prime minister of theodoric who has left so magnificent a description of his literary retreat where all the elegancies of life were at hand where the gardeners and the agriculturists labored on scientific principles and where amidst gardens and parks stood his extensive library with scribes to multiply his manuscripts from tycho brahes who built a magnificent astronomical house on an island which he named after the sole objects of his musings uranianbura or the castle of the heavens to that of evelyn who first began to adorn watton by building a little study till many years after he dedicated the ancient house to contemplation among the delicious streams and venerable woods the gardens the fountains and the groves most tempting for a great person and a wanton purse and indeed gave one of the first examples to that elegancy since so much in vogue from pope whose little garden seemed to multiply its scenes by a glorious union of nobility and literary men conversing in groups down to lonely shenstone whose rural elegance as he entitles one of his odes compelled him to mourn over his hard fate when expense had lavished thousand ornaments and taught convenience to perplex him art to pall pomp to deject and beauty to displease we have all by heart the true and delightful reflection of johnson on local associations when the scene we tread suggests to us the men or the deeds which have left their celebrity to the spot we are in the presence of their fame and feel its influence a literary friend whom a hint of mine had induced to visit the old tower in the garden of buffon where the sage retired every morning to compose passed so long a time in that lonely apartment as to have raised some solicitude among the honest folks of montbar who having seen the englishman enter but not return during a heavy thunderstorm which had occurred in the interval informed the good mayor who came in due form to notify the ambiguous state of the stranger my friend is as is well known a genius of that caste who could pass two hours in the tower of buffon without being aware that he had been all that time occupied by suggestions of ideas and reveries which in some minds such a locality may excite he was also busied with his pencil for he has favored me with two drawings of the interior and the exterior of this old tower in the garden the nakedness within can only be compared to the solitude without such was the studying-room of buffon where his eye resting on no object never interrupted the unity of his meditations on nature in return for my friend's kindness it has cost me i think two hours in attempting to translate the beautiful picture of this literary retreat which vic d'azir has finished with all the warmth of a votary at montbar in the midst of an ornamented garden is seen an antique tower it was there that buffon wrote the history of nature and from that spot his fame spread through the universe there he came at sunrise and no one however importunate was suffered to trouble him the calm of the morning hour the first warbling of the birds the varied aspect of the country all at that moment which touched the senses recalled him to his model free independent he wandered in his walks there was he seen with quickened or with slow steps or standing wrapped in thought sometimes with his eyes fixed on the heavens in the moment of inspiration as if satisfied with the thought that so profoundly occupied his soul 
sometimes collected within himself he sought what would not always be found or at the moments of producing he wrote he effaced and rewrote to efface once more thus he harmonized in silence all the parts of his composition which he frequently repeated to himself till satisfied with his corrections he seemed to repay himself for the pains of his beautiful prose by the pleasure he found in declaiming it aloud thus he engraved it in his memory and would recite it to his friends or induce some to read it to him at those moments he was himself a severe judge and would again recompose it desirous of attaining to that perfection which is denied to the impatient writer a curious circumstance connected with local associations occurred to that extraordinary oriental student Fourmont. originally he belonged to a religious community and never failed in performing his offices but he was expelled by the superior for an irregularity of conduct not likely to have become contagious through the brotherhood he frequently prolonged his studies far into the night and it was possible that the house might be burnt by such superfluity of learning fourmont retreated to the college of montaigne where he occupied the very chambers which had formerly been those of erasmus a circumstance which contributed to excite his emulation and to hasten his studies he who smiles at the force of such emotions only proves that he has not experienced what are real and substantial as the scene itself for those who are concerned in them pope who had far more enthusiasm in his poetical disposition than is generally understood was extremely susceptible of the literary associations with localities one of the volumes of his homer was begun and finished in an old tower over the chapel of stanton harcourt footnote the room is a small wainscoted apartment in the second floor commanding a pleasant view End of footnote. and he has perpetuated the event if not consecrated the place by scratching with a diamond on a pane of stained glass this inscription in the year seventeen eighteen alexander pope finished here the f blank fifth volume of homer footnote the above inscription is a facsimile of that upon the glass the word fifth in the third line has been erased by pope for want of room to complete it properly it is scratched on a small pane of red glass and has been removed to newnham courtney the seat of the harcourt family on the banks of the thames a few miles from oxford End of footnote. it was the same feeling which induced him one day when taking his usual walk with hart in the haymarket to desire hart to enter a little shop where going up three pair of stairs into a small room pope said in this garret addison wrote his campaign nothing less than a strong feeling impelled the poet to ascend this garret it was a consecrated spot to his eye and certainly a curious instance of the power of genius contrasted with its miserable locality addison whose mind had fought through a campaign in a garret could he have called about him the pleasures of imagination had probably planned a house of literary repose where all parts would have been in harmony with his mind such residences of men of genius have been enjoyed by some and the vivid descriptions which they have left us convey something of the delightfulness which charmed their studious repose the italian paul jovius has composed more than three hundred concise eulogies of statesmen warriors and literary men of the fourteenth fifteenth and sixteenth centuries but the occasion which induced him to compose them is perhaps more interesting than the compositions jovius had a villa situated on a peninsula bordered by the lake of como it was built on the ruins of the villa of pliny and in his time the foundations were still visible 
when the surrounding lake was calm the sculptured marbles the trunks of columns and the fragments of those pyramids which had once adorned the residence of the friend of trajan were still viewed in its lucid bosom jovius was the enthusiast of literature and the leisure which it loves he was an historian with the imagination of a poet and though a christian prelate almost a worshipper of the sweet fictions of pagan mythology and when his pen was kept pure from satire or adulation to which it was too much accustomed it became a pencil he paints with rapture his gardens bathed by the waters of the lake the shade and freshness of his woods his green slopes his sparkling fountains the deep silence and calm of his solitude a statue was raised in his gardens to nature in his hall stood a fine statue of apollo and the muses around with their attributes his library was guarded by a mercury and there was an apartment adorned with doric columns and with pictures of the most pleasing subjects dedicated to the graces such was the interior without the transparent lake here spread its broad mirror and there was seen luminously winding by banks covered with olives and laurels in the distance towns promontories hills rising in an amphitheatre blushing with vines and the first elevation of the alps covered with woods and pasture and sprinkled with herds and flocks it was in a central spot of this enchanting habitation that a cabinet or gallery was erected where jovius had collected with prodigal cost the portraits of celebrated men and it was to explain and to describe the characteristics of these illustrious names that he had composed his eulogies this collection became so remarkable that the great men his contemporaries presented our literary collector with their own portraits among whom the renowned fernandez cortez sent jovius his before he died and probably others who were less entitled to enlarge the collection but it is equally probable that our caustic jovius would throw them aside our historian had often to describe men more famous than virtuous sovereigns politicians poets and philosophers men of all ranks countries and ages formed a crowded scene of men of genius or of celebrity sometimes a few lines compress their character and sometimes a few pages excite his fondness if he sometimes adulates the living we may pardon the illusions of a contemporary but he has the honor of satirizing some by the honest freedom of a pen which occasionally broke out into premature truths such was the inspiration of literature and leisure which had embellished the abode of jovius and had raised in the midst of the lake of como a cabinet of portraits a noble tribute to those who are the salt of the earth we possess prints of rubens's house at antwerp that princely artist perhaps first contrived for his studio the circular apartment with a dome like the rotunda of the pantheon where the light descending from an aperture or window at the top sent down a single equal light that perfection of light which distributes its magical effects on the objects beneath Footnote harrowins published in sixteen eighty four a series of interesting views of the house and some of the apartments including this domed one the series are upon one folio sheet now very rare End of footnote. bellori describes it una stanza rotonda con un solo occhio in cima the solo occhio is what the french term oeil de boeuf we ourselves want this single eye in our technical language of art this was his precious museum where he had collected a vast number of books which were intermixed with his marbles statues cameos intaglios and all that variety of the riches of art which he had drawn from rome but the walls did not yield in value for they were covered by pictures of his own composition or copies by his own hand made at venice and madrid of titian and paul veronese footnote 
Rubens was an ardent collector, and lost no chance of increasing his stores. In the appendix to Carpenter's pictorial notices of Van Dyck is printed the correspondence between himself and Sir D. Carleton, offering to exchange some of his own pictures for antiques in possession of the latter, who was ambassador from England to Holland, and who collected also for the Earl of Arundel. End of footnote. No foreigners, men of letters or lovers of the arts, or even princes, would pass through Antwerp without visiting the house of Rubens to witness the animated residence of genius and the great man who had conceived the idea. Yet, great as was his mind, and splendid as were the habits of his life, he could not resist the entreaties of the hundred thousand florins of our Duke of Buckingham to dispose of this studio. The great artist could not, however, abandon forever the delightful contemplations he was depriving himself of, and, as substitutes for the miracles of art he had lost, he solicited and obtained leave to replace them by casts which were scrupulously deposited in the places where the originals had stood. Of this feeling of the local residences of genius, the Italians appear to have been not perhaps more susceptible than other people, but more energetic in their enthusiasm. Florence exhibits many monuments of this sort. In the neighborhood of Santa Maria Novella, Zimmermann has noticed a house of the celebrated Viviani, which is a singular monument of gratitude to his illustrious master, Galileo. The front is adorned with the bust of this father of science, and between the windows are engraven accounts of the discoveries of Galileo. It is the most beautiful biography of genius. Yet another still more eloquently excites our emotions, the house of Michelangelo. His pupils, in perpetual testimony of their admiration and gratitude, have ornamented it with all the leading features of his life, the very soul of this vast genius put in action. This is more than biography. It is living as with a contemporary. End of section 48 Section 49 of Curiosities of Literature, Volume 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Bruce Peary. Curiosities of Literature, Volume 3, by Isaac Disraeli. Whether Allowable to Ruin Oneself? The political economist replies that it is. One of our old dramatic writers, who witnessed the singular extravagance of dress among the modellers of fashion, our nobility, condemns their superfluous bravery, echoing the popular cry. There are a sort of men whose coining heads are mints of all new fashions, that have done more hurt to the kingdom by superfluous bravery, which the foolish gentry imitate, than a war or a long famine. All the treasure by this foul excess is got into the merchants, embroiderers, silkmen's, jewellers, tailors' hands, and the third part of the land, too, the nobility engrossing titles only. Our poet might have been startled at the reply of our political economist. If the nobility, in follies such as these, only preserved their titles, while their lands were dispersed among the industrious classes, the people were not sufferers. The silly victims ruining themselves by their excess of luxury or their costly dress, as it appears some did, was an evil which, left to its own course, must check itself. If the rich did not spend, the poor would starve. Luxury is the cure of that unavoidable evil in society, great inequality of fortune. Political economists, therefore, tell us that any regulations would be ridiculous which, as Lord Bacon expresses it, should serve for the repressing of waste and excess by sumptuary laws. 
adam smith is not only indignant at sumptuary laws but asserts with a democratic insolence of style that it is the highest impertinence and presumption in kings and ministers to pretend to watch over the economy of private people and to restrain their expense by sumptuary laws they are themselves always the greatest spendthrifts in the society let them look well after their own expense and they may safely trust private people with theirs if their own extravagance does not ruin the state that of their subjects never will we must therefore infer that governments by extravagance may ruin a state but that individuals enjoy the remarkable privilege of ruining themselves without injuring society adam smith afterwards distinguishes two sorts of luxury the one exhausting itself in durable commodities as in buildings furniture books statues pictures will increase the opulence of a nation but of the other wasting itself in dress and equipages in frivolous ornaments jewels baubles trinkets etc he acknowledges no trace or vestige would remain and the effects of ten or twenty years profusion would be as completely annihilated as if they had never existed there is therefore a greater and a lesser evil in this important subject of the opulent unrestricted by any law ruining his whole generation where the wealth of nations is made the solitary standard of their prosperity it becomes a fertile source of errors in the science of morals and the happiness of the individual is then too frequently sacrificed to what is called the prosperity of the state if an individual in the pride of luxury and selfism annihilates the fortunes of his whole generation untouched by the laws as a criminal he leaves behind him a race of the discontented and the seditious who having sunk in the scale of society have to reascend from their degradation by industry and by humiliation but for the work of industry their habits have made them inexpert and to humiliation their very rank presents a perpetual obstacle sumptuary laws so often enacted and so often repealed and always eluded were the perpetual but ineffectual attempts of all governments to restrain what perhaps cannot be restrained criminal folly and to punish a man for having ruined himself would usually be to punish a most contrite penitent it is not surprising that before private vices were considered as public benefits the governors of nations instituted sumptuary laws for the passion for pageantry and an incredible prodigality in dress were continually impoverishing great families more equality of wealth has now rather subdued the form of private ruin than laid this evil domestic spirit the incalculable expenditure and the blaze of splendor of our ancestors may startle the incredulity of our elegante we find men of rank exhausting their wealth and pawning their castles and then desperately issuing from them heroes for a crusade or brigands for their neighborhood and this frequently from the simple circumstance of having for a short time maintained some gorgeous chivalric festival on their own estates or from having melted thousands of acres into cloth of gold their sons were left to beg their bread on the estates which they were to have inherited it was when chivalry still charmed the world by the remains of its seductive splendors towards the close of the fifteenth century that i find an instance of this kind occurring in the pas de sandricourt which was held in the neighborhood of the sieur of that name it is a memorable affair not only for us curious inquirers after manners and morals but for the whole family of the sandricourts for though the said sieur is now receiving the immortality we bestow on him and la dame who presided in that magnificent piece of chivalry was infinitely gratified yet for ever after was the lord of sandricourt ruined and all for a short romantic three months 
this story of the chivalric period may amuse a pas d'armes though consisting of military exercises and deeds of gallantry was a sort of festival distinct from a tournament it signified a pas or passage to be contested by one or more knights against all comers it was necessary that the road should be such that it could not be passed without encountering some guardian knight the chevaliers who disputed the pas hung their blazoned shields on trees pales or posts raised for this purpose the aspirants after chivalric honors would strike with their lance one of these shields and when it rung it instantly summoned the owner to the challenge a bridge or a road would sometimes serve for this military sport for such it was intended to be whenever the heat of the rivals proved not too earnest the sieur of Sandricourt was a fine dreamer of feats of chivalry and in the neighbourhood of his castle he fancied that he saw a very spot adapted for every game there was one admirably fitted for the barrier of a tilting match another embellished by a solitary pine tree another which was called the meadow of the thorn there was a carrefour where in four roads four knights might meet and above all there was a forest called de voyable having no path so favourable for errant knights who might there enter for strange adventures and as chance directed encounter others as bewildered as themselves our chivalric sandricourt found nine young seigneurs of the court of charles the eighth of france who answered all his wishes to sanction this glorious feat it was necessary to obtain leave from the king and a herald of the duke of orleans to distribute the cartel or challenge all over france announcing that from such a day ten young lords would stand ready to combat in those different places in the neighbourhood of sandricourt's chateau the names of this flower of chivalry have been faithfully registered and they were such as instantly to throw a spark into the heart of every lover of arms the world of fashion that is the chivalric world were set in motion four bodies of assailants soon collected each consisting of ten combatants the herald of orleans having examined the arms of these gentlemen and satisfied himself of their ancient lineage and their military renown admitted their claims to the proffered honour sandricourt now saw with rapture the numerous shields of the assailants placed on the sides of his portals and corresponding with those of the challengers which hung above them ancient lords were elected judges of the feats of the knights accompanied by the ladies for whose honour only the combatants declared they engaged the herald of orleans tells the history in no very intelligible verse but the burthen of his stanza is still du pas d'armes du chasteau sandricourt he sings or says Anc, depuis le temps du roi artu ne furent tant les armes exaucées mais chevalier et preux entreprenant prince plusieurs en terre déplacée pour y venir donner coups et pousser qui ont été là tenus si de cour que par force non prise et passé les barrières entrer et passer du pas des armes du chasteau sandricourt doubtless there many a roland met with his oliver and could not pass the barriers cased as they were in steel de pied en cap we presume that they could not materially injure themselves yet when on foot the ancient judges discovered such symptoms of peril that on the following day they advised our knights to satisfy themselves by fighting on horseback against this prudential counsel for some time they protested as an inferior sort of glory however on the next day the horse combat was appointed in the carrefour by the pine tree on the following day they tried their lances in the meadow of the thorn but though on horseback the judges deemed their attacks were so fierce that this assault was likewise not without peril for some horses were killed and some knights were thrown and lay bruised by their own mail but the barbed horses wearing only des chanfreins headpieces magnificently caparisoned found no protection in their ornaments 
the last days were passed in combats of two to two or in a single encounter afoot in the forêt de voyable these jousts passed without any accident and the prizes were awarded in a manner equally gratifying to the claimants the last day of the festival was concluded with a most sumptuous banquet two noble knights had undertaken the humble office of maitre d'hôtel and while the knights were parading in the forêt de voyable seeking adventures a hundred servants were seen at all points carrying white and red hypocras and juleps and syrup de violar sweetmeats and other spiceries to comfort these wanderers who on returning to the chasteau found a grand and plenteous banquet the tables were crowded in the court apartment where some held one hundred and twelve gentlemen not including the dames and the demoiselles in the halls and outside of the chasteau were other tables at that festival more than two thousand persons were magnificently entertained free of every expense their attendants their armourers their plumassiers and others were also present la dame de sandricourt fou multes d'avoir donné dans son chasteau si belle si magnifique et gorgias fête historians are apt to describe their personages as they appear not as they are if the lady of the sieur sandricourt really was multes during these gorgeous days one cannot but sympathize with the lady when her loyal knight and spouse confessed to her after the departure of the mob of two thousand visitors neighbors soldiers and courtiers the knight's challengers and the knight's assailants and the fine scenes at the pine tree the barrier in the meadow of the thorn and the horse combat at the carrefour and the jousts in the forêt de voyable the carousels in the castle halls the jollity of the banquet tables the morescos danced till they were reminded how the waning night grew old in a word when the costly dream had vanished that he was a ruined man for ever by immortalizing his name in one grand chivalric festival the sieur de sandricourt like a great torch had consumed himself in his own brightness and the very land on which the famous pas de sandricourt was held had passed away with it thus one man sinks generations by that wastefulness which a political economist would assure us was committing no injury to society the moral evil goes for nothing in financial statements similar instances of ruinous luxury we may find in the prodigal costliness of dress through the reigns of elizabeth james i and charles i not only in their massy grandeur they outweighed us but the accumulation and variety of their wardrobe displayed such a gaiety of fancy in their colors and their ornaments that the drawing-room in those days must have blazed at their presence and changed colors as the crowd moved but if we may trust to royal proclamations the ruin was general among some classes elizabeth issued more than one proclamation against the excess of apparel and among other evils which the government imagined this passion for dress occasioned it notices the wasting and undoing of a great number of young gentlemen otherwise serviceable and that others seeking by show of apparel to be esteemed as gentlemen and allured by the vain show of these things not only consume their goods and lands but also run into such debts and shifts as they cannot live out of danger of laws without attempting of unlawful acts the queen bids her own household to look unto it for good example to the realm and all noblemen archbishops and bishops all mayors justices of peace etc should see them executed in their private households the greatest difficulty which occurred to regulate the wear of apparel was ascertaining the incomes of persons or in the words of the proclamation finding that it is very hard for any man's state of living and value to be truly understood by other persons they were to be regulated as they appear cessed in the subsidy books but if persons chose to be more magnificent in their dress they were allowed to justify their means 
in that case if allowed her majesty would not be the loser for they were to be rated in the subsidy books according to such values as they themselves offered as a qualification for the splendor of their dress in my researches among manuscript letters of the times i have had frequent occasion to discover how persons of considerable rank appear to have carried their acres on their backs and with their ruinous and fantastical luxuries sadly pinched their hospitality it was this which so frequently cast them into the nets of the goldsmiths and other trading usurers at the coronation of james i i find a simple knight whose cloak cost him five hundred pounds but this was not uncommon footnote the famous puritanic writer philip stubbs who published his anatomy of abuses in fifteen ninety three declares that he has heard of shirts that have cost some ten shillings some twenty some forty some five pound some twenty nobles and which is horrible to hear some ten pound apiece his book is filled with similar denunciations of abuses in which he is followed by other satirists they appear to have produced little effect in the way of reformation for in the days of james i john taylor the water poet similarly laments the wastefulness of those who wear a farm in shoe-strings edged with gold and spangled garters worth a copy hold a hose and doublet which a lordship cost a gaudy cloak three manners price almost a beaver band and feather for the head priced at the church's tithe the poor man's bread End of footnote. At the marriage of Elizabeth, the daughter of James I, Lady Wotton had a gown of which the embroidery cost fifty pounds a yard. The Lady Arabella made four gowns, one of which cost fifteen hundred pounds. The Lord Montacute, Montague, bestowed fifteen hundred pounds in apparel for his two daughters one lady under the rank of baroness was furnished with jewels exceeding one hundred thousand pounds and the lady arabella goes beyond her says the letter-writer all this extreme costs and riches makes us all poor as he imagined footnote it is not unusual to find in inventories of this era the household effects rated at much less than the wearing apparel of the person whose property is thus valued End of footnote. i have been amused in observing grave writers of state dispatches jocular on any mischance or mortification to which persons are liable whose happiness entirely depends on their dress sir dudley carleton our minister at venice communicates as an article worth transmitting the great disappointment incurred by sir thomas glover who was just come hither and had appeared one day like a comet all in crimson velvet and beaten gold but had all his expectations marred on a sudden by the news of prince henry's death a similar mischance from a different cause was the lot of lord hay who made great preparations for his embassy to france which however were chiefly confined to his dress he was to remain there twenty days and the letter-writer maliciously observes that he goes with twenty special suits of apparel for so many days abode besides his travelling robes but news is very lately come that the french have lately altered their fashion whereby he must needs be out of countenance if he be not set out after the last edition to find himself out of fashion with twenty suits for twenty days was a mischance his lordship had no right to count on the glass of fashion was unquestionably held up by two very eminent characters raleigh and buckingham and the authentic facts recorded of their dress will sufficiently account for the frequent proclamations to control that servile herd of imitators the smaller gentry there is a remarkable picture of sir walter which will at least serve to convey an idea of the gaiety and splendor of his dress 
it is a white satin pinked vest close sleeved to the wrist over the body a brown doublet finely flowered and embroidered with pearl in the feather of his hat a large ruby and pearl drop at the bottom of the sprig in place of a button his trunk or breeches with his stockings and ribbon garters fringed at the end all white and buff shoes with white ribbon oldus who saw this picture has thus described the dress of raleigh but i have some important additions for i find that raleigh's shoes on great court days were so gorgeously covered with precious stones as to have exceeded the value of six thousand six hundred pounds and that he had a suit of armour of solid silver with sword and belt blazing with diamonds rubies and pearls whose value is not so easily calculated raleigh had no patrimonial inheritance at this moment he had on his back a good portion of a spanish galleon and the profits of a monopoly of trade he was carrying on with the newly discovered virginia probably he placed all his hopes in his dress the virgin queen when she issued proclamations against the excess of apparel pardoned by her looks that promise of a mine which blazed in raleigh's and parsimonious as she was forgot the three thousand changes of dresses which she herself left in the royal wardrobe buckingham could afford to have his diamonds tacked so loosely on that when he chose to shake a few off on the ground he obtained all the fame he desired from the pickers-up who were generally les dames de la cour for our duke never condescended to accept what he himself had dropped his cloaks were trimmed with great diamond buttons and diamond hat-bands cockades and ear-rings yoked with great ropes and knots of pearls this was however but for ordinary dances he had twenty-seven suits of clothes made the richest that embroidery lace silk velvet silver gold and gems could contribute one of which was a white uncut velvet set all over both suit and cloak with diamonds valued at fourscore thousand pounds besides a great feather stuck all over with diamonds as were also his sword girdle hat and spurs footnote the jesuit drexelius in one of his religious dialogues notices the fact but i am referring to a harleian manuscript which confirms the information of the jesuit End of footnote. in the masks and banquets with which buckingham entertained the court he usually expended for the evening from one to five thousand pounds to others i leave to calculate the value of money the sums of this gorgeous wastefulness it must be recollected occurred before this million age of ours if to provide the means for such enormous expenditure buckingham multiplied the grievances of monopolies if he pillaged the treasury for his eighty thousand pounds coat if raleigh was at length driven to his last desperate enterprise to relieve himself of his creditors for a pair of six thousand pounds shoes in both these cases as in that of the chivalric sandricourt the political economist may perhaps acknowledge that there is a sort of luxury highly criminal all the arguments he may urge all the statistical accounts he may calculate and the healthful state of his circulating medium among the merchants embroiderers silkmen and jewellers will not alter such a moral evil which leaves an eternal taint on the wealth of nations it is the principle that private vices are public benefits and that men may be allowed to ruin their generations without committing any injury to society end of section forty nine section fifty of curiosities of literature volume three this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by bruce peary curiosities of literature volume three by isaac disraeli discoveries of secluded men 
those who are unaccustomed to the labors of the closet are unacquainted with the secret and silent triumphs obtained in the pursuits of studious men that aptitude which in poetry is sometimes called inspiration in knowledge we may call sagacity and it is probable that the vehemence of the one does not excite more pleasure than the still tranquillity of the other they are both according to the strict signification of the latin term from whence we have borrowed ours of invention a finding out the result of a combination which no other has formed but ourselves i will produce several remarkable instances of the felicity of this aptitude of the learned in making discoveries which could only have been effectuated by an uninterrupted intercourse with the objects of their studies making things remote and dispersed familiar and present footnote the remarkable clue to the reading of the hieroglyphic language of ancient egypt perfected in our own times is a striking instance of this as well as the investigations now proceeding in babylonian inscriptions which promise to enable us to comprehend a language that was once considered as hopelessly lost End of footnote. one of ancient date is better known to the reader than those i am preparing for him when the magistrates of syracuse were showing to cicero the curiosities of the place he desired to visit the tomb of archimedes but to his surprise they acknowledged that they knew nothing of any such tomb and denied that it ever existed the learned cicero convinced by the authorities of ancient writers by the verses of the inscription which he remembered and the circumstance of a sphere with a cylinder being engraven on it requested them to assist him in the search they conducted the illustrious but obstinate stranger to their most ancient burying ground amidst the number of sepulchres they observed a small column overhung with brambles cicero looking on while they were clearing away the rubbish suddenly exclaimed here is the thing we are looking for his eye had caught the geometrical figures on the tomb and the inscription soon confirmed his conjecture cicero long after exulted in the triumph of this discovery thus he says one of the noblest cities of greece and once the most learned had known nothing of the monument of its most deserving and ingenious citizen had it not been discovered to them by a native of arpinum the great french antiquary peresque exhibited a singular combination of learning patient thought and luminous sagacity which could restore an airy nothing to a local habitation and a name there was found on an amethyst and the same afterwards occurred on the front of an ancient temple a number of marks or indents which had long perplexed inquirers more particularly as similar marks or indents were frequently observed in ancient monuments it was agreed on as no one could understand them and all would be satisfied that they were secret hieroglyphics it occurred to peyresque that these marks were nothing more than holes for small nails which had formerly fastened little laminae which represented so many greek letters this hint of his own suggested to him to draw lines from one hole to another and he beheld the amethyst reveal the name of the sculptor and the frieze of the temple the name of the god this curious discovery has been since frequently applied but it appears to have originated with this great antiquary who by his learning and sagacity explained a supposed hieroglyphic which had been locked up in the silence of seventeen centuries footnote the curious reader may view the marks and the manner in which the greek characters were made out in the preface to hearn's curious discourses the amethyst proved more difficult than the frieze from the circumstance that in engraving on the stone the letters must be reversed End of footnote. learned men confined to their study have often rectified the errors of travellers they have done more they have found out paths for them to explore or open seas for them to navigate 
the situation of the vale of tempe had been mistaken by modern travellers and it is singular observes the quarterly reviewer yet not so singular as it appears to that elegant critic that the only good directions for finding it had been given by a person who was never in greece arthur brown a man of letters of trinity college dublin it is gratifying to quote an irish philosopher and man of letters from the extreme rarity of the character was the first to detect the inconsistencies of pocock and bushing and to send future travellers to look for tempe in its real situation the defiles between ossa and olympus a discovery subsequently realized when dr clark discovered an inscription purporting that the pass of tempe had been fortified by cassius longinus mr walpole with equal felicity detected in caesar's history of the civil war the name and the mission of this very person a living geographer to whom the world stands deeply indebted does not read herodotus in the original yet by the exercise of his extraordinary aptitude it is well known that he has often corrected the greek historian explained obscurities in a text which he never read by his own happy conjectures and confirmed his own discoveries by the subsequent knowledge which modern travellers have afforded gray's perseverance in studying the geography of india and of persia at a time when our country had no immediate interests with those ancient empires would have been placed by a cynical observer among the curious idleness of a mere man of letters these studies were indeed prosecuted as mr matthias observes on the disinterested principles of liberal investigation not on those of policy nor of the regulation of trade nor of the extension of empire nor of permanent establishments but simply and solely on the grand view of what is and of what is past they were the researches of a solitary scholar in academical retirement since the time of gray these fairy pursuits have been carried on by two consummate geographers major rennell and dr vincent who have opened to the classical and the political reader all he wished to learn at a time when india and persia had become objects interesting and important to us the fruits of gray's learning long after their author was no more became valuable the studies of the solitary scholar are always useful to the world although they may not always be timed to its present wants with him indeed they are not merely designed for this purpose gray discovered india for himself but the solitary pursuits of a great student shaped to a particular end will never fail being useful to the world though it may happen that a century may elapse between the periods of the discovery and its practical utility halley's version of an arabic manuscript on a mathematical subject offers an instance of the extraordinary sagacity i am alluding to it may also serve as a demonstration of the peculiar and supereminent advantages possessed by mathematicians observes mr dugald stewart in their fixed relations which form the objects of their science and the correspondent precision in their language and reasoning as a matter of literary history it is highly curious dr bernard accidentally discovered in the bodleian library an arabic version of apollonius de sectione rationis which he determined to translate in latin but only finished about a tenth part halley extremely interested by the subject but with an entire ignorance of the arabic language resolved to complete the imperfect version assisted only by the manuscript which bernard had left it served him as a key for investigating the sense of the original he first made a list of those words wherever they occurred with the train of reasoning in which they were involved to decipher by these very slow degrees the import of the context till at last halley succeeded in mastering the whole work and in bringing the translation without the aid of any one to the form in which he gave it to the public so that we have here a difficult work translated from the arabic 
by one who was in no manner conversant with the language merely by the exertion of his sagacity i give the memorable account as boyle has delivered it of the circumstances which led harvey to the discovery of the circulation of the blood i remember that when i asked our famous harvey in the only discourse i had with him which was but a little while before he died what were the things which induced him to think of a circulation of the blood he answered me that when he took notice that the valves in the veins of so many parts of the body were so placed that they gave free passage to the blood towards the heart but opposed the passage of the venal blood the contrary way he was invited to think that so provident a cause as nature had not placed so many valves without design and no design seemed more probable than that since the blood could not well because of the interposing valves be sent by the veins to the limbs it should be sent through the arteries and return through the veins whose valves did not oppose its course that way the reason here ascribed to harvey seems now so very natural and obvious that some have been disposed to question his claim to the high rank commonly assigned to him among the improvers of science dr william hunter has said that after the discovery of the valves in the veins which harvey learned while in italy from his master fabricius ab aqua pendente the remaining step might easily have been made by any person of common abilities this discovery he observes set harvey to work upon the use of the heart and vascular system in animals and in the course of some years he was so happy as to discover and to prove beyond all possibility of doubt the circulation of the blood he afterwards expresses his astonishment that this discovery should have been left for harvey though he acknowledges it occupied a course of years adding that providence meant to reserve it for him and would not let men see what was before them nor understand what they read it is remarkable that when great discoveries are effected their simplicity always seems to detract from their originality on these occasions we are reminded of the egg of columbus it is said that a recent discovery which ascertains that the niger empties itself into the atlantic ocean was really anticipated by the geographical acumen of a student at glasgow who arrived at the same conclusion by a most persevering investigation of the works of travellers and geographers ancient and modern and by an examination of african captives and had actually constructed for the inspection of government a map of africa on which he had traced the entire course of the niger from the interior franklin conjectured the identity of lightning and of electricity before he had realized it by decisive experiment the kite being raised a considerable time elapsed before there was any appearance of its being electrified one very promising cloud had passed over it without any effect just as he was beginning to despair of his contrivance he observed some loose threads of the hempen string to stand erect and to avoid one another just as if they had been suspended on a common conductor struck with this promising appearance he immediately presented his knuckle to the key and let the reader judge of the exquisite pleasure he must have felt at that moment when the discovery was complete we owe to priestley this admirable narrative the strong sensation of delight which franklin experienced as his knuckle touched the key and at the moment when he felt that a new world was opening might have been equalled but it was probably not surpassed when the same hand signed the long disputed independence of his country when leibniz was occupied in his philosophical reasonings on his law of continuity his singular sagacity enabled him to predict a discovery which afterwards was realized he imagined the necessary existence of the polypus it has been remarked of newton that several of his slight hints some in the modest form of queries have been ascertained to be predictions and among others that of the inflammability of the diamond and many have been eagerly seized upon as indisputable axioms 
a hint at the close of his optics that if natural philosophy should be continued to be improved in its various branches the bounds of moral philosophy would be enlarged also is perhaps among the most important of human discoveries it gave rise to hartley's physiological theory of the mind the queries the hints the conjectures of newton display the most creative sagacity and demonstrate in what manner the discoveries of retired men while they bequeath their legacies to the world afford to themselves a frequent source of secret and silent triumphs End of section 50. Section 51 of Curiosities of Literature, Volume 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Curiosities of Literature, Volume 3 by Isaac Disraeli sentimental biography a periodical critic probably one of the juniors has thrown out a startling observation there is says this literary senator something melancholy in the study of biography because it is a history of the dead a truism and a falsity mixed up together is the temptation with some modern critics to commit that darling sin of theirs novelty and originality but we really cannot condole with the readers of plutarch for their deep melancholy we who feel our spirits refreshed amidst the mediocrity of society when we are recalled back to the men and the women who were illustrious in every glory biography with us is a reunion with human existence in its most excellent state and we find nothing dead in the past while we retain the sympathies which only require to be awakened it would have been more reasonable had the critic discovered that our country has not yet had her plutarch and that our biography remains still little more than a mass of compilation in this study of biography there is a species which has not yet been distinguished biographies composed by some domestic friend or by some enthusiast who works with love a term is unquestionably wanted for this distinct class the germans seem to have invented a platonic one drawn from the greek psyche or the soul for they call this the psychological life another attempt has been made by giving it the scientific term of idiosyncrasy to denote a peculiarity of disposition i would call it sentimental biography it is distinct from a chronological biography for it searches for the individual's feelings amidst the ascertained facts of his life so that facts which occurred remotely from each other are here brought at once together the detail of events which completes the chronological biography contains many which are not connected with the peculiarity of the character itself the sentimental is also distinct from the autobiography however it may seem a part of it whether a man be entitled to lavish his panegyric on himself i will not decide but it is certain that he risks everything by appealing to a solitary and suspected witness we have two lives of dante one by boccaccio and the other by leonardo aretino both interesting but boccaccio's is the sentimental life aretino indeed finds fault but with all the tenderness possible with boccaccio's affectionate sketch origine vita studi e costumi del clarissimo dante etc origin life studies and manners of the illustrious dante etc it seems to me he says that our 
boccaccio dolcissimo e suavissimo uomo sweet and delightful man has written the life and manners of this sublime poet as if he had been composing the filicolo the filistrato or the fiametta the romances of boccaccio for all breathes of love and sighs and is covered with warm tears as if a man were born in this world only to live among the enamoured ladies and the gallant youths of the ten amorous days of his hundred novels aretino who wanted not at all the feeling requisite for the delightful costumi e studi of boccaccio's dante modestly requires that his own life of dante should be considered as a supplement to not as a substitute for boccaccio's pathetic with all the sorrows and eloquent with all the remonstrances of a fellow-citizen boccaccio while he wept hung with anger over his country's shame in its apathy for the honour of its long injured exile catching inspiration from the breathing pages of boccaccio it inclines one to wish that we possessed two biographies of an illustrious favourite character the one strictly and fully historical the other fraught with those very feelings of the departed which we may have to seek in vain for in the circumstantial and chronological biographer boccaccio indeed was overcome by his feelings he either knew not or he omits the substantial incidents of dante's life while his imagination throws a romantic tinge on occurrences raised on slight perhaps on no foundation boccaccio narrates a dream of the mother of dante so fancifully poetical that probably boccaccio forgot that none but a dreamer could have told it seated under a high laurel tree by the side of a vast fountain the mother dreamt that she gave birth to her son she saw him nourished by its fruit and refreshed by the clear waters she soon beheld him a shepherd approaching to pluck the boughs she saw him fall when he rose he had ceased to be a man and was transformed into a peacock disturbed by her admiration she suddenly awoke but when the father found that he really had a son in allusion to the dream he called him dante or given a meritamante peroce attimamente siccome si vedra procedendo segui al nome el fatto and deservedly for greatly as we shall see the effect followed the name at nine years of age on a may-day whose joyous festival boccaccio beautifully describes when the softness of the heavens re-adorning the earth with its mingled flowers waved the green boughs and made all things smile dante mixed with the boys and girls in the house of the good citizen who on that day gave the feast beheld little brice as she was familiarly called but named beatrice the little dante might have seen her before but he loved her then and from that day never ceased to love and thus dante nella pargoletta et fato d'amore for ventissimo servidore so fervent a servant to love in an age of childhood boccaccio appeals to dante's own account of his long passion and his constant sighs in the vita nuova no look no word no sign sullied the purity of his passion but in her twenty-fourth year died la bellissima beatrice dante is then described as more than inconsolable his eyes were long two abundant fountains of tears careless of life he let his beard grow wildly and to others appeared a savage meagre man whose aspect was so changed that while this weeping life lasted he was hardly recognised by his friends all looked on a man so entirely transformed with deep compassion 
dante won over by those who could console the inconsolable was at length solicited by his relations to marry a lady of his own condition in life and it was suggested that as the departed lady had occasioned him such heavy griefs the new one might open a source of delight the relations and friends of dante gave him a wife that his tears for beatrice might cease it is supposed that this marriage proved unhappy boccaccio like a pathetic lover rather than biographer exclaims o oh, menti quiche o oh, tenebrose intelletti o oh, argomenti vani di molti mortali quante sono le reiscite in assai cose contrari a nostri avisi etc o oh, blind men o oh, dark minds o oh, vain arguments of most mortals how often are the results contrary to our advice frequently it is like leading one who breathes the soft air of italy to refresh himself in the eternal shades of the rhodopean mountains what physician would expel a burning fever with fire or put in the shivering marrow of the bones snow and ice so certainly shall it fare with him who with a new love thinks to mitigate the old those who believe this know not the nature of love nor how much a second passion adds to the first in vain would we assist or advise this forceful passion if it has struck its root near the heart of him who long has loved boccaccio has beguiled my pen for half an hour with all the loves and fancies which sprung out of his own affectionate and romantic heart what airy stuff has he woven into the vita of dante this sentimental biography whether he knew but little of the personal history of the great man whom he idolized or whether the dream of the mother the may-day interview with the little breeche and the rest of the children and the effusion on dante's marriage were grounded on tradition one would not harshly reject such tender incidents Footnote a comment on the divine comedy of dante in english printed in italy has just reached me i am delighted to find that this biography of love however romantic is true in his ninth year dante was a lover and a poet the tender sonnet free from all obscurity which he composed on beatrice is preserved in the above singular volume there can be no longer any doubt of the story of beatrice but the sonnet and the passion must be classed among curious natural phenomena or how far apocryphal remains for future inquiry in the footnote but let it not be imagined that the heart of boccaccio was only susceptible to amorous impressions bursts of enthusiasm and eloquence which only a man of genius is worthy of receiving and only a man of genius is capable of bestowing kindle the masculine patriotism of his bold indignant spirit half a century had elapsed since the death of dante and still the florentines showed no sign of repentance for their ancient hatred of their persecuted patriot nor any sense of the memory of the creator of their language whose immortality had become a portion of their own glory boccaccio impassioned by all his generous nature though he regrets he could not raise a statue to dante has sent down to posterity more than marble in the life i venture to give the lofty and bold apostrophe to his fellow-citizens but i feel that even the genius of our language is tame by the side of the harmonized eloquence of the great votary of dante ungrateful country what madness urged thee when thy dearest citizen thy chief benefactor thy only poet with unaccustomed cruelty was driven to flight 
if this had happened in the general terror of that time coming from evil counsels thou mightest stand excused but when the passion ceased didst thou repent didst thou recall him bear with me nor deem it irksome from me who am thy son that thus i collect what just indignation prompts me to speak as a man more desirous of witnessing your amendment than of beholding you punished seems it to you glorious proud of so many titles and of such men that the one whose like no neighbouring city can show you have chosen to chase from among you with what triumphs with what valorous citizens are you splendid your wealth is a removable and uncertain thing your fragile beauty will grow old your delicacy is shameful and feminine but these make you noticed by the false judgment of the populace do you glory in your merchants and your artists i speak impudently but the one are tenaciously avaricious in their servile trade and art which once was so noble and became a second nature struck by the same avarice is now as corrupted and nothing worth do you glory in the baseness and the listlessness of those idlers who because their ancestors are remembered attempt to raise up among you a nobility to govern you ever by robbery by treachery by falsehood ah miserable mother open thine eyes cast them with some remorse on what thou hast done and blush at least reputed wise as thou art to have had in your errors so fatal a choice why not rather imitate the acts of those cities who so keenly disputed merely for the honour of the birthplace of the divine homer mantua our neighbour counts as the greatest fame which remains for her that virgil was a mantuan and holds his very name in such reverence that not only in public places but in the most private we see his sculptured image you only while you were made famous by illustrious men you only have shown no care for your great poet your dante alighieri died in exile to which you unjustly envious of his greatness destined him a crime not to be remembered that the mother should bear an envious malignity to the virtues of a son now cease to be unjust he cannot do you that now dead which living he never did do to you he lies under another sky than yours and you never can see him again but on that day when all your citizens shall view him and the great remunerator shall examine and shall punish if anger hatred and enmity are buried with a man as it is believed begin then to return to yourself begin to be ashamed to have acted against your ancient humanity begin then to wish to appear a mother and not a cold negligent stepdame yield your tears to your son yield your maternal piety to him whom once you repulsed and living cast away from you at least think of possessing him dead and restore your citizenship your award and your grace to his memory he was a son who held you in reverence and though long in exile he always called himself and would be called a florentine he held you ever above all others ever he loved you what will you then do will you remain obstinate in iniquity will you practise less humanity than the barbarians you wish that the world should believe that you are the sister of famous troy and the daughter of rome assuredly the children should resemble their fathers and their ancestors priam in his misery bought the corpse of hector with gold and rome would possess the bones of the first scipio and remove them from linternum those bones which dying so justly he had denied her seek then to be the true guardian of your dante 
claim him show this humane feeling claim him you may securely do this i am certain he will not be returned to you but thus at once you may betray some mark of compassion and not having him again still enjoy your ancient cruelty alas what comfort am i bringing you i almost believe that if the dead could feel the body of dante would not rise to return to you for he is lying in ravenna whose hallowed soil is everywhere covered with the ashes of saints would dante quit this blessed company to mingle with the remains of those hatreds and iniquities which gave him no rest in life the relics of dante even among the bodies of emperors and of martyrs and of their illustrious ancestors is prized as a treasure for there his works are looked on with admiration those works of which you have not yet known to make yourselves worthy his birthplace his origin remains for you spite of your ingratitude and this ravenna envies you while she glories in your honours which she has snatched from you through ages yet to come such was the deep emotion which opened boccaccio's heart in this sentimental biography and which awoke even shame and confusion in the minds of the florentines they blushed for their old hatreds and with awakened sympathies they hastened to honour the memory of their great bard by order of the city the divina commedia was publicly read and explained to the people boccaccio then sinking under the infirmities of age roused his departing genius still was there marrow in the bones of the aged lion and he engaged in the task of composing his celebrated commentaries on the divina commedia in this class of sentimental biography i would place a species which the historian cart noticed in his literary travels on the continent in pursuit of his historical design he found preserved among several ancient families of france their domestic annals with a warm patriotic spirit worthy of imitation they have often carefully preserved in their families the acts of their ancestors this delight and pride of the modern gauls in the great and good deeds of their ancestors preserved in domestic archives will be ascribed to their folly or their vanity yet in that folly there may be so much wisdom and in that vanity there may be so much greatness that the one will amply redeem the other this custom has been rarely adopted among ourselves we have however a few separate histories of some ancient families as those of mordaunt and of warren one of the most remarkable is a genealogical history of the house of ivory in its different branches of ivory louvel percival and gournay two large volumes closely printed footnote this work was published in seventeen forty two and the scarcity of these volumes was felt in granger's day for they obtained then the considerable price of four guineas some time ago a fine copy was sold for thirty at a sale and a cheap copy was offered to me at twelve guineas these volumes should contain seventeen portraits the first was written by mr anderson who dying before the second appeared lord egmont from the materials anderson had left concluded his family history con amore End of footnote expatiating on the characters and events of a single family with the grave pomp of a herald but more particularly the idolatry of the writer for ancient nobility and his contempt for that growing rank in society whom he designates as new men provoked the ridicule at least of the aspersed footnote mr 
anderson the writer of the first volume was a feudal enthusiast he has thrown out an odd notion that the commercial or the wealthy class had intruded on the dignity of the ancient nobility but as wealth has raised such high prices for labour commodities etc it had reached its ne plus ultra and commerce could be carried on no longer he has ventured on this amusing prediction as it is therefore evident that new men will never rise again in any age with such advantages of wealth at least in considerable numbers their party will gradually decrease End of footnote. this extraordinary work notwithstanding its absurdities in its general result has left behind a deep impression drawn from the authentic family records it is not without interest that we toil through its copious pages we trace with a romantic sympathy the fortunes of the descendants of the house of ivory from that not forgotten hero le vaillant perceval chevalier de la table ronde to the norman baron asselin surnamed the wolf for his bravery or his ferocity thence to the cavier of charles the first sir philippe perceval who having gloriously defended his castle was at length deprived of his lordly possessions but never of his loyalty and died obscurely in the metropolis of a broken heart till we reach the polished nobleman the lord egmont of the georges the nation has lost many a noble example of men and women acting a great part on great occasions and then retreating to the shade of privacy and we may be confident that many a name has not been inscribed on the roll of national glory only from wanting a few drops of ink such domestic annals may yet be viewed in the family records at appleby castle and countess of pembroke was a glorious woman the descendant of two potent northern families the de terripon and the gliffords she lived in a state of regal magnificence and independence inhabiting five or seven castles yet though her magnificent spirit poured itself out in her extended charities and though her independence made it that of monarchs yet she herself in her domestic habits lived as a hermit in her own castles and though only acquainted with her native language she had cultivated her mind in many parts of learning and as donne in his way observes she knew how to converse of everything from predestination to slee silk her favourite design was to have materials collected for the history of those two potent northern families to whom she was allied and at a considerable expense she employed learned persons to make collections for this purpose from the records in the tower the rolls and other depositories of manuscripts gilpin had seen three large volumes fairly transcribed anecdotes of a great variety of characters who had exerted themselves on very important occasions composed these family records and induced one to wish that the public were in possession of such annals of the domestic life of heroes and of sages who have only failed in obtaining an historian Footnote much curious matter about the old countess of westmoreland and her seven castles may be found in whitaker's history of craven and in pennant End of footnote. a biographical monument of this nature which has passed through the press will sufficiently prove the utility of this class of sentimental biography it is the life of robert price a welsh lawyer and an ancestor of the gentleman whose ingenuity in our days has refined the principles of the picturesque in art this life is announced as printed by the appointment of the family but it must not be considered merely as a tribute of private affection 
and how we are at this day interested in the actions of a welsh lawyer in the reign of william the third whose name has probably never been consigned to the page of history remains to be told robert price after having served charles the second lived latterly in the eventful times of william the third he was probably of tory principles for on the arrival of the dutch prince he was removed from the attorney-generalship of glamorgan the new monarch has been accused of favouritism and of an eagerness in showering exorbitant grants on some of his foreigners which soon raised a formidable opposition in the jealous spirit of englishmen the grand favourite william bentinck after being raised to the earldom of portland had a grant bestowed on him of three lordships in the county of denbigh the patriot of his native country a title which the welsh had already conferred on robert price then rose to assert the rights of his fatherland and his speeches are as admirable for their knowledge as their spirit the submitting of one thousand five hundred freeholders to the will of a dutch lord was as he sarcastically declared putting them in a worse posture than their former estate when under william the conqueror and his norman lords england must not be tributary to strangers we must like patriots stand by our country otherwise when god shall send us a prince of wales he may have such a present of a crown made him as a pope did to king john who was surnamed sans terre and was by his father made lord of ireland which grant was confirmed by the pope who sent him a crown of peacock's feathers in derogation of his power and the poverty of his country robert price asserted that the king could not by the bill of rights alien or give away the inheritance of a prince of wales without the consent of parliament he concluded a copious and patriotic speech by proposing that an address be presented to the king to put an immediate stop to the grant now passing to the earl of portland for the lordships etc this speech produced such an effect that the address was carried unanimously and the king though he highly resented the speech of robert price sent a civil message to the commons declaring that he should not have given lord portland those lands had he imagined the house of commons could have been concerned i will therefore recall the grant on receiving the royal message robert price drew up a resolution to which the house assented that to procure or pass exorbitant grants by any member of the privy council etc was a high crime and misdemeanour the speech of robert price contained truths too numerous and too bold to suffer the light during that reign but this speech against foreigners was printed the year after king william's death with this title gloria cambriae or the speech of a bold briton in parliament against a dutch prince of wales with this motto a posuit et vicet such was the great character of robert price that he was made a welsh judge by the very sovereign whose favourite plans he had so patriotically thwarted another marked event in the life of this english patriot was a second noble stand he made against the royal authority when in opposition to the public good the secret history of a quarrel between george i and the prince of wales afterwards george the second on the birth of a son appears in this life and when the prince in disgrace left the palace his royal highness proposed taking his children and the princess with him but the king detained the children claiming the care of the royal offspring as a royal prerogative it now became a legal point to ascertain whether the education of his majesty's grandchildren and the care of their marriages etc belonged of right to his majesty as king of this realm or not ten of the judges obsequiously allowed of the prerogative to the full 
robert price and another judge decided that the education etc was the right of the father although the marriages was that of his majesty as king of this realm yet not exclusive of the prince their father he assured the king that the ten obsequious judges had no authority to support their precipitate opinion all the books and precedents cannot form a prerogative for the king of this realm to have the care and education of his grandchildren during the life and without the consent of their father a prerogative unknown to the laws of england he pleads for the rights of a father with the spirit of one who feels them as well as with legal science and historical knowledge such were the two great incidents in the life of this welsh judge yet had the family not found one to commemorate these memorable events in the life of their ancestor we had lost the noble picture of a constitutional interpreter of the laws an independent country gentleman and an englishman jealous of the excessive predominance of ministerial or royal influence cicero and others have informed us that the ancient history of rome itself was composed out of such accounts of private families to which indeed we must add those annals or registers of public events which unquestionably were preserved in the archives of the temples by the priests but the history of the individual may involve public interest whenever the skill of the writer combines with the importance of the invent massala the orator gloried in having composed many volumes of the genealogies of the nobility of rome and atticus wrote the genealogy of brutus to prove him descended from junius brutus the expulsor of the tarquins and founder of the republic near five hundred years before another class of this sentimental biography was projected by the late elizabeth hamilton this was to have consisted of a series of what she called comparative biography and an ancient character was to have been paralleled by a modern one occupied by her historical romance with the character of agrippina she sought in modern history for a partner of her own sex and one who like her had experienced vicissitudes of fortune and she found no one better qualified than the princess palatine elizabeth the daughter of james the first her next life was to have been that of seneca with the scenes and persons of which her life of agrippina had familiarized her and the contrast or the parallel was to have been locke which well managed she thought would have been sufficiently striking it seems to me that, that it would rather have afforded an evidence of her invention such a biographical project reminds one of plutarch's parallels and might incur the danger of displaying more ingenuity than truth the sage of coronea must often have racked his invention to help out his parallels bending together to make them similar the most unconnected events and the most distinct feelings and to keep his parallels in two straight lines he probably made a free use of augmentatives and diminutives to help out his pair who might have been equal yet not alike our fatherland is prodigal of immortal names or names which might be made immortal gibbon once contemplated with complacency the very ideal of sentimental biography and we may regret that he has only left the project i have long revolved in my mind a volume of biographical writing the lives or rather the characters of the most eminent persons in arts and arms in church and state who have flourished in britain from the reign of henry the eighth to the present age the subject would afford a rich display of human nature and domestic history and powerfully address itself to the feelings of every englishman End of section fifty one chapter fifty two of curiosities of literature volume three 
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Curiosities of Literature, Volume 3, by Isaac Disraeli. Chapter 52 Literary Parallels An opinion on this subject in the preceding article has led me to a further investigation. It may be right to acknowledge that so attractive is this critical and moral amusement of comparing great characters with one another, that among others Bishop Hurd once proposed to write a book of parallels, and has furnished a specimen in that of Petrarch and Rousseau, and intended for another that of Erasmus with Cicero. It is amusing to observe how a lively and subtle mind can strike out resemblances, and make contraries accord, and at the same time it may show the pinching difficulties through which a parallel is pushed till it ends in a paradox. Hurd says of Petrarch and Rousseau, both were impelled by an equal enthusiasm, though directed towards different objects. Petrarch's towards the glory of the Roman name, Rousseau's towards his idol of a state of nature, the one religious the other un esprit fort. But may not Petrarch's spite to Babylon be considered in this time as a species of free thinking, and concludes that both were mad, but of a different nature? Unquestionably, there were features much alike, and almost peculiar to these two literary characters, but I doubt if Hurd has comprehended them in the parallel. I now give a specimen of those parallels which have done so much mischief, in the literary world, when drawn by a hand which covertly leans on one side. An elaborate one of this sort was composed by Longolui or Longel between Budaeus and Erasmus. This man, though of Dutch origin, affected to pass for a Frenchman, and to pay his court to his chosen people, gives the preference obliquely to the French Budaeus though to make a show of impartiality he acknowledges that francis i had awarded it to erasmus but probably he did not infer that kings were the most able reviewers this parallel was sent forth during the lifetime of both these great scholars who had long been correspondents but the publication of the parallel interrupted their friendly intercourse erasmus returned his compliments and thanks to Longolui but at the same time insinuates a gentle hint that he was not over-pleased. What pleases me most, Erasmus writes, is the just preference you have given Budaeus over me. I confess you are even too economical in your praise of him, as you are too prodigal in mine. I thank you for informing me what it is the learned desire to find in me. My self-love suggests many little excuses with which you observe I am apt to favor my defects. If I am careless, it arises partly from my ignorance, and more from my indolence. I am so constituted that I cannot conquer my nature. I precipitate rather than compose, and it is far more irksome for me to revise than to write. This parallel between Erasmus and Budaeus, though the parallel itself was not of a malignant nature, yet disturbed the quiet and interrupted the friendship of both. When Longolui discovered that the Parisian surpassed the Hollander in Greek literature and the knowledge of the civil law, and worked more learnedly and laboriously, how did this detract from the finer genius and the varied erudition of the more delightful writer? The parallelist compares Erasmus to a river swelling its waters and often overflowing its banks. Budaeus rolled on like a majestic stream ever restraining its waves within its bed. The Frenchman has more nerve and blood and life, and the Hollander more fullness, freshness, and color. The taste for biographical parallels must have reached us from Plutarch, and there is something malicious in our nature which inclines us to form comparative estimates, usually with a view to elevate one great man at the cost of another, whom we would secretly depreciate. Our political parties at home have often indulged in these fallacious parallels, and Pitt and Fox once balanced the scales, not by the standard weights and measures which ought to have been used, 
but by the adroitness of the hand that pressed down the scale. In literature, these comparative estimates have proved most prejudicial. A finer model exists not than the parallel of Dryden and Pope by Johnson, for without designing any undue preference, his vigorous judgment has analyzed them by his contrast, and has rather shown their distinctness than their similarity. But literary parallels usually end in producing parties, and, as I have elsewhere observed, often originate in undervaluing one man of genius for his deficiency in some eminent quality possessed by the other man of genius. They not unfrequently proceed from adverse tastes, and are formed with the concealed design of establishing some favorite one. The world of literature has been deeply infected with this folly. Virgil probably was often vexed in his days by a parallel with Homer, and the Homerians combated with the Virgilians. Modern Italy was long divided into such literary sects, a perpetual skirmishing is carried on between the Aristoists and the Tastoists, and feuds as dire as those between two highland clans were raised concerning the Petrarchists and the Chiaberists. Old Corneille lived to bow his venerable genius before a parallel with Racine, and no one has suffered more unjustly by such arbitrary criticisms than Pope, for a strange unnatural civil war has often been renewed between the Drydenists and the Popists. Two men of great genius should never be depreciated by the misapplied ingenuity of a parallel. On such occasions, we ought to conclude Magis peris quam similis. End of chapter 52. Section 53 of Curiosities of Literature, Volume 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Curiosities of Literature, Volume 3, by Isaac Disraeli. The Pearl Bibles and Six Thousand Errata. As a literary curiosity, I notice a subject which might rather enter into the history of religion. It relates to the extraordinary state of our English Bibles, which were, for some time, suffered to be so corrupted that no books ever yet swarmed with such innumerable errata. These errata, unquestionably, were in a great part voluntary commissions, passages interpolated, and meanings forged for certain purposes, sometimes to sanction the new creed of a half-hatched sect, and sometimes with an intention to destroy all scriptural authority by a confusion or an omission of texts. The whole was left open to the option or the malignity of the editors, who, probably, like certain ingenious wine merchants, contrived to accommodate, quote, the waters of life, end quote, to their customers' peculiar taste. They had also a project of printing Bibles as cheaply, and in a form as contracted as they possibly could for the common people. And they proceeded till it nearly ended with having no Bible at all. And as Fuller, in his, quote, mixed contemplations and better times, end quote, alluding to his, this circumstance, with not one of his lucky quibbles, observes, quote, The small price of the Bible has called the small prizing of the Bible. This extraordinary attempt on the English Bible began even before Charles I's throne-ment, and probably arose from an unusual demand for Bibles, as the sectarian fanaticism was increasing. Printing of English Bibles was an article of open trade. Everyone printed at the lowest price, and as fast as their presses would allow. Even those who were dignified as His Majesty's printers were among these manufacturers, for we have an account of a scandalous omission by them of the important negative in the Seventh Commandment. The printers were summoned before the Court of High Commission, and this not served to bind them in a fine of three thousand pounds. A prior circumstance indeed had occurred, which induced the government to be more vigilant on the biblical press. The learned usher, one day hastening to preach at Paul's Cross, entered the shop of one of the stationers, 
as booksellers were then called, and inquiring for a Bible of the London edition, when he came to look for his text, to his astonishment and horror, he discovered that the verse was omitted in the Bible. This gave the first occasion of complaint to the king of insufferable negligence and incapacity of the London press. And, says the manuscript writer of this anecdote, first bred that great contest which followed between the University of Cambridge and the London stationers about the right of printing Bibles. The secret bibliographical history of these times would show the extraordinary state of the press in this new trade of Bibles. The writer of a curious pamphlet exposes the combination of those called the King's Printers with their contrivances to keep up the prices of Bibles, their correspondence with the booksellers of Scotland and Dublin, by which means they retained the privilege in their own hands. The king's London printers got Bibles printed cheaper at Edinburgh. In 1629, when folio Bibles were wanted, the Cambridge printers sold them at ten shillings in choirs. On this, the Londoners set six printing houses at work, and to annihilate the Cambridgians, printed a similar folio Bible, but sold it with 500 quarto Roman Bibles and 500 quarto English at five shillings a book which proved the ruin of the folio Bibles by keeping them down under the cost price. Another competition arose among those who printed English Bibles in Holland in Duodecimo with an English colophon for half the price of even the lowest in London. Twelve thousand of these Duodecimo Bibles with notes fabricated in Holland, usually by our fugitive sectarians, were seized by the king's printers as contrary to the statute. Footnote 271. Quote, Scintilla, or a light broken into dark war houses, of some printers, sleeping stationers, and combining booksellers, in which is only a touch of their forestalling and engrossing of books and patents and raising them to excessive prizes. Left to the consideration of the high and honorable House of Parliament now assembled, London, nowhere to be sold, but some are to be given. End quote. 1641. End footnote. Such was this shameful war of Bibles, folios, quartos, and duodecimos, even in the days of Charles I. The public spirit of the rising sex was the real occasion of these increased demands for Bibles. During the civil wars, they carried on the same open trade and competition, besides the private ventures of the smuggled Bibles. A large impression of these Dutch-English Bibles were burnt by the order of the Assembly of Divines for these three errors. Genesis 36, 24 This is that ass that found rulers in the wilderness. For Mule Ruth 4:13. The Lord gave her corruption for conception. Luke twenty one twenty eight. Look up and lift your hands, for your condemnation draweth nigh for redemption. These errata were none of the printers. But, as a writer of the Times expresses it, quote, a gregarious blasphemies and damnable errata, end quote, of some sectarian, or some Balami editor of that day. The printing of Bibles at length was a privilege conceded to one William Bentley, but he was opposed by Hills and Field, and a paper war arose in which they mutually recriminated on each other with equal truth. Field printed, in 1653, what was called the Pearl Bible, alluding, I suppose, to that diminutive type in printing, for it could not derive its name from its worth. It is in twenty-fours, but to contract the mighty book into this dwarfishness, all the original Hebrew text prefixed to the palms, explaining the occasion and the subject of the composition, is wholly expunged. Footnote. A technical printing term for a sheet containing twenty-four pages. End footnote. This Pearl Bible which may be inspected among the great collection of our English Bibles at the British Museum, is set off by many notable errata, of which these are noted. Romans 6.13 
Neither yield ye or your members as instruments of righteousness unto sin. For unrighteousness. First Corinthians 6, 9. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall inherit the kingdom of God? For shall not inherit? This erratum served as the foundation of a dangerous doctrine. <laughs> For many libertines urge the text from this corrupt Bible against the reproofs of a divine. This field was a great forger, and it is said that he received a present of 15,000 pound from the independents to corrupt the text in Acts 6-3 to sanction the right of the people to appoint their own pastors. Footnote. The passage is as follows and is addressed by the apostles to, quote, the multitude of the disciples, end quote, who desired an improved clerical rule. Quote, Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, who we may appoint over this business. End quote. End footnote. The corruption was the easiest possible. It was only to put a ye instead of a we, so that the right in Fields' Bible emanated from the people, not from the apostles. The only account I recollect of this extraordinary state of our Bibles is a happy allusion in a line of Butler. Religion spawned a various rout of petulant, capricious sects, the maggots of corrupted texts. In other Bibles, by Hills and Field, we may find such abundant errata, reducing the text to nonsense or to blasphemy, making the scriptures contemptible to the multitude who came to pray and not to scoff. It is affirmed, in the manuscript account already referred to, that one Bible swarmed with 6,000 faults. Indeed, from another source we discover that, quote, Stern, a solid scholar, was the first who summed up the 3,600 faults that were in our printed Bibles of London, end quote. If one book can be made to contain near 4,000 errors, Little ingenuity was required to reach 6,000. But perhaps this is the first time so remarkable an incident in the history of literature has ever been chronicled. And that famous edition of the Vulgate by Pope Sixtus V, a memorable book of blunders, which commands such high prices, ought now to fall in value before the Pearl Bible in 24s of Messieurs Hills and Field. Mr. Field and his worthy coadjutor seem to have carried the favor of the reigning powers over their opponents, for I find a piece of their secret history. They engaged to pay five hundred pound per annum to some, quote, whose names I forbear to mention, unquote, warily observes the manuscript writer, and above one hundred pound per annum to Mr. Marchant Needham and his wife, out of the profits of the sales of their Bibles deriding, insulting, and triumphing over others, out of their confidence in their great friends and purse, as if they were lawless and free, both from offense and punishment. This march on Needham is sufficiently notorious, and his secret history is probably true. For in a mercurious politicus of this unprincipled cobbit of his day, I find an elaborate puff of an edition published by the annuity grantor to this worthy and his wife, not only had the Bible to suffer these indignities of size and price, but the prayer book was once printed in an illegible and worn-out type, on which the printer being complained of, he stoutly replied that, quote, it was as good as the price afforded, and being a book which all persons ought to have by heart, it was no matter whether it was read or not, so that it was worn out in their hands, end quote. The Puritans seem not to have been so nice about the source of purity itself. These hand Bibles of the sectaris, with their six thousand errata, like the false stoessa, covered their crafty deformity with a fair raiment. For when the great Selden and the assembly of divines delighted to confute them in their own learning, he would say, as Whitelock reports, when they had cited a text to prove their assertion, Quote, perhaps in your little pocket Bible with gilt leaves, end quote, which they would often pull out and read. Quote, the translation may be so, but the Greek or the Hebrew signifies this. End quote. 
While these transactions were occurring, it appears that the authentic translation of the Bible, such as we now have it, by the learned translators in James the first time, was suffered to lie neglected. The copies of the original manuscript were in the possession of two of the king's printers who, from cowardice, consent, and connivance, suppressed the publication. Considering that the Bible, full of errata, and often probably accommodated to the notion of sectorists, was more valuable than one authenticated by the hierarchy. Such was the state of the English Bible till 1660. The proverbial expression of chapter and verse seems peculiar to ourselves, and I suspect originated in the Puritanic period, probably just before the Civil Wars under Charles I, from the frequent use of appealing to the Bible on the most frivolous occasions, practiced by those whom self calls, quote, those mighty men at chapter and verse, end quote. With a sort of religious coquetry, they were vain of perpetually opening their gilt pocket Bibles. They perked them up with such self-sufficiency and perfect ignorance of the original that the learned Selden found considerable amusement in going to their, quote, assembly of divines, end quote, and puzzling or confuting them, as we have noted. A ludicrous anecdote on one of these occasions is given by a contemporary, which shows how admirably that learned man amused himself with this assembly of divines. They were discussing the distance between Jerusalem and Jericho, with a perfect ignorance of sacred or of ancient geography. One said it was twenty miles, another ten, and at last it was concluded to be only seven, for this strange reason. That fish was brought from Jericho to Jerusalem market. Selden observed that, quote, possibly the fish in question was salted, end quote, and silenced these acute disputants. It would probably have greatly discomposed these chapter and verse men to have informed them that the scriptures had neither chapter nor verse. It is by no means clear how the holy writings were anciently divided, and still less how quoted or referred to, and whether it was done as Yorick would in his Shandian manner, lounging on his mule, or at his intermediate baits, he has received all possible thanks for this employment of his time. Two years afterwards, he concluded with the Bible. But that the honor of every invention may be disputed, Sanctus Pragnisus's Bible, printed at Lyons in 1527, seems to have led the way to these convenient divisions. <laughs> Stevens, however, improved on Pragnisus's mode of paragraphical marks and marginal verses. And our present chapter and verse, more numerous and more commodiously numbered, were the project of this learned printer, to recommend his edition of the Bible. Trade and learning were once combined. Whether in this arrangement any disturbance of the continuity of the text has followed is a subject not fitted for my inquiry. End of section 53. Section 54 of Curiosities of Literature, Volume 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Curiosities of Literature, Volume 3, by Isaac Disraeli. View of a particular period of the state of religion in our civil wars. Looking over the manuscript diary of Sir Simon's Dews, I was struck by a picture of the domestic religious life which, at that period, was prevalent among families. Sir Simon's was a sober antiquary, heeded with no fanaticism. Yet I discovered in his diary that he was a visionary in his constitution, macerating his body by private fasts and spiritualizing in search of secret signs. These ascetic penances were afterwards succeeded in the nation by an era of hypocritical sanctity, and we may trace this last stage of insanity and of immorality closing with impiety. This would be a dreadful picture of religion, if for a moment we suppose that it were religion, that consolatory power which has its source in our feelings, and, according to the derivation of its expressive term, binds men together. With us, it was sectarianism, 
whose origin and causes we shall not now touch upon, which broke out in so many monstrous shapes, when every pretended reformer was guided by his own peculiar fancies. We have lived to prove that folly and wickedness are rarely obsolete. The age of Sir Simon's views, who lived through the times of Charles I, was religious, for the character of this monarch had all the seriousness and piety not found in the bonhomie and careless indecorums of his father, whose manners of the Scottish court were moulded on the gaieties of the French, from the ancient intercourse of the French and Scottish governments. But this religious age of Charles I presents a strange contrast with the licentiousness which subsequently prevailed among the people. There seems to be a secret connection between a religious and an irreligious period. The levity of popular feeling is driven to and fro by its reaction. When man has once taught to condemn his mere humanity, his abstract fancies open a secret bypath to his presumed salvation. He wanders till he is lost. He trembles till he dotes in melancholy. He raves till truth itself is no longer immutable. The transition to a very opposite state is equally rapid and vehement. Such is the history of man when his religion is founded on misdirected feelings, and such, too, is the reaction so consistently operating in all human affairs. The writer of this diary did not belong to those nonconformists who arranged themselves in hostility to the established religion and political government of our country. A private gentleman and a phlegmatic antiquary, Sir Simons withal was a zealous Church of England Protestant. Yet amidst the mystical illusions of an age of religious controversies, we see these close in the scenes we are about to open, and find this quiet gentleman tormenting himself and his lady for watching of, quote, certain evident marks and signs of an assurance for a better life, end quote which I know not how many distinct sorts of graces. I give an extract from the manuscript diary. Quote, I spent this day chiefly in private fasting, prayer, and other religious exercises. This was the first time that I ever practiced this duty, having always before declined it by reason of the papist superstitious abuses of it. I had partaken formerly of public fasts, but never knew the use and benefit of the same duty performed alone in secret or with others of my own family in private. In these particulars, I had my knowledge much enlarged by the religious converse I enjoyed at Albury Lodge, for there I also shortly after entered upon framing an evidence of marks and signs for my assurance of a better life. I found much benefit of my secret fasting from a learned discourse on fasting by Mr. Henry Mason, and observed his rule that Christians ought to sit sometimes apart for their ordinary humiliation and fasting, and so intend to continue the same course as long as my health will permit me. Yet did I vary the times and duration of my fasting. At first, before I had finished the marks and signs of my assurance of a better life, which scrutiny and search cost me some threescore days of fasting, I performed it sometimes twice in the space of five weeks, then once each month, or a little sooner or later. And then I also sometimes ended the duties of the day, and took some little food about three of the clock in the afternoon. But for diverse years last past, I constantly abstained from all food the whole day. I fasted till supper-time, about six in the evening, and spent ordinarily about eight or nine hours in the performance of religious duties, one part of which was prayer and confession of sins, to which end I wrote down a catalogue of all my known sins, orderly. These were all sins of infirmity, for, through God's grace, I was so far from allowing myself in the practice and commission of any actual sin, as I durst not take it upon me any controversial sins, as usury, carding, dicing, mixed dancing, and the like because I was in mine own judgment persuaded they were unlawful. Till I had finished my assurance first in English and afterwards in Latin, with a large and an elaborate preface in Latin also to it, I spent a great part of that day at that work. Saturday, December 1st, 1627. 
I devoted to my usual course of secret fasting, and drew diverse signs of my assurance of a better life from the grace of repentance, having before gone through the graces of knowledge, faith, hope, love, zeal, patience, humility, and joy, and drawing several marks from them on like days of humiliation for the greater part. My dear wife, beginning also to draw most certain signs of her own future happiness after death, from several graces. January 19th, 1628 Saturday I spent in secret humiliation and fastings, and finished my whole assurance to a better life, consisting of three score and four signs, or marks drawn from several graces. I made some small alterations in the signs afterwards, and when I turned them into the Latin tongue, I enriched the margin with further proofs and authorities. I found much comfort and reposedness of spirit from them, which shows the devilish sophisms of the Papists and Anabaptists and Pseudo-Lutherans and profane atheistical men who say that assurance brings forth presumption and a careless, wicked life. True, when men pretend to the end, and not use the means. My wife joined with me in a private day of fasting, and drew several signs and marks by my help and assistance for her assurance to a better life. End quote. This was an error of religious diaries, particularly among the nonconformists, but they were, as we see, used by others. Of the Countess of Warwick, who died in 1678, we are told that, quote, she kept a diary and took counsel with two persons whom she called her soul's friends, end quote. She called prayers heart's ease, for such she found them. Quote, her own lord, knowing her hours of prayers, once conveyed a godly minister into a secret place within hearing who, being a man very able to judge, much admired her humble fervency. For in praying she prayed aloud. But when she did not with an audible voice, her sighs and groans might be heard at a good distance from the closet. End quote. We are not surprised to discover this practice of religious diaries among the more puritanic sort. What they were we may gather from this description of one Mr. John Janeway, quote, kept a diary in which he wrote down every evening what the frame of his spirit had been all that day. He took notice what incomes he had, what profit he received in his spiritual traffic, what returns came from that far country, what answers of prayer, what deadness and flatness of spirit, end quote. And so we find of Mr. John Carter that, quote, he kept a day book and cast up his accounts with God every day, end quote. To such worldly notions have they humiliated the spirit of religion. And this style, and this mode of religion, has long been continued among us, even among men of superior acquisitions, as witness the spiritual diary and soliloquies of a learned physician within our own times, Dr. Ruddy, which is a great curiosity of the kind. Such was the domestic state of many well-meaning families. They were rejecting with the utmost abhorrence every resemblance to what they called the idolatry of Rome, well, in fact, the gloom of the monastic cell was settling over the houses of these melancholy Puritans. Private fasts were more than ever practiced, and a lady, said to be eminent from her genius and learning, who outlived this era, declared that she had nearly lost her life through a prevalent notion that no fat person could get to heaven, and thus spoiled and wasted her body through excessive fastings. A Quaker to prove the text that, quote, man shall not live by bread alone, but by the word of God, end quote, persisted in refusing his meals. The literal text provided for him a dead letter, and this practical commentator died by a metaphor. This Quaker, however, was not the only victim to the letter of the text. For the famous Oregon, by interpreting into literal a way the twelfth verse of the nineteenth of St. Matthew, which alludes to those persons who become eunuchs for the kingdom of heaven, with his own hands armed himself against himself, and is sufficiently known. Quote, Retonons and no motons. The Parliament afterwards had both periodical and occasional fasts, 
and Charles I opposed, quote, the hypocritical fast of every Wednesday in the month by appointing one for the second Friday, unquote. The two unhappy parties, who were hungering and thirsting for each other's blood, were fasting in spite one against the other. Without inquiring into the causes, even if we thought that we could ascertain them, of that frightful disillusion of religion which so long prevailed in our country, and of which the very corruption it has left behind still breeds in monstrous shapes. It will be sufficient to observe that the destruction of the monarchy and the ecclesiastical order was a moral earthquake, overturning all minds and opening all changes. A theological logomachy was substituted by the sullen and proud aesthetics who ascended into power. These without wearying themselves, wearied all others, and triumphed over each other by their mutual obscurity. The two great giants in this theological war were the famous Richard Baxter and Dr. Owen. They both wrote a library of books, but the endless controversy between them was the extraordinary and incomprehensible subject, whether the death of Christ was solutio ejusdem or only tentundum, that is, whether it was a payment of the very thing, by which law we ought to have paid, or of something held by God to be equivalent. Such was the point on which this debate between Owen and Baxter lasted without end. Yet these metaphysical absurdities were harmless, compared to what was passing among the more hot fanatics who were for acting the wild fancies which their melancholy brains engendered. Men who from the places into which they had thrust themselves might now be called, quote, the higher orders of society, end quote. These two parties alike sent forth an evil spirit to walk among the multitude. Every one would become his own lawmaker, and even his own prophet. The meanest aspired to give his name to his sect. All things were to be put in motion according to the St. Vitus's dance of the last new saint. "'Away with the law, which cuts off a man's legs and then bids him walk,' cried one from his pulpit. "'The believers sin as fast as they will. They have a fountain open to wash them,' declared another teacher. "'We had the brownness from Robert Brown, the vainness from Sir Harry Vane. "'Then we sink down to Mr. Trask, Mr. Wilkinson, Mr. Robinson, the H.N. or Henry Nicholas of the family of love, "'besides Mrs. Hutchinson and the Grindletonian family.' who preferred motions to motives, and conveniently assumed that, quote, their spirit is not to be tried by the scripture, but the scripture by their spirit, end quote. Edwards, the author of Gangrena, the adversary of Milton, whose work may still be preserved for his curiosity, though immortalized by the scourge of genius, has furnished a list of about two hundred of such texts in these times. A divine of the Church of England observed to a great sectary, quote, You talk of the idolatry of Rome, but each of you, whenever you have made and set up a calf, will dance about it, end quote. This confusion of religions, if indeed these pretended modes of faith could be classed among religions, disturbed the consciences of good men, who read themselves in and out of their vacillating creed. It made, at least, even one of the Puritans themselves, who had formerly complained that they had not enjoyed sufficient freedom under the bishops, cry out against this, quote, cur this cursed, intolerable toleration, unquote. And the fact is, that when the Presbyterians had fixed themselves into the government, they published several treatises against toleration. The parallel between these wild notions of reform, and those of another character, run closely together. About this time, well-meaning persons, who were neither enthusiasts from the ambition of founding sects, nor of covering their immorality by their impiety, were infected by the Rigiliosa insania. One case may stand for many. A Mr. Greswold, a gentleman of Warwickshire, whom a brownist had by degrees enticed from his parish church, was afterwards persuaded to return to it. But he returned with a troubled mind, and lost in the prevalent theological contest. A horror of his future existence shut him out, as it were, from his present one. Retiring into his own house with his children, he ceased to communicate with the living world. 
he had his food put in at the window, and when his children lay sick, he admitted no one for their relief. His house at length was forced open, and they found two children dead, and the father confined to his bed. He had mangled his Bible, and cut out the titles, contents, and everything but the very text itself. For it seems that he thought that everything human was sinful, and he conceived that the titles of the books and the contents of the chapters would be cut out of the sacred scriptures as having been composed by men. More terrible it was when the insanity, which had hereto been more confined to the better classes, burst forth among the common people. Were we to dwell minutely on this period, we should start from the picture with horror. We might, perhaps, console ourselves with a disbelief of its truth. But the drug, though bitter in the mouth, we must sometimes digest. To observe the extent to which the populace can proceed, disenfranchised of law and religion, will always leave a memorable recollection. What occurred in the French Revolution had happened here. An age of impiety! Society itself seemed dissolved, for every tie of private affection and a public duty was unloosened. Even nature was strangely violated. From the first opposition to the decorous ceremonies of the national church, by the simple Puritans, the next stage was that of ridicule, and the last of a blokey. They began by calling the surplus a linen rag on the back, baptism a Christ cross on a baby's face, and the organ was likened to the bellow, the grunt, and the barking of the respective animals. They actually baptized horses in churches at the fonts, and the jest of that day was that the Reformation was now a thorough one in England since our horses went to church. Footnote. There is a pamphlet which records a strange fact. Quote, News from Powell's, or the new Reformation of the Army with a true relation of a cult that was fold in the Cathedral Church of St. Paul in London and how it was publicly baptized and the name, because a bald cult, was called Baal Rex, end quote, 1649. The water they sprinkled from the soldier's helmet on this occasion is described. The same occurred elsewhere. See Follis's history of the plots of our pretended saints. These men, who baptized horses and pigs in the name of the Trinity, sang palms while they marched. One cannot easily comprehend the nature of fanaticism, except when we learn that they refused to pay rents. End footnote. St. Paul's Cathedral was turned into a market, and the aisles, the communion table, and the altar served for the foulest purposes. Footnote. That curious compilation by Bruno Rives, published in 1646, with the title Mercurius Rusticus, or the Country's Complaint of the Barbarous Outrages Committed by the Secretaries of this Late Flourishing Kingdom, furnished a fearful detail of, quote, sacrileges, profanations, and plunderings committed in the cathedral churches. End quote. End footnote. The liberty, which everyone now assumed of delivering his own opinions, led to acts so execrable that I can find no parallel for them except in the mad times of the French Revolution. Some maintained that there existed no distinction between moral good and moral evil, and that every man's actions were prompted by the Creator. Prostitution was professed as a religious act. A glazier was declared to be a prophet, and the woman he cohabitated with was said to be ready to lie in the of the Messiah. A man married his father's wife. Murders of the most extraordinary nature were occurring. One woman crucified her mother, and another, in imitation of Abraham, sacrificed her child. We hear, too, of parricides. Amongst the slaughters of civil wars, spoil and blood had accustomed the people to contemplate the most horrible scenes. One madman of the many, we find drinking a health on his knees in the midst of town, quote, to the devil, that it might be said that his family should not be extinct without doing some infamous act, end quote. A Scotchman, one Alexander Agnew, commonly called Jock of Broad Scotland, whom one cannot call an atheist, for he does not seem to deny the existence of the Creator, nor a future state, had a shrewdness of local humor in his strange notions. 
emitting some offensive things. Others, as strange, may exhibit the state to which the reaction of a hypocritical system of religion had driven the common people. Jock of broad Scotland said he was nothing in God's common, for God had given him nothing. He was no more obliged to God than to the devil, for God was very greedy. Neither God nor the devil gave the fruits of the ground. The wives of the country gave him his meat. When asked wherein he believed, he answered, quote, He believed in white meal, water, and salt. Christ was not God, for he came into the world after it was made and died as other men, end quote. He declared that, quote, he did not know whether God or the devil had the greatest power, but he thought the devil was the greatest. When I die, let God and the devil strive for my soul, and let him that is strongest take it, end quote. He no doubt had been taught by the presbytery to mock religious rites, and when desired to give God thanks for his meat, he said, quote, take a sack full of prayers to the mill and grind them, and take your breakfast of them, end quote. To others he said, quote, I will give you a two pence to pray into a bowl of meat and one stone of butter fall from heaven through the house rigging roof to you. End quote. When bread and cheese were laid on the ground by him, he said, quote, If I leave this, I will long cry to God before he give it to me again. End quote. To others he said, quote, Take a bannock and break it in two, and lay them one half thereof, and you will long pray to God before you put the other half to it again. End quote. He seems to have been an anti-Trinitarian. He said he received everything from nature, which had ever reigned and ever would. He would not conform to any religious system, nor name the three persons. Quote, At all these things I have long shaken my cap, he said, Jock of broad Scotland, seems to have been one of those who could imagine that God should have furnished them with bannocks ready-baked. The extravagant fervor then working in the minds of the people is marked by the story told by Clement Walker of the soldier who entered a church with a lantern and a candle burning in it, and in the other hand four candles not lighted. He said he came to deliver his message from God, and showed it by these types of candles. Driven into the churchyard and the wind blowing strong, he could not kindle his candles, and the new prophet was awkwardly compelled to conclude his five denouncements, abolishing the Sabbath, tithes, ministers, magistrates, and at last the Bible itself, without putting out each candle, as he could not kindle them. <laughs> Observing, however, each time, quote, and here I should put out the first light, but the wind is so high that I cannot kindle it, end quote. A perfect scene of the effects which the state of irreligious society produced among the lower orders, I am enabled to give from the manuscript life of John Shaw, vicar of Rotherham. With a little tediousness, but with an infinite naivete, he relates what happened to himself. This honest divine was puritanically inclined, but there can be no exaggeration in these unvarnished facts. He tells a remarkable story of the state of religious knowledge in Lancashire, at a place called Cartmill. Some of the people appeared desirous of religious instruction, declaring that they were without any minister, and had entirely neglected every religious rite, and therefore pressed him to quit his situation at Lim for a short period. He may now tell his own story. Quote, I found a very large, spacious church, scarce any seats in it, a people very ignorant and yet willing to learn. So as I had frequently some thousand of hearers, I catchized in season and out of season. The churches were so thronged at nine in the morning that I had much ado to get to the pulpit. One day, an old man about sixty, sensible enough in other things, and living in the parish of Cartmel, Coming to me on some business, I told him that he belonged to my care and charge, and I desired to be informed of his knowledge in religion. I asked him how many gods there were. He said he knew not. I, informing him, asked again how he thought to be saved. He answered he could not tell. Yet thought that was a harder question than the other. I told him that the way to salvation was by Jesus Christ, God-man who, as he was man, shed his blood for us on the cross. 
"'Oh, sir,' said he, "'I think I heard of that man you speak of once in a play at Kendall, called Corpus Christ Play, where there was a man on a tree and blood run down, and afterwards he professed he could not remember that he had ever heard of salvation by Jesus. But in that play... Footnote. The festival of Corpus Christi, held on the first Thursday after Trinity Sunday, was the period chosen in old times for the performances of miracle plays by the clergy or by the guilds of various towns. For an account of them, see volume 1, page 352-362. End footnote. The scenes passing in the metropolis, as well as in the country, are open to us in one of the chronicling poems of George Withers. Our sensible rhymer wrote in November 1652, quote, a dark lanthorn, on this present subject. After noticing that God, to mortify us, has sent preachers from the shopboard and the plow, such as we seem justly to contemn, as making troops abhorred which come from them. He seems, however, inclined to think that these self-taught teachers and prophets in their darkness might hold a certain light within them. Children, fools, women and madmen we do often meet, preaching and threatening judgments in the street, yea, by strange actions, postures, tones, and cries, themselves they offer to our ears and eyes as signs into this nation. They act as men in ecstasies have done, striving their cloudy visions to declare till they have lost the nations which they had, and want but few degrees of being mad. Footnote. There is a little treatise of humility, published by E. D. Parson, sequestered, in 1654, in which, while enforcing the virtue which his book defends, he w with much naivete gives a strong opinion of his oppressors. Quote, we acknowledge the justice and mercy of the Lord in punishing us, so we take notice of his wisdom in choosing such instruments to punish us, men of mean and low rank, and of common parts and abilities. By these he doth admonish all the honorable, valiant, learned, and wise men of this nation, and as it were, write our sin in the character of our punishment. And in the low condition of these instruments of his anger and displeasure, the rod of his wrath, he would abate and punish our great pride. End quote. End footnote. Such is the picture of the folly and of the wickedness which, after having been preceded by the piety of a religious age, were succeeded by a dominion of hypocritical sanctity, and then closed in all the horrors of immorality and impiety. Such is the picture of the folly and of the wickedness, which, after having been preceded by the piety of a religious age, were succeeded by a dominion of hypocritical sanctity, and then closed in all the horrors of immorality and impiety. The Parliament at length issued one of their ordinances for punishing blasphemous and execrable opinions, and this was enforced with greater power than the slighted proclamations of James and Charles. But the curious wording is a comment on our present subject. The preamble notices that men and women had lately discovered monstrous opinions, even such as tended to the dissolution of human society, and have abused and turned into licentiousness, the liberty given in matters of religion, end quote. It punishes any person not distempered in his brains, who shall maintain any mere creature to be God, or that all acts of unrighteousness are not forbidden in the scriptures, or that God approves of them, or that there is no real difference between moral good and evil. To this disordered state was the public mind reduced, for this proclamation was only describing what was passing among the people, the view of this subject embraces more than one point, which I leave for the meditation of the politician as well as the religionist. End of section 54this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 
Recording by Greg Giordano Curiosities of Literature, Volume 3 By Isaac Desraeli Buckingham's Political Coquetry with the Puritans Buckingham, observes Hume, quote, in order to fortify himself against the resentment of James, end quote, on the conduct of the Duke in the Spanish match, when James was latterly hearing every day Buckingham against Bristol, and Bristol against Buckingham, quote, had affected popularity and entered into the cabals of the Puritans, but afterwards, being secure of the confidence of Charles, he had since abandoned this party, and on that account was the more exposed to their hatred and resentment. End quote. The political coquetry of a minister coalescing with an opposition party, when he was on the point of being disgraced, would doubtless open an involved scene of intrigue, and what one exacted, and the other was content to yield, towards the mutual accommodation, might add one more example to the large chapter of political infirmity. Both workmen attempting to convert each other into tools, by first trying their respective malleability on the anvil, are liable to be disconcerted by even a slight accident, whenever that proves, to perfect conviction, how little they can depend on each other, and that each party comes to cheat, and not to be cheated. This piece of secret history is in part recoverable from good authority. The two great actors were the Duke of Buckingham and Dr. Preston, the master of Emmanuel College, and the head of the Puritan party. Dr. Preston was an eminent character, who from his youth was not without ambition. His scholastic learning, the subtlety of his genius, and his more elegant accomplishments, had attracted the notice of James, at whose table he was perhaps more than once honored as a guest. A suspicion of his puritanic principles was perhaps the only obstacle to his court preferment, yet Preston unquestionably designed to play a political part. He retained the favor of James by the king's hope of withdrawing the doctor from the opposition party, and commanded the favor of Buckingham by the fears of that minister, when, to employ the quaint style of Hackett, the duke foresaw that, quote, he might come to be tried in the furnace of the next sessions of Parliament, and he had need to make the refiners his friends. End quote. Most of these refiners were the Puritanic or opposition party. Appointed one of the chaplains of Prince Charles, Dr. Preston had the advantage of being in frequent attendance, and as Hackett tells us, quote, This politic man felt the pulse of the court, and wanted not the intelligence of all dark mysteries through the scotch in his highness's bedchamber. End quote. A close communication took place between the Duke and Preston, who, as Hackett describes, was, quote, a good crow to smell carrion. End quote. He obtained an easy admission to the Duke's closet at least thrice a week. In their notable conferences, Buckingham appears to have communicated to his confidential friends. Preston, intent on carrying all his points, skillfully commenced with the smaller ones. He winded the Duke circuitously. He worked at him subterraneously. This wary politician was too sagacious to propose what he had at heart, the extirpation of the hierarchy. The thunder of James's voice, quote, No bishop, no king, end quote, in the conference at Hampton Court, still echoed in the ear of the Puritan. He assured the Duke that the love of the people was his only anchor, which could only be secured by the most popular measures. A new sort of reformation was easy to execute. Cathedrals and collegiate colleges. Cathedrals and collegiate churches, maintained by vast wealth, and the lands of the chapter, 
only fed, quote, fat, lazy, and unprofitable drones, end quote. The dissolution of the foundations of deans and chapters would open an ample source to pay the king's debts and scatter the streams of patronage. Quote, you would then become the darling of the commonwealth. End quote. I give the word as I find them in Hackett. Quote, if a crumb stick in the throat of any considerable man that attempts an opposition, it will be easy to wash it down with manners, woods, royalties, tithes, etc. End quote. It would be furnishing the wants of a number of gentlemen, and he quoted a Greek proverb, quote, that when a great oak falls, every neighbor may scuffle for a faggot. End quote. Dr. Preston was willing to perform the part which Knox had acted in Scotland. He might have been certain of a party to maintain this national violation of property, for he who calls out plunder will ever find a gang. These acts of national injustice, so much desired by revolutionists, are never beneficial to the people. They never partake of the spoliation, and the whole terminates in the gratification of private rapacity. It was not, however, easy to obtain such perpetual access to the minister, and at the same time escape from the watchful. Archbishop Williams, the Lord Keeper, got sufficient hints from the king, and in a tedious conference with the duke, he wished to convince him that Preston had only offered him, quote, flit and milk, out of which he should churn nothing, end quote. The duke was, however, smitten by the new project, and made a remarkable answer, quote, you lose yourself in generalities, make it out to me, in particular, if you can that the motion you pick at will find repulse, and be baffled in the House of Commons. I know not how you bishops may struggle, but I am much deluded if a great part of the knights and burgesses will not be glad to see this alteration. End quote. We are told on this that Archbishop Williams took out a list of the members of the House of Commons, and convinced the minister that an overwhelming majority would oppose this projected revolution, and that in consequence the Duke gave it up. But this anterior decision of the Duke may be doubtful, since Preston still retained the high favor of the minister after the death of James. When James died at Tybalds, where Dr. Preston happened to be in attendance, he had the honor of returning to town in the new king's coach with the Duke of Buckingham. The doctor's servile adulation of the minister gave even great offense to the overzealous Puritans. That he was at length discarded is certain, but this was owing not to any deficient subserviency on the side of our politician, but to one of those unlucky circumstances which have often put an end to temporary political connections, by enabling one party to discover what the other thinks of him. I draw this curious fact from a manuscript narrative in the handwriting of the learned William Watton. When the Puritanic party foolishly became jealous of the man, who seemed to be working at root and branch for their purposes, they addressed a letter to Preston, remonstrating with him for his servile attachment to the minister, on which he confidently returned an answer, assuring them that he was as fully convinced of the vileness and profligacy of the Duke of Buckingham's character, as any man could be, but that there was no way to come at him but by the lowest flattery, and that it was necessary for the glory of God that such instruments should be made use of as could be had, and for that reason, and that alone, he showed that respect to the reigning favorite, and not for any real honor that he had for him. This letter proved fatal, some officious hand conveyed it to the Duke. When Preston came, as usual, the Duke took his opportunity of asking him what he had ever done to disoblige him, that he should describe him in such black characters to his own party. Preston, in amazement, denied the fact, and poured forth professions of honor and gratitude. The Duke showed him his own letter, 
Dr. Preston instantaneously felt a political apoplexy. The labors of some years were lost in a single morning. The baffled politician was turned out of Wallingford House, never more to see the enraged minister. And from that moment, Buckingham wholly abandoned the Puritans, and cultivated the friendship of Laud. This happened soon after James I's death. Watton adds, quote, This story I had from one who was extremely well versed in the secret history of the time. End quote. Footnote. Watton delivered this memorandum to the literary antiquary Thomas Baker, and Kennett transcribed it in his manuscript collections. Lands down. Manuscript number 932-88. The Life of Dr. Preston in Chalmers' Biographical Dictionary may be consulted with advantage. End of footnote. End of section 55. Recording by Greg Giordano. Newport Ritchie, Florida. Chapter 56 of Curiosities of Literature, Volume 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Annie Hill. Curiosities of Literature, Volume 3 by Isaac Disraeli. Sir Edward Coke's Exceptions Against the High Sheriff's Oath. A curious fact will show the revolutionary nature of human events and the necessity of correcting our ancient statutes, which so frequently hold out punishments and penalties for objects which have long ceased to be criminal, as well as for persons against whom it would be barbarous to allow some unrepealed statute to operate. When a political stratagem was practiced by Charles I to keep certain members out of the House of Commons by pricking them down as sheriffs in their different counties, among them was the celebrated Sir Edward Coke, whom the government had made high sheriff for bucks. It was necessary, perhaps, to be a learned and practiced lawyer to discover the means he took, in the height of his resentment, to elude the insult. This great lawyer, who himself perhaps had often administered the oath to the sheriffs, which had century after century been usual for them to take, to the surprise of all persons, drew up exceptions against the sheriff's oath, declaring that no one could take it. Coke sent his exceptions to the attorney general, who, by an immediate order in council, submitted them to all the judges of England. Our legal luminary had condescended only to some ingenious cavilling in three of his exceptions, but the fourth was of a nature which could not be overcome. All the judges of England assented and declared that there was one part of this ancient oath which was perfectly irreligious and must ever hereafter be left out. This article was that you shall do all your pain and diligence to destroy and make to cease all manner of heresies, commonly called lollaries, within your bellowick and sea. The Lollards were the most ancient of Protestants, and had practiced Luther's sentiments. It was, in fact, condemning the established religion of the country. An order was issued from Hampton Court for the abrogation of this part of the oath, and, at present, all high sheriffs owe this obligation to the resentment of Sir Edward Coke, for having been pricked down as Sheriff of Bucks to be kept out of Parliament. The merit of having the oath changed instanter he was allowed, but he was not excused taking it. After it was accommodated to the conscientious and lynx-eyed detection of our enraged lawyer. End of section 56 Section 57 of Curiosities of Literature, Volume 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Corinne LePage. Curiosities of Literature, Volume 3, by Isaac Disraeli. 
secret history of charles the first and his first parliaments part one the reign of charles the first succeeded by the commonwealth of england forms a period unparalleled by any preceding one in the annals of mankind it was for the english nation the great result of all former attempts to ascertain and to secure the just freedom of the subject the prerogative of the sovereign and the rights of the people were often imagined to be mutual encroachments and were long involved in contradiction in an age of unsettled opinions and disputed principles at length the conflicting parties of monarchy and democracy in the weakness of their passions discovered how much each required the other for its protector this age offers the finest speculations in human nature it opens a protracted scene of glory and of infamy all that elevates and all that humiliates our kind wrestling together and expiring in a career of glorious deeds of revolting crimes and even of ludicrous infirmities the french revolution is the commentary of the english and a commentary at times more important than the text which it elucidates it has thrown a freshness over the antiquity of our own history and on returning to it we seem to possess the feelings and to be agitated by the interests of contemporaries the circumstances and the persons which so many imagine had passed away have been reproduced under our own eyes in other histories we accept the knowledge of the characters and the incidents on the evidence of the historian but here we may take them from our own conviction since to extinct names and to past events we can apply the reality which we ourselves have witnessed charles i had scarcely ascended the throne ere he discovered that in his new parliament he was married to a sullen bride the youthful monarch with the impatience of a lover warm with hope and glory was ungraciously repulsed even in the first favours the prediction of his father remained like the handwriting on the wall but seated on the throne hope was more congenial to youth than prophecy as soon as charles i could assemble a parliament he addressed them with an earnestness in which the simplicity of words and thoughts strongly contrasted with the oratorical harangues of the late monarch it cannot be alleged against charles i that he preceded the parliament in the war of words he courted their affections and even in this manner of reception amidst the dignity of the regal office studiously showed his exterior respect by the marked solemnity of their first meeting as yet uncrowned on the day on which he first addressed the lords and commons he wore his crown and veiled it at the opening and on the close of his speech a circumstance to which the parliament had not been accustomed another ceremony gave still greater solemnity to the meeting the king would not enter into business till they had united in prayer he commanded the doors to be closed and a bishop to perform the office the suddenness of this unexpected command disconcerted the catholic lords of whom the less rigid knelt and the moderate stood there was one startled papist who did nothing but cross himself the speech may be found in rushworth the friendly tone must be shown here i hope that you do remember that you were pleased to employ me to advise my father to break off the treaties with spain i came into this business willingly and freely like a young man and consequently rashly but it was by your interest your engagement i pray you to remember that this being my first action and begun by your advice and entreaty what a great dishonour it were to you and me that it should fail for that assistance you are able to give me this effusion excited no sympathy in the house they voted not a seventh part of the expenditure necessary to proceed with a war into which as a popular measure they themselves had forced the king at oxford the king again reminded them that he was engaged in a war from their desires and advice he expresses his disappointment at their insufficient grant far short to set forth the navy now preparing the speech preserves the same simplicity still no echo of kindness responded in the house it was however asserted in a vague and quibbling manner that though a former parliament did engage the king in a war yet 
if things were managed by a contrary design and the treasure misemployed this parliament is not bound by another parliament and they added a cruel mockery that the king should help the cause of the palatinate with his own money this foolish war which james and charles had so long borne their reproaches for having avoided as hopeless but which the puritanic party as well as others had continually urged as necessary for the maintenance of the protestant cause in europe still no supplies but protestations of duty and petitions about grievances which it had been difficult to specify in their declaration they style his majesty our dear and dread sovereign and themselves his poor commons but they concede no point they offer no aid the king was not yet disposed to quarrel though he had in vain pressed for dispatch of business lest the season should be lost for the navy again reminding them that it was the first request that he ever made unto them on the pretence of the plague at oxford charles prorogued parliament with a promise to reassemble in the winter there were a few whose hearts had still a pulse to vibrate with the distresses of a youthful monarch perplexed by a war which they themselves had raised but others of a more republican complexion rejected necessity as a dangerous counsellor which would always be furnishing arguments for supplies if the king was in danger and necessity those ought to answer for it who have put both king and kingdom into this peril and if the state of things would not admit a redress of grievances there cannot be so much necessity for money the first parliament abandoned the king charles now had no other means to dispatch the army and fleet in a bad season but by borrowing money on privy seals these were letters where the loan exacted was as small as the style was humble they specified that this loan without inconvenience to any is only intended for the service of the public such private helps for public services which cannot be deferred the king premises had often been resorted to but this being the first time that we have required anything in this kind we require but that sum which few men would deny a friend as far as i can discover the highest sum assessed from great personages was twenty pounds the king was willing to suffer any mortification even that of a charitable solicitation rather than endure the obdurate insults of parliament all donations were received from ten pounds to five shillings this was the mockery of an alms-basket yet with contributions and savings so trivial and exacted with such a warm appeal to their feelings was the king to send out a fleet with ten thousand men to take cadiz this expedition like so many similar attempts from the days of charles i to those of the great lord chatham and to our own concluded in a nullity charles disappointed in this predatory attempt in despair called his second parliament as he says in the midst of his necessities and to learn from them how he was to frame his course and counsels the commons as duteously as ever professed that no king was ever dearer to his people and that they really intend to assist his majesty in such a way as may make him safe at home and feared abroad but it was to be on condition that he would be graciously pleased to accept the information and advice of parliament in discovering the causes of the great evils and redress their grievances the king accepted this as a satisfactory answer but charles comprehended their drift you specially aim at the duke of buckingham what he hath done to change your minds i wot not the style of the king now first betrays angered feelings the secret cause of the uncomplying conduct of the commons was hatred of the favorite but the king saw that they were designed to control the executive government and he could ascribe their antipathy to buckingham but to the capriciousness of popular favor for not long ago he had heard buckingham hailed as their savior in the zeal and firmness of his affections charles always considered that he himself was aimed at in the person of his confidant his companion and his minister some of the bold speakers as the heads of the opposition are frequently designated in the manuscript letters have now risen into notice 
Sir John Elliot, Dr. Turner, Sir Dudley Diggs, Mr. Clement Coke, poured themselves forth in a vehement, not to say seditious style, with invectives more daring than had ever before thundered in the House of Commons. The king now told them, I come to show your errors, and, as I may call it, unparliamentary proceedings of Parliament. The Lord Keeper then assured them that when the irregular humours of some particular persons were settled, the king would hear and answer all just grievances, but the king would have them also to know that he was equally jealous to the contempt of his royal rights, which his majesty would not suffer to be violated by any pretended course of parliamentary liberty. The king considered the parliament as his counsel, but there was a difference between counselling and controlling, and between liberty and the abuse of liberty. He finished by noticing their extraordinary proceedings in their impeachment of Buckingham. The king, resuming his speech, remarkably reproached the parliament. Now that you have all things according to your wishes, and that I am so far engaged that you think that there is no retreat, now you begin to set the dice and make your own game. But I pray you be not deceived. It is not a parliamentary way, nor is it a way to deal with a king. Mr. Clement Coke told you, It was better to be eaten up by a foreign enemy than to be destroyed at home. Indeed, I think it more honor for a king to be invaded and almost destroyed by a foreign enemy than to be despised by his own subjects. The king concluded by asserting his privilege to call or to forbid parliaments. The style of the bold speakers appeared at least as early as in April. I trace their spirit in letters of the times, which furnish facts and expressions that do not appear in our printed documents. Among the earliest of our patriots, and finally the great victim of his exertions, was Sir John Eliot, vice-admiral of Devonshire. He, in a tone which rolled back to Jove his own bolts and startled even the writer, who was himself biased to the popular party, made a resolute, I doubt whether a timely speech. He adds Eliot asserted that, They came not thither either to do what the king should command them, nor to abstain when he forbade them, they came to continue constant and to maintain their privileges. They would not give their posterity a cause to curse them for losing their privileges by restraint, which their forefathers had left them. On the 8th of May, the impeachment of the Duke was opened by Sir Dudley Diggs, who compared the Duke to a meteor exhaled out of putrid matter. He was followed by Glanville, Selden, and others. On this first day the duke sat outfacing his accusers and outbraving their accusations, which the more highly exasperated the house. Footnote. The king had said in his speech to Parliament, I must let you know I will not allow any of my servants to be questioned among you, much less such as are of eminent place and near unto me. Hence the security of Buckingham, who showed the most perfect contempt for the speakers who thus violently attacked him. End of footnote. On the following day, the Duke was absent, when the epilogue to this mighty piece was elaborately delivered by Sir John Eliot, with a force of declamation and a boldness of personal allusion which have not been surpassed in the invectives of the modern Junius. Eliot, after expatiating on the favourite's ambition in procuring and getting into his hands the greatest offices of strength and power in the kingdom, and the means by which he had obtained them, drew a picture of the inward character of the duke's mind. The duke's plurality of offices reminded him of a chimerical beast called by the ancients Stellionatus, so blurred, so spotted, so full of foul lines that they knew not what to make of it. In setting up himself, he hath set upon the kingdom's revenues, the fountain of supply, and the nerves of the land. He intercepts, consumes, and exhausts the revenues of the crown, and, by emptying the veins the blood should run in, he hath cast the kingdom into a high consumption. He descends to criminate the duke's magnificent tastes. He who had something of a congenial nature— for Eliot was a man of fine literature. 
infinite sums of money and mass of land exceeding the value of money contributions in parliament have been heaped upon him and how have they been employed upon costly furniture sumptuous feasting and magnificent building the visible evidence of the express exhausting of the state Elliot eloquently closes your lordships have an idea of the man what he is in himself what in his affections you have seen his power and some i fear have felt it you have known his practice and have heard the effects being such what is he in reference to king and state how compatible or incompatible with either in reference to the king he must be styled the canker in his treasure in reference to the state the moth of all goodness i can hardly find him a parallel but none were so like him as sejanus who is described by tacitus audax sui abtegens in alios criminator juxta adolatio et superbia sejanus's pride was so excessive as tacitus saith that he neglected all counsels mixed his business and service with the prince seeming to confound their actions and was often styled imperatoris laborum socius doth not this man the like ask england scotland and ireland and they will tell you how lately and how often hath this man commixed his actions and discourses with actions of the kings my lords i have done you see the man the parallel of the duke with sejanus electrified the house and as we shall see touched charles on a convulsive nerve the king's conduct on this speech was the beginning of his troubles and the first of his more open attempts to crush the popular party in the house of lords the king defended the duke and informed them i have thought fit to take order for the punishing some insolent speeches lately spoken i find a piece of secret history enclosed in a letter with a solemn injunction that it might be burnt the king this morning complained of sir john elliot for comparing the duke to sejanus in which he said implicitly he must intend me for tiberius on that day the prologue and the epilogue orators sir dudley diggs who had opened the impeachment against the duke and sir john elliot who had closed it were called out of the house by two messengers who showed their warrants for committing them to the tower footnote our printed historical documents Canet franklin and company are confused in their details and facts seem misplaced for want of dates they all equally copy rushworth the only source of our history of this period even hume is involved in the obscurity the king's speech was on the eleventh of may as rushworth has not furnished dates it would seem that the two orators had been sent to the tower before the king's speech to the lord End of footnote. on this memorable day a philosophical politician might have presciently marked the seed-plots of events which not many years afterwards were apparent to all men the passions of kings are often expatiated on but in the present anti-monarchical period the passions of parliaments are not imaginable the democratic party in our constitution from the meanest of motives from their egotism their vanity and their audacity hate kings they would have an abstract being a chimerical sovereign on the throne like a statue the mere ornament of the place it fills and insensible like a statue to the invectives they would heap upon its pedestal the commons with a fierce spirit of reaction for the king's punishing some insolent speeches at once sent up to the lords for the commitment of the duke footnote the king attended the house of lords to explain his intentions verbally taking the minister with him though under impeachment touching the matters against him said the king i myself can be a witness to clear him in every one of them End of footnote. but when they learnt the fate of the patriots they instantaneously broke up in the afternoon they assembled in westminster hall to interchange their private sentiments on the fate of the two imprisoned members in sadness 
and indignation. Footnote. They decided on stopping all business till satisfaction was given them, which ended in the release of Diggs and Elliot in a few days. End of footnote. The following day the commons met by their own house. When the speaker reminded them of the usual business, they all cried out, Sit down, sit down! They would touch on no business till they were righted in their liberties. Footnote. Franklin, an inveterate royalist, in copying Rushworth, inserts their pretended liberties, exactly the style of Catholic writers when they mention Protestantism by la région prétendue réformée. All party writers use the same style. End of footnote. An open committee of the whole house was formed, and no member suffered to quit the house, but either they were at a loss how to commence this solemn conference, or express their indignation by a sullen silence. To soothe and subdue the bold speakers was the unfortunate attempt of the vice-chamberlain, Sir Dudley Carleton, who had long been one of our foreign ambassadors, and who, having witnessed the despotic governments on the continent, imagined that there was no deficiency of liberty at home. I find, said the vice-chamberlain, by the great silence in this house, that it is a fit time to be heard, if you will grant me the patience. Alluding to one of the king's messages, where it was hinted that, if there was no correspondency between him and the parliament, he should be forced to use new councils. I pray you consider what these new councils are and may be. I fear to declare those I conceive. However, Sir Dudley plainly hinted at them, when he went on observing that, when monarchs began to know their own strength, and saw the turbulent spirit of their parliaments, they had overthrown them in all Europe except here only with us. Our old ambassador drew an amusing picture of the effects of despotic governments, in that of France. If you knew the subjects in foreign countries as well as myself, to see them look, not like our nation, with store of flesh on their backs, but like so many ghosts, and not men, being nothing but skin and bones, with some thin cover to their nakedness, and wearing only wooden shoes on their feet, so that they cannot eat meat, or wear good clothes, but they must pay their king for it. This is a misery beyond expression, and that which we are yet free from. A long residence abroad had deprived Sir Dudley Carleton of any sympathy with the high tone of freedom, and the proud jealousy of their privileges, which, though yet unascertained, undefined, and still often contested, was breaking forth among the commons of England. It was fated that the celestial spirit of our national freedom should not descend among us in the form of the mystical dove. Hume observes on this speech that these imprudent suggestions rather gave warning than struck terror. It was evident that the event, which implied new councils, meant what subsequently was practiced, the king governing without a parliament. As for the ghosts who wore wooden shoes, to which the house was congratulated that they had not yet been reduced, they would infer that it was more necessary to provide against the possibility of such strange apparitions. Hume truly observes, the king reaped no further benefit from this attempt than to exasperate the house still further. Some words which the duke persisted in asserting had dropped from Diggs were explained away, Diggs declaring that they had not been used by him, and it seems probable that he was suffered to eat his words. Elliot was made of sterner stuff. He abated not a jot of whatever he had spoken of that man, as he affected to call Buckingham. The commons, whatever might be their patriotism, seem at first to have been chiefly moved by a personal hatred of the favorite, and their real charges against him amounted to little more than pretenses and aggravations. Footnote the strength of the popular hatred may be seen in the articles on Buckingham and Felton in Volume 2. Satires in manuscript abounded, and by their broad-spoken pungency rendered the Duke a perfect bête noire to the people. End of footnote. 
the king whose personal affections were always strong considered his friend innocent and there was a warm romantic feature in the character of the youthful monarch which scorned to sacrifice his faithful companion to his own interests and to emollient the minister to the clamours of the commons subsequently when the king did this in the memorable case of the guiltless strafford it was the only circumstance which weighed on his mind at the hour of his own sacrifice sir robert cotton told a friend on the day on which the king went down to the house of lords and committed the two patriots that he had of late been often sent for to the king and duke and that the king's affection towards him was very admirable and no whit lessened certainly he added the king will never yield to the duke's fall being a young man resolute magnanimous and tenderly and firmly affectionate where he takes this authentic character of charles the first by that intelligent and learned man to whom the nation owes the treasures of its antiquities is remarkable sir robert cotton though holding no rank at court and in no respect of the duke's party was often consulted by the king and much in his secrets how the king valued the judgment of this acute and able adviser acting on it in direct contradiction to the mortification of the favourite i shall probably have occasion to show the commons did not decline in the subtle spirit with which they had begun they covertly aimed at once to subjugate the sovereign and to expel the minister a remonstrance was prepared against the levying of tonnage and poundage which constituted half of the crown revenues and a petition equivalent to a command for removing buckingham from his majesty's person and councils the remonstrance is wrought up with a high spirit of invective against the unbridled ambition of the duke whom they class among those vipers and pests to their king and commonwealth as so expressly styled by your most royal father they request that he would be pleased to remove this person from access to his sacred presence and that he would not balance this one man with all these things and with the affairs of the christian world the king hastily dissolved this second parliament and when the lords petitioned for its continuance he warmly and angrily exclaimed not a moment longer it was dissolved in june sixteen twenty six the patriots abandoned their sovereign to his fate and retreated home sullen indignant and ready to conspire among themselves for the assumption of their disputed or their defrauded liberties they industriously dispersed their remonstrance and the king replied by a declaration but an attack is always more vigorous than a defence the declaration is spiritless and evidently composed under suppressed feelings which perhaps knew not how to shape themselves the remonstrance was commanded everywhere to be burnt and the effect which it produced on the people we shall shortly witness the king was left amidst the most pressing exigencies at the dissolution of the first parliament he had been compelled to practice a humiliating economy hume has alluded to the numerous wants of the young monarch but he certainly was not acquainted with the king's extreme necessities his coronation seemed rather a private than a public ceremony to save the expenses of the procession from the tower through the city to whitehall that customary pomp was omitted and the reason alleged was to save the charge for more noble undertakings that is for means to carry on the spanish war without supplies but now the most extraordinary changes appeared at court the king mortgaged his lands in cornwall to the aldermen and companies of london a rumour spread that the small pension list must be revoked and the royal distress was carried so far that all the tables at court were laid down and the courtiers put on board wages i have seen a letter which gives an account of the funeral supper at whitehall whereat twenty-three tables were buried being from henceforth converted to board wages and there i learn that since this dissolving of housekeeping his majesty is but slenderly attended another writer who describes himself to be only a looker-on regrets that while the men of the law spent ten thousand pounds on a single mask they did not rather make the king rich and adds 
I see a rich commonwealth, a rich people, and the crown poor. This strange poverty of the court of Charles seems to have escaped the notice of our general historians. Charles was now to victual his fleet with the savings of board wages, for this surplusage was taken into account. The fatal descent on the Isle of Ray sent home Buckingham discomfited and spread dismay through the nation. The best blood had been shed from the wanton bravery of an unskilled and romantic commander who, forced to retreat, would march but not fly, and was the very last man to quit the ground which he could not occupy. In the eagerness of his hopes, Buckingham had once dropped, as I learn, that, before midsummer, he should be more honoured and beloved by the commons than ever was the Earl of Essex. And thus he rocked his own and his master's imagination in cradling fancies. This volatile hero, who had felt the capriciousness of popularity, thought that it was as easily regained as it was easily lost. And that chivalric adventure would return to him that favor which at this moment might have been denied to all the wisdom, the policy, and the arts of an experienced statesman. The king was now involved in more intricate and desperate measures, and the nation was thrown into a state of agitation, of which the page of popular history yields but a faint impression. The spirit of insurrection was stalking forth in the metropolis and in the country, the scenes which I am about to describe occurred at the close of 1626. An inattentive reader might easily mistake them for the revolutionary scenes of 1640. It was an unarmed rebellion. An army and a navy had returned unpaid and sore with defeat. The town was scoured by mutinous seamen and soldiers, roving even into the palace of the sovereign, Soldiers without pay form a society without laws. A band of captains rushed into the duke's apartment as he sat at dinner, and when reminded by the duke of a late proclamation forbidding all soldiers coming to court in troops, on pain of hanging, they replied that whole companies were ready to be hanged with them, that the king might do as he pleased with their lives, for that their reputation was lost and their honor forfeited for want of their salary to pay their debts. When a petition was once presented, and it was inquired who was the composer of it, a vast body tremendously shouted, All! All! A multitude, composed of seamen, met at Tower Hill, and set a lad on a scaffold, who, with an Oh, yes, proclaimed that King Charles had promised their pay, or the Duke had been on the scaffold himself. These, at least, were grievances more apparent to the sovereign than those vague ones so perpetually repeated by his unfaithful commons. But what was remained to be done? It was only a choice of difficulties between the disorder and the remedy. At the moment, the duke got up what he called the Council of the Sea, was punctual at its first meeting, and appointed three days in a week to sit, but broke his appointment the second day. They found him always otherwise engaged, and the Council of the Sea turned out to be one of those shadowy expedients which only lasts while it acts on the imagination. It is said that thirty thousand pounds would have quieted these disorganized troops, but the exchequer could not supply so mean a sum. Buckingham, in despair and profuse of life, was planning a fresh expedition for the siege of Rochelle. A new army was required. He swore, if there was money in the kingdom, it should be had. Now began that series of contrivances and artifices and persecutions to levy money. Forced loans, or pretended free gifts, kindled a resisting spirit. It was urged by the court party that the sums required were, in fact, much less in amount than the usual grants of subsidies. But the cry, in return for a subsidy, was always, a parliament— Many were heavily fined for declaring that they knew no law besides that of Parliament to compel men to give away their own goods. The king ordered that those who would not subscribe to the loans should not be forced, but it seems there were orders in council to specify those householders' names who would not subscribe, and it further appears that those who would not pay in purse should in person. 
those who were pressed to send to the depot, but either the soldiers would not receive these good citizens, or they found easy means to return. Every mode which the government invented seems to have been easily frustrated, either by the intrepidity of the parties themselves, or by that general understanding which enabled the people to play into one another's hands. When the common council had consented that an imposition should be laid, the citizens called the guild hall the yield all, and whenever they levied a distress, in consequence of a refusal to pay it, nothing was to be found but old ends such as nobody cared for. Or if a severer officer seized on commodities, it was in vain to offer pennyworths where no customer was to be had. A wealthy merchant, who had formerly been a cheesemonger, was summoned to appear before the privy council, and required to lend the king two hundred pounds, or else to go himself to the army and serve it with cheese. It was not supposed that a merchant, so aged and wealthy, would submit to resume his former mean trade, but the old man, in the spirit of the times, preferred the hard alternative, and balked the new project of finance by shipping himself with his cheese. At Hicks Hall, the Duke and the Earl of Dorset sat to receive the loans, but the Duke threatened, and the Earl affected to treat with levity, men who came before them with all the suppressed feelings of popular indignation. The Earl of Dorset, asking a fellow who pleaded inability to lend money, of what trade he was, and being answered a tailor, said, Put down your name for such a sum. One snip will make amends for all. The tailor quoted scripture abundantly, and shook the bench with laughter or with rage by his anathemas, till he was put fast to a messenger's hands. This was one ball renowned through the parish of St. Clement's, and not only a tailor, but a prophet. Twenty years after, tailors and prophets employed messengers themselves. Footnote. The radicals of that day differed from ours in the means, though not in the end. They at least referred to their Bibles, and rather more than was required. But superstition is as mad as atheism. Many of the Puritans confused their brains with the study of the Revelations, believing Prince Henry to be prefigured in the Apocalypse, some prophecies that he should overthrow the beast. Ball, our tailor, was this very prophet, and was so honest as to believe in his own prophecy. Osborne tells that Ball put out money on adventure, i.e. to receive it back double or treble when King James should be elected Pope, so that though he had no money for a loan, he had to spare for a prophecy. This ball has been confounded with a more ancient radical, Ball, a priest and a principal mover in Watt Tyler's insurrection. Our ball has been very notorious, for Johnson has noticed his admired discourses. Mr. Gifford, without any knowledge of my account of this Taylor prophet, by his active sagacity, has rightly indicated him. See Johnson's work, volume 5, page 241. End of footnote. End of section 57. Recording by Corinne LePage.